Can we go shopping this afternoon? I want to go back to sleep, Debbie asked Casey. No, we can't. Even Jared, who is the laziest among us, has gotten up. Dixon Doctor and Christina are already on their way to the Shining International Plaza. You hurry up, Casey urged. Fine. I'm getting up. Wait for me. By the way, usually you get up later than me. Why are you so early today? Debbie mumbled as she sat up. Casey giggled shyly. My boyfriend got a promotion at work. He is coming to Y City tonight. I want to buy him a present to celebrate this milestone. Speaking of Casey's boyfriend, Debbie knew little about that guy. The other day Casey had gotten into a fight with Portia because of him. Debbie had wanted to inquire more about the man, but then she had been too slosh to even make sense of it. When did you get a boyfriend? Why did Portia accuse you of being the other woman? What's the matter? Debbie put her phone on speaker and started brushing her teeth. For a while, Casey was silent before asking, Can we not talk about it? You know, we're BFFs and BFFs have no secrets. I told you guys about Carlos a long time ago, but none of you believed me. You even thought I was crazy. I had no choice but to stop mentioning it again. So you have to tell me everything too. We can't be friends while using double standards on each other, Debbie declared firmly. Defeated, Casey began explaining, I fell in love with someone at the same time as Portia. Sucks. That day at the club a friend of mine was holding a birthday party. To my surprise, Portia went to the party too. A friend of Casey's at the party wanted to see her new boyfriend's picture and jokingly, everyone at their table echoed the idea. So Casey agreed to show them her boyfriend's picture on her phone. A proud woman like Portia didn't care who Casey's boyfriend was until a mutual friend of theirs exclaimed that Casey's boyfriend and Portia's looked alike. Portia's face fell. She snatched Casey's phone and looked at the picture. Then she glared at Casey and demanded when she had started to fool around with her boyfriend behind her back. Born into a rich family too, Casey rarely feared anyone. She always hated Portia for bullying Debbie. Thus, at that moment, Portia's hostile attitude worked like an ignition. Casey instantly exploded with rage. Things escalated quickly. When it got ugly, Portia called some men in and Casey countered by turning to Jared. Debbie knew the rest of the story. In the bathroom, she applied some cleanser to her face and muttered, Well, are the two of you still seeing the same boyfriend as we speak? Of course not. I asked my boyfriend about it. He told me that he knew Portia, but that was all. There was nothing romantic going on between them. I wonder why you have protected that evil woman Portia for two years. She is always so mean to you. Casey's anger increased as she spoke. Debbie laughed. To think about it, I feel stupid too. But luckily, I'm done with the Goo family. Those two years is water under the bridge now. Back then, she had tried her best to protect Portia. Yet Portia always looked down on her. But even so... Debbie had chosen to ignore all of it and flatter her instead just because she loved Hayden and Portia was his sister. Memories of it drained Debbie. She didn't hate Portia for looking down on her, though. It was her fault. She shouldn't have sold herself short in front of that wicked woman. I heard that Portia's parents and Carlos' parents once had a meal together, at which Portia's parents tried to hook her up with Carlos. Although back then Carlos was 23, Portia was only a teenager. How gross that was. I wonder what her parents were thinking. At the time, Carlos had just joined the ZL group and wasn't as successful as he is now, but he knew Portia was not good enough for him. He gave her parents a tongue lashing and left the table. How cool your husband was. Debbie wiped her face and wondered. How come I never heard any of this? That was five years ago when she and Hayden had just started dating. She had never heard about it from anyone before. It was so humiliating, of course the Goo family buried it deep. But Debbie, imagine the Goo family's faces when they find out that you married Carlos. I swear it will be fun. Casey couldn't stop laughing out loud on the phone. She was looking forward to the day when the Goo family would make fools of themselves. It would be payback time for the unfair treatment they had given Debbie. Debbie disagreed, however. I don't think Portia will care who Carlos married. She doesn't like him after all. You can't be more wrong. Your husband is a magnet. 
Show me a woman who wouldn't want to be with him. It's not that Portia doesn't like Carlos, but that she knows she isn't Carlos' type, so she finds it pointless to aim above her cut. Portia is always sticking her nose up in the air. Why is she always so arrogant? Even as Mrs. Hua, you are not that arrogant. On the contrary, you have kept your marriage secret. Hearing Casey's angry remarks, Debbie explained resignedly, the fact that we're married will come out sooner or later. In the beginning, I kept it secret because I didn't realize I liked Carlos, and I wasn't sure how long our marriage was going to last. Now I don't want it to be in the limelight. I'm not ready for drama. You can see for yourself how influential he can be. I bet some international movie star's sudden marriage wouldn't even be so sensational as his. Casey didn't understand what Debbie was thinking, but she was sure that if people knew she was Mrs. Hua, no one anywhere would dare touch her. Do you intend to keep it a secret for the rest of your life? Nope, of course not. I'm also worried that many women will pursue Carlos since they think he is single. Carlos and I have agreed to announce our marriage as soon as I graduate from university. Too many women drooled over Carlos. On several occasions while she was with Carlos, she had seen his many curious SMS notifications from Emmett, who is a PA man too of Carlos' other phones. Constantly, Emmett kept blocking other women's phone calls and texting to put Carlos in the loop. Casey was relieved when she heard Debbie's response. Are you done dressing yet? Feels like forever. I've gotten to the shining international plaza. Are you out of your house yet, my dear Mrs. Hua? Almost. Let me just put on some lipstick. Today, I want to step out looking fabulous. Everyone loves beauty. Debbie was no exception. Taking her sweet time, she put on some foundation primer, BB cushion and lipstick, before finally she was good to go. Right out the house, she went to the garage, where more than ten fancy cars were parked. Looking around a few times, she was dazzled. Carlos had bought her a red Porsche Cayman, but she had never driven that car once. One night, she had told a joke in bed, but Carlos had taken it seriously and gone ahead to buy another car. Actually, she had read that joke online and casually shared it to Carlos. Although I've made a lot of money, I'm also good at saving. Only that today, I was tempted to splash cash on a Maserati. Thank God I didn't buy it. Otherwise, I'd have parted with a cool eight million dollars. Carlos' only comment was, What a good wife. Two days later, an eight million dollar Maserati was delivered to the villa. Debbie realized that Carlos took everything seriously. After that, she made a mental note to think before opening her mouth. Right now, she wandered around in the garage searching for a cheap car, but it seemed that the Porsche Cayman was the cheapest one among them. She got the keys to the car from a locker and sped away from the manor in the Porsche. When she reached the shining international plaza, her friends were already waiting for her. She was the last one to arrive. Jared placed his phone close to her face and complained, Look what time it is. I got out of bed so we could go shopping, and I end up waiting for half an hour. My ass is frozen. Dixon cast him a sidelong look and was ruthless in exposing his lie. Actually, I and Christina have been waiting that long. You just got here. You've been here maybe five minutes tops. Embarrassed, Jared took his phone back and wrapped his arm around Dixon's neck. I'm your friend. How could you do that to me? I'll kill you. Debbie always had a good time when she was with her friends. Hey, big guy, don't bully doctor, she laughed. Right. You won't lay a hand on tomboy, so you bully my boyfriend instead. Cut it out, Jared. Christina pulled Dixon out of Jared's grip and massaged his neck. The rest of the group giggled. It took a long time for Casey to decide what to buy for her boyfriend. Then they walked into a clothing shop. While the girls were trying on some clothes, the boys played games on their phones as they waited. The nice thing was that the chairs had charger cords that were compatible with their phones, so they were able to maintain a charge while playing some of the more intensive games. The chairs were comfortable as well. When the picture revealing Carlos' marriage was exposed to the public, Debbie accidentally set the fashion trend. Once again, Carlos' influence shocked her. Since she was wearing a white sweater and casual shoes in the pic that was posted on his Weibo page, both the shoes and the sweater had become a trend. Later, in the shop, 
while Debbie and Christina were picking out clothes for Casey, some women specifically told the shop assistants to fetch them some white clothes. She thought it was actually wild. Usually, people were seen mixing fashions both modern and ancient, but still this trend surprised her some. It wasn't odd at all to ask for white clothes. What surprised Debbie was some of the conversations revolving around the clothing. I'm not sure if Mr. Hua has a thing for white sweaters, but I'm sure he doesn't hate them. So if I wear something like that, maybe he'll think I'm hot. One of those women said with a dreamy smile. Mrs. Hua and I have similar figures. If I wear my hair in a bun and put on a white sweater and a pair of casual shoes like she was wearing, people might think I'm her. Too bad the casual shoes in that pic were discontinued. Another woman muttered. Really? Think you could even afford those shoes? Have you seen the price tag? Her companion sneered. Debbie blinked her eyes in wonder because even she herself didn't know how much that pair of shoes cost. They were given to her. It was Carlos money and he seemed to think money was no object. The belittled woman retorted, a trace of anger in her voice. How much? 17, 999 dollars. How are you going to cough up that kind of cash? The taunted woman shut her mouth when she heard how much it was, yet Debbie's and her friend's mouths hung open in shock. Christina's heart was beating so fast she had to put one hand over her chest to steady it. Wow! Mr. and Mrs. Hwashur are rich, she whispered in Debbie's ear. Debbie had been shocked into a daze. It was Carlos who took care of everything. Her clothes, her shoes, her diet, and so on. The walk-in closet in the manor was huge, but even so, it was packed with the clothes and shoes Carlos bought for her. So she just picked out what she felt comfortable in and wore that. She knew Carlos wouldn't settle for anything but the best. Yet $17. 999 for a pair of shoes. That sounded a bit ridiculous, not to mention the fact that she had tons of shoes. She had been stacked up against the walls. Each one contained a pair of shoes. All of a sudden, Casey hugged Debbie and pressed her cheek against Debbie's shoulder. The shop assistants stared at them weirded out. Casey then jumped excitedly and remarked, Hey, call me if you don't want any of your clothes and shoes anymore. Even my most expensive shoes only cost $4.300. How I envy you. It all happened so fast Debbie was muddled. She nodded mechanically to Casey. She had never imagined her closet alone would cost millions of dollars. What was Carlos thinking? Debbie was no rare beauty, no fashion plate. She knew men found her attractive, but she didn't think she was worth all that fuss. There were plenty of knockoff brands that looked exactly the same as some of these designer ones. There was no reason to drop the kind of cash that Carlos had. She would have just worn what was in there, provided it wasn't moth-eaten or tasteless. In addition, to make her happy, Carlos had also asked Tristan to find some rare and pricey stuff to put in her closet. As she remembered this, she was thinking that was why her closet was so expensive. Carlos had never told her how much any of those things was worth. He might not answer even if she asked, and she felt it rude to ask. So she just wore these things, blissfully unaware that everyone seemed to have eyes on her. Now walking into a store she knew. When they stepped out of the clothing shop, Debbie still felt the whole thing was surreal. Carlos had done too much for her. She didn't even know how to repay his love for her. When they were wandering the streets, Jared spotted a barber shop and dragged Dixon inside without even asking him. When the girls saw Jared again, they almost choked. If they were carrying beverages, they would have done a spit take. With so many colors adorning his head, Jared was definitely the most dramatic person in the mall. Everyone was looking at him. He liked being the center of attention, and today was no exception. In fact, that was why he dyed his hair that way. Disdainfully, Dixon stepped away from him as soon as they walked out of the shop. However, as if oblivious to the stunned look in his friend's eyes, Jared stalked towards the girls, gloating, and made sheep's eyes at them while stroking his eye-catching, colorful hair. Hey ladies, how do you like my new hairdo? Dunk. Who? You want me, don't you? The struggle is real. With his height, he stood out among people whenever he was in the streets. He dwarfed most of the population, and you could usually pick him out of a crowd. Jared was rightfully proud of this fact. Now with eight lines and eight different colors crisscrossing on his head, 
He was like a bizarre, huge walking magnet, attracting attention everywhere he went. You could find every primary color in his hair. Red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, purple, and white. Every color but one black. Debbie's mouth twitched. I think you'll break the internet with that. Casey rolled her widened eyes. Jared, I don't think you need a barber. You need a shrink. Christina pulled Dixon close to her and demanded, Stay away from my boyfriend. You're a bad influence. If you stay outside long enough, a unicorn will come along looking for their rainbow. Jared looked at them and countered, You kids don't get it. This is art. Besides, it'll be spring festival soon. I want to have a festive hairdo, and my old man will be happy to see it. When Pappy's happy, I get tons of cash for my allowance. Then the ten dollars zero 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 I spent on it will be worth it. Christina's eyes almost popped out. Ten dollars zero 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 for a haircut? That's nuts. Jared pointed at Debbie. Ask her husband why everything in the Shining International Plaza is so damn expensive. A haircut alone costs hundreds, but apparently it's the going rate, since the cutting is done by A-list stylists. He grinned. Debbie reminded him. Slow down, pretty boy. You made yourself so colorful. Sure your dad won't mistake you for fireworks and set you off over New Year. The others roared in laughter. Jared was a little worried when he heard what Debbie had said. Debbie, can you come home with me later? He asked, raising an eyebrow. Why? Do you want me and your dad to set you off together? Jared scolded. Knock it off. If you go home with me, my dad will go easy on me for your husband's sake. After Jasper noticed his son Jared behaved well whenever Carlos was around, he knew the right person to turn, in case the boy got up to mischief. Debbie waved her hand after hearing Jared's explanation. Save it. If Carlos saw you like this, he would shave you bald and kick your face in. Then an idea occurred to Debbie. She secretly took a picture of Jared with her phone and sent it to Carlos. Honey, I want to see you in this hairstyle. She put a grimacing face emoticon after that sentence. Upon reading her message, Carlos called Emmett in. Call Jasper Hahn. Tell him that his son is a bad influence to my wife, and it's time for him to teach his son a lesson. Which son of his? asked Emmett. Damon spends most of his time with his fiancée. Emmett understood. It sounds Mr. Hua is getting jealous again. He prayed for Jared and then called Jasper. Debbie came across someone she knew before she got Carlos' reply. It was Gus who was hugging a man. At least Debbie thought so. The rumor that he is gay is true, thought Debbie. She took a photo of Gus too. Unfortunately, Gus noticed it. He released the person in his arms and walked towards Debbie. Give me your phone, he demanded. Debbie shook her phone before his eyes and threatened. You'd better lose that sour expression on your face next time when you see me. Or I'll send this picture of you and your boyfriend to Mr. Lou. Gus' face darkened. He turned his head towards the person he had just hugged. With short hair and wearing a black jacket, she indeed looked like a man. Without a word, Gus called Curtis himself. Curtis, Debbie calls me gay. Debbie couldn't hear what Curtis said on the phone. After ending the call, Gus pointed at Debbie angrily but couldn't manage to utter a single word for a moment. When he finally spoke, it was a demand. You bewitched Mr. Hua and now you are bewitching my brother too, he blurted. Bewitching? Debbie laughed. Should I take that as flattery? Carlos aside, can't you see how much your brother loves Colleen? You must be blind. Tell me, why does Curtis ask me to help you whenever I can? Debbie shrugged while stretching her hands. Beats me. Personally, she had been confused about Curtis' obvious concern for her. Although Gus disliked Debbie, there was nothing he could do about her. He turned around and then saw Jared's latest hairdo. What the hell is that? It's louder than a rainbow over there. Why don't you just wear Hulu and Beer Grassland on your head? He sneered. Jared wanted to return fire, but before he could say anything, his phone rang. Seeing that it was his old man, he answered the phone impatiently. Dad, I'm Busy. Call you back. Get your ass back here. Jasper roared. Even though no one knew what Jared heard over the phone, 
There was no mistaking the fact that his collar left him shaken. His tone softened. What's the matter? Hitting on Carlos was wife, have you lost your mind? Completely clueless, Jared looked at Debbie and mumbled. My old man thinks I've been hitting on you. Since Debbie and Jared were like two people from two different worlds, everyone burst into laughter when they heard his words. Even Gus, leaning against a column, couldn't keep a straight face anymore. Hearing what Jared had said, Jasper instantly stifled his anger and asked cautiously, Are you with Mrs. Hua now? Yes, I've been with her for a long time. Jasper misinterpreted his words. He pounded on the desk angrily and thundered, How dare you seduce a married woman? Not to mention she's Mrs. Hua. Do you really think Mrs. Hua will love you more than her husband? Wake up. Come back immediately. Or I'll beat you to a pulp. Dad, what happened? Why are you so angry at me all of a sudden? Why do you think I've been hitting on Mrs. Hua? Jared was totally confused, but his dad wouldn't listen to him. I already know you are at the Shining International Plaza. Stay there. I'll send somebody there to bring you back. Don't you dare move your ass. The old man was not interested in Jared's explanations whatsoever. So without another word he hung up, leaving Jared in suspense. Jared clutched Debbie's arm and implored, Tomboy, help! My dad hasn't been this mad in a long time. Even on phone, I could almost feel his blood boiling with every single syllable of his lecture. And you think I can help you? How? Debbie asked, obvious doubt coloring her face. Call your husband, please. Ask him to tell my dad the truth between you and me. Someone has to let him know that I've never hit on you. It sounded as if Jared was on the verge of crying. If I ever find out who told my dad that, I'll roast him alive, he promised himself. The others laughed so hard they actually looked in pain. Some of them had to grip their stomach, while others had to bend over with the laughter. After watching the scene, Gus left for his girlfriend in an incredibly good mood. Later, Debbie called Carlos, just as Carlos had anticipated. You're calling at a perfect timing. There's a dinner tonight. I'd like you to go with me, Carlos said to her as soon as the phone was connected. Hmm, okay. Well, I'd like to ask a favor, Debbie said. I remember there's a light gray overcoat in your closet. Try it on later, Carlos continued, as if he hadn't heard a single word she had just said. Debbie thought about what she had in her closet. There were too many clothes. She didn't know exactly how many clothes she had. Then she realized that was not what she was calling for. Mr. Handsome, I'm calling because of Jared. Carlos put his feet on the desk. Do you like that hairdo? Hmm. She was puzzled. The picture you sent me. Oh, I found it hilarious, and then I couldn't help imagining what you would look like in that hairdo. A laugh escaped Debbie's lips. Jared turned to her sullenly. My life is in her hands now, and there she is, flirting with her husband. She was even having fun while I'm in deep shit, he thought bitterly. What's so funny about it? Carlos wondered. It's hilarious. Didn't you get the picture from me? Didn't you think it was funny? Debbie Nian, what did you mean by sending me a picture of another man and asking me to copy him? Did you have a crush on Jared but he turned you down? And now you are trying to make me look like him. Make him look like Jared? What did he mean? She thought to herself. Before she could speak, Carlos queried. I'm only 1.88 M. Do I have to grow 10 more CM to be Jared? Carlos Hua, what's wrong with you? His weird tone started bugging her. You're always close to Jared. So today you eventually started sending me his pictures. Debbie Nian, are you telling me that you didn't do it intentionally? Carlos retorted. Now Debbie sensed jealousy. That wasn't my intention. I just thought the hairdo was funny and wanted you to have a laugh. That was all. Standing next to her, Jared listened on restlessly. She still hadn't gotten to the point of the call yet. Sending him a picture of another man to make him laugh? Jared wondered what was running through Debbie's mind. Okay, I can forget about the whole thing, but you and Jared won't shop together anymore. Quietly, Carlos placed an internal call. It was for Emmett. Debbie didn't notice Carlos calling Emmett on the phone. She was too focused on blaming Carlos for being bossy. 
Jared and I are just friends. You know that. Why are you doing this? She started to suspect that it was Carlos who called Jared's dad and made him angry at him. Why would he even do that? It's none of his business what Jared does, and he doesn't need to stir up drama like that. The man is just too controlling and it's time he got knocked down a few pegs. Maybe if I bug him enough he'll back off. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Carlos wasn't amused. So this is my fault? His voice got colder. Debbie shook her head and said in a hurry. No, no. My bad. Please call Jared's dad and tell him Jared didn't hit on me. He's really mad. He figured out where Jared is through GPS and is going to take him home and kick his ass. Feeling bad for him? Just then, Emmett walked into Carlos' office. Carlos mouthed the words, call Jasper. Emmett noticed that Carlos looked gentler than a moment ago. Immediately he knew who Carlos was talking to on the phone. Carlos' stubbornness made Debbie feel frustrated. She lost her patience. You going to call him or not? She asked in a flat voice. Promise me. Promise that you won't get too close to Jared, said Carlos, playing with a lighter. Honestly, how many times do I have to tell you? Jared and I are just friends. We've known each other for years. Now you're asking me to stop talking to him all of a sudden? No can do. Then she turned to Jared and said, Sorry, buddy. I can't save you. It seems you'll have to go home and face your dad. Or you'll lose me forever. New. No. Jared was desperate. Casey, Christina, and Dixon burst into laughter. Emmett has already called Jasper Han, Carlos said and hung up. What? Debbie looked at her phone, confused. He called already? So Jared won't get beaten by his dad? Why didn't he tell me earlier? So he was pulling my leg the whole time. Awk. Debbie opened WeChat and sent Carlos a message. Honey, love you. At the end of the message was a kiss mark emoji. Your husband won't help, asked Jared. He had decided that if Carlos didn't help him, he would fix Debbie up with a ton of guys. I think he will. Maybe. Just wait. Debbie wasn't sure. The Shining International Plaza was only about 10 odd minutes from Jared's home. If you took a car. Jared was still sweating bullets when he went up to the fifth floor of the Alioth building. He could think of little else and picked at his food. He was too worried that Jasper would swoop in with his men, carry him into the car, and then he'd really get it. But by the time he finished his meal, everyone knew that Jared was safe. Jared almost cried with relief. He placed one arm on Debbie's shoulder and said, You have no idea how much I want to kiss you and your husband right now. Probably not a good idea. Carlos doesn't swing that way and he won't be happy if you kiss Deb. Casey reminded him. Okay, suddenly I don't feel like kissing anyone, declared Jared. Everyone looked at him and shook their heads. The group separated later. When Debbie came back to the manor, she found the overcoat Carlos had told her about and put it on. By the time she fixed her makeup, it was almost time to go. The dinner party would be starting soon. The dinner was in a private booth on the fifth floor of Alioth building. By the time Debbie and Carlos turned up, everybody else was already there waiting for them. After some pleasantries, they were led to the seats of honor. Somebody had already pulled the chair out for Carlos. Yet Carlos didn't sit down immediately. He said to Debbie, The heat's on. Take off your coat, or you'll start sweating. Debbie blushed and did as he asked. Everyone there was a successful businessman. One was more slippery than another. When they saw how considerate Carlos was to Debbie, they all started sucking up to her. Obviously, if Carlos was deferent to her, then she must be important indeed. One man took her coat. A second pulled the chair out for her. A third poured her some wine while a fourth filled her water glass. When everybody was finally seated, someone mustered up enough nerve to ask, Mr. Hua, I assume that this lady is Mrs. Hua. Am I right? Carlos smiled. He looked at Debbie but remained silent. Debbie was surprised at his reaction. What's that supposed to mean? Why doesn't he tell them who I am? Since Carlos didn't respond, everyone else kept their mouth shut. A few quiet, awkward seconds passed. Someone was about to break the uncomfortable silence when Carlos announced, My wife always keeps a low profile. 
I promised her I'd keep our marriage secret. As to your question, I need my wife's permission before I answer it. The others were familiar with Carlo's personality. They had never seen him talk that much before. When he turned to Debbie, every one of them understood that the woman sitting next to him was Mrs. Hua. They all looked at Debbie with a smile and racked their brains to compliment her. The room suddenly was abuzz with their unctuous compliments. Some complimented her beauty, others focused on her hair, dress, or her bearing. A few talked about her manners and some more nebulous things that they couldn't possibly know about the quiet woman sitting at the table with them. They were unconcerned, all fawning over her to get on Carlos' good side. Bombarded with their expressions of praise, commendation, and admiration, Debbie didn't know how to respond. It was Carlos who came to her rescue. My wife is shy. Let's eat, he said. Debbie's face turned red. Immediately, his proposal was echoed. The subject was changed. Someone asked the waiter to bring the meals. During the feast, Debbie realized something. The fact that she was at a dinner with Carlos and the way Carlos had answered that man's question kind of made their relationship public. But under the circumstances, there seemed to be nothing wrong with the way Carlos told the others who she was. Debbie stopped thinking about the issue and ate while listening to them talk about work. She had nothing to add, so she remained quiet as they talked shop. Some things she understood, sometimes it was jargon or abbreviations she was unfamiliar with. But a wise person never learned with their mouth open. Carlos barely said anything afterwards. However, even so, the other men kept asking his opinion on this or that. I need to use the little girl's room, Debbie whispered in Carlos' ear. The bathroom in the booth was occupied, so Debbie had to go outside. Do you want me to go with you? asked Carlos. No, you stay. I'll be right back. Debbie let out a long exhale when she stepped outside. The ambience inside the booth was nice but boring. She kept walking. A conversation came to her ears when she passed by the smoking zone. It was actually whispering between two men. She wasn't eavesdropping, but since they mentioned Carlos, she couldn't help noticing. We just found out yesterday that Mr. Hua was married, and today we got to see her for ourselves, said one man. I want to know more about her. What's her background? I don't want to make any mistakes talking to her. But really, who wants to ask Mr. Hua that? Observed his companion. What's he up to tonight, anyway? Isn't it obvious? Pretty much everything he did after he got here. And the words he said indicated the woman was Mrs. Hua. What he didn't say was that she had to be respected, but that was the subtext. Disrespecting her is like disrespecting him. I think he wanted all of us to remember that. The men that had come to dinner tonight might be of different levels of importance, but they were all elites in commerce and enjoyed a high status in Y City. Debbie stood there and thought, It's just a dinner. How can it mean that much? But what the two men said also made sense. Carlos was always serious. Everything he said or did meant something. Debbie went another way to go to the bathroom. She didn't want it to be awkward bumping into those two. On her way back to their booth, the door to another booth opened and the people inside walked out. There were a lot of them. Debbie was going to change direction again, but she spotted someone familiar. And almost at the same time the person saw her too. Debbie? Debbie Nien, called a surprised voice. It was Hayden's mom, Blanche. Along with her were Hayden's father, Portia, a middle-aged couple, and a young man. It looked like some kind of engagement meeting. Since Blanche called her, Debbie knew she couldn't just run away. Hi, nice to see you, she said, greeting Hayden's parents politely. She really wanted out of here. Seeing Hayden's family made her think of how he kept hitting on her. It was like he didn't want to believe she was really married, believe that he was entitled to her simply because he wanted her. Whenever he texted, her heart sank like a stone. Sometimes while talking to him, she threw up in her mouth a bit. Why are you here? asked Portia curtly, looking her up and down. She sounded surprised. She didn't say it, but her tone told Debbie what she really thought was, Wow, woman, how can you even possibly afford this place? Who is this? asked the young man. Wearing a blue down jacket, he looked at Debbie the same way Portia had only difference was he seemed interested. 
The glint in his eyes disgusted Debbie, but somehow the man looked familiar. She just couldn't quite place his face. She racked her brains trying to figure out where she'd seen him, but she couldn't figure it out. School? No. Maybe at one of Carlos' meetings? No. Who is this guy? She's nobody. Louis, let's go, said Griffin Goo, Hayden's father. Considering the history between Debbie and the Goo family, he knew nothing good would come out of this chance meeting. He wanted no trouble for anyone and hoped they could leave as soon as possible. However, Blanche wasn't done yet. Are you here to see Hayden? No can do, sister. He's not here. He's on a date with my daughter-in-law-to-be. Her voice was full of contempt. Hayden has a fiancé? But why is he still texting me every day? What a jerk. Debbie thought to herself. It's not what you think. I didn't come here for your son. I'm just having dinner with some people. Debbie explained with a smile. Hearing that Debbie wasn't there for Hayden, Blanche felt embarrassed. Clearly, she had fallen into a pit she dug for herself. To save face, she turned to the aloof woman standing next to her and said with a fawning smile, Mrs. Hua, this is my son's ex-girlfriend. My son dumped her years ago, but she still pesters him. Sorry about that. I'm so embarrassed. Mrs. Hua. Debbie looked at the aloof woman again. She had the same cold presence as Carlos, but there were some other people who had the surname Hua in the city. Debbie thought maybe she wasn't related to Carlos at all. However, although she was a total stranger to the woman, she could see disdain in Mrs. Hua's eyes. Debbie turned to Blanche and retorted, Mrs. Gu, you're wrong. Your son is pestering me. I think I may need your help to get through to him. Since we're here right now, I'll just say this. Please tell your son to back off. I'm married. Blanche's face turned hideous with embarrassed rage. What are you talking about? My son? Pestering you? Don't be ridiculous. You hooked up with someone's secretary and do some skincare, and then you think you're rich and powerful? Get over yourself. You said you're married, but I don't see a ring. Maybe your husband can't even afford one. Just like her son, Hayden, Blanche also thought Debbie married Emmett. Debbie took a deep breath and decided to ignore her. She turned to Mrs. Hoare instead and wanted to give her a heads up. Lady, if I were you, I wouldn't let my son marry Portia. Look at who he'd have for a mother-in-law. Like mother, like daughter, you know? Mrs. Hua looked like she wanted to say something, but she thought better of it and remained silent. Her son had been staring at Debbie with interest the whole time. She felt so disappointed. Debbie's words enraged Blanche completely. She viciously yanked Debbie away from Mrs. Hua and warned, Watch your mouth or I'll make sure you won't have one anymore. You slutty, nosy bitch. After that, she turned to the middle-aged couple with an apologetic smile and said, Mr. and Mrs. Hua Lewis, this woman is crazy. Just ignore her. The couple didn't want to get involved in the drama. They turned to leave. The young man, however, didn't move. He hadn't taken his eyes off Debbie from the moment he saw her. I'm also worried that Portia would turn out like her mom. How about I call off the engagement and be your boyfriend? He said to Debbie. Portia looked at Debbie with burning eyes. Debbie took out her necklace from under her clothes and shook it before Louis was eyes. See? I'm married. Not wanting to be noticed, she had been wearing her huge diamond wedding ring around her neck as a necklace. Of course, Carlos found out she hadn't been wearing the ring and punished her for a long time in bed, so she worked up the pendant as a compromise. Portia fixed her eyes on the ring immediately when she saw it, and knew it was precious. Certainly more than any of them could afford. Even an idiot could tell that ring was priceless. Shocked at the size of Debbie's ring, Portia started to study her accessories. She found out that the plain-looking ear studs Debbie wore were actually worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. The shoes she was in cost nearly 20000 So, is Debbie really married to a secretary? But Emmett was Carlo's secretary. It made sense to Portia that he could afford these things. I like stealing other men's wives. It's exciting. Be my girlfriend. I'll buy you two rings just like the one you have. What do you say? Louis was said shamelessly. Debbie couldn't believe her ears. 
She looked at the man who was smiling at her evilly. He's flirting with me right in front of Portia. So did I get it wrong? Maybe they're not here to talk about their engagement. Her thoughts were interrupted by her ringtone. She pulled out her phone and saw it was Carlos. She walked away from Luis Hua and took the call. I'm heading back, she told Carlos. When she was back inside the booth, Carlos took her hand under the table and asked, You were gone for a while. Where did you go? I came across a friend. We talked, she answered casually. Okay. Are you full? Yeah. Let's go then. Carlos held Debbie's hand and stood up. Debbie was speechless. Leaving the table as soon as he is stuffed, Carlos is so arrogant. Seeing Carlos stand up, the others all followed. Someone took his and Debbie's coats for him. A couple of guests helped them get their coats on, and someone else opened the door for him. Their enthusiasm made Debbie sick, but not Carlos. Her husband was expressionless, as if he were accustomed to it. Once they were out of the building, they got into the car. I'll drop you off at the manor, but I have to go back to the office. It's work. He shrugged, then continued, Be home late tonight. Can't you do it tomorrow? asked Debbie. It was already 9 p.m. He worked late every day. She was worried. I have work to do tomorrow, too. If I don't finish up today, I'll just have more work to do tomorrow. I'll leave work as early as I can, okay? He explained with a smile and then kissed her forehead. She nodded. Okay then. Don't be out too late. The car came to an intersection after it left the underground parking lot. There was a traffic jam. The emperor slowed down. Debbie looked out the window while Carlos was on the phone talking to Emmett. Suddenly, she noticed some people pushing each other at the entrance of Alioth building. There were men and women. The woman in a black overcoat looked familiar, though. After she pushed a man and turned around, Debbie saw her face. The woman in the black overcoat was none other than Casey. Lewis was there, grabbing Casey's arm. Portia was standing nearby with a man and a woman. Debbie's gut feeling told her that something bad happened to Casey. She turned to Carlos and said anxiously, I have to get out there. Go on ahead, Carlos. You need to get to work. She was about to open the car door, but he stopped her. What's going on? Why the rush? Carlos asked in confusion. I think Casey's in trouble. I need to check on her. Anxiety was written all over her face. Location, he said shortly. What location? Casey's location. Oh, she's at the entrance of Alioth building. Call me if you need help, Carlos nodded. Sure. Come home early after work. After Debbie got out of the car, the traffic light changed to green. Carlos started the emperor's engine. Call Ralph Lou, demanded Carlos. Ralph Lou was one of Carlos' subordinates, the general manager in charge of Alioth building. Yes, Mr. Hua, answered Emmett. At the entrance of Alioth building, Casey was nursing a red mark on her face. She had just been slapped across the face and was about to slap back when Lewis grabbed her wrist. Enough. Are you done? We've been broken up for a while, he thundered. A devastated Casey smacked a gift box against Lewis and yelled, When did we break up? You cheater. I've spent all day picking out this gift to celebrate your promotion, and this is how you repay me. Ignoring her questions, Lewis adjusted his clothes and complained, Quit making a fool of yourself. Leave. Now. Casey, a woman's voice chimed in. They turned to look who it was. A woman in a gray overcoat was walking toward them at a hurried pace. Her eyes swept over them as she asked, What's going on? Casey sobered up at the sight of her. Tomboy, why are you here? Lewis' eyes lit up. Hey, beautiful. We meet again. Paying no attention to him, Debbie approached Casey and grabbed her hands, only to see her swollen cheek. Just passing by. What's wrong with your face? Who hit you? With arms akimbo, the woman standing next to Portia said coldly, She's a hoe and she deserved it. Debbie looked Portia in the eye and asked emotionless, Did you hit her? With a scornful smile, Portia replied, She seduced my fiancé. She's lucky I just slapped her. I should have stripped her clothes off and thrown her out on the street. 
Debbie released Casey and strode towards Portia. Smack! The slap was so loud that even passersby stopped to look on. Everyone was stunned by Debbie's sudden move, especially Lewis. He fixed his eyes upon her. His gaze was full of desire instead of fury. Wow, I've never seen such a hot chick before. She must be wild in bed, he mused. In stunned disbelief, Portia yelled at the top of her lungs, Bitch, who do you think you are? What are you two waiting for? Tie her up. The man and woman then came to their senses and tried to seize Debbie. However, Portia was too angry to remember that Debbie was a good fighter. Within seconds it was all over. Debbie swept the woman off her feet with a simple movement of her leg. The woman hit the ground hard, and it knocked the wind out of her. The man advanced on our heroine. You'll pay for that, bitch, he growled. She didn't pay, he did. When he grabbed for her she kicked him right between the legs. His mouth formed an O. Oh. Then Debbie pushed on his forehead and he fell over. Both would-be assailants rolled back and forth on the ground, coughing and wailing in pain. At this moment, a man in a suit and leather shoes trotted towards them, followed by a dozen bodyguards. The man was surprised to see Lewis here. Mr. Lewis Hua, he greeted. Ralph Lu, what are you doing here? Lewis asked. Obviously they knew each other. Emmett asked me to help Miss Debbie Nien, Ralph Lu replied honestly. Lewis cast a meaningful glance at Debbie. So that's her name. She can fight. I like her even more. Debbie knew these guys must work for Carlos, so she told Ralph Lu, I'm Debbie Nien. Since you're here to help me, then beat the shit out of this scumbag. She pointed at Lewis. Ralph Lu was startled at the request and decided to probe further. Miss Nian, is there some misunderstanding between you two? This is the general manager of ZL Group's New York branch. The general manager of ZL Group's New York branch? And you are Carlos Huas? She asked Louis. Louis' face changed dramatically at the mention of Carlos Hua. Fear could be seen in his eyes, but soon it was replaced by hubris. He's my cousin, he announced, proud as a peacock. Oh, I see. He's Carlos' cousin. Then the middle-aged couple I met earlier must be Carlos' relatives. Despite Louis' identity, Debbie didn't plan to let him go. She didn't care who he was. She had kicked Carlos before, and she wasn't about to surrender to a scumbag like Louis. She turned to Ralph Lou and asked angrily, You gonna help me or not? Who is she? She's not afraid of Carlos' cousin at all, Ralph Lou mused. With an embarrassed smile, he said, Miss Nien, I think there must be some misunderstanding. How about this? Debbie interrupted him. How about what? If you're not going to help, then stay out of the way. Ralph Lou was struck speechless. Under ordinary circumstances, he would have done as Debbie said. After all, Emmett had told him to help her. But this was Louis Hua. No matter what, he couldn't afford to hit Louis. Carlos would have his head cut off if he did that, he feared. Fine. I knew I couldn't count on anyone else, Debbie said, as she took off her overcoat and handed it to Casey. Her move snapped Casey back to her senses. She grabbed Debbie's arm and tried to stop her. Hey, tomboy, forget it. Let's go. Casey pondered letting Lewis go. This might develop into something that she couldn't handle. There were many bodyguards around and Debbie might get hurt. A little douchebag like Lewis just wasn't worth it. She hated Lewis, but she didn't want to cause trouble. After all, he was Carlos' cousin. If Debbie beat Lewis to a pulp like she wanted, Carlos might get angry, and it will end up in a big row. Debbie tapped Casey's forehead and snapped. Are you kidding me? Since when did you become a doormat? When Hayden dumped me, you wanted to beat the shit out of him for me. Hayden had broken up with Debbie years ago. Back then, Casey and Jared had assembled a group of people to teach him a hard lesson. But Debbie had stopped them. Now, Casey was deeply aware of Debbie's feeling back then. She released Debbie's hand and dropped into a figuring stance. All right. He had this coming. With a satisfied smile, Debbie took her coat back and threw it at Ralph Lou. Watch and learn, guys. This is how you deal with an asshole. With Debbie's coat in his hand, Ralph Lou was at loss for words. I'm not your slave, he cursed inwardly. 
He was about to throw the coat back at Debbie when Casey warned him, You better take good care of the coat. It's a prototype for a clothing line produced by ZL Group. You damage it, you pay for it. The latest prototype of ZL Group? Not until then did Debbie realize why Carlos had her wear that coat to the dinner party. No wonder everyone there talked about clothes all the time. Debbie clenched her fists. Carlos Hua, you used me as your model. Not knowing whether Casey was lying, Ralph Lou told one of the bodyguards, find out if the woman is telling the truth. Debbie raised her fist and threw it at Louis' face. Although Louis knew next to nothing about martial arts, he was a fan of boxing matches and was fast enough to dodge her fist. Seeing Debbie start a fight, Portia ordered Ralph in a harsh voice. Why are you still standing there? The bitch dares to beat Mr. Louis Hua. If he gets hurt, do you think you could afford it? Ralph didn't dare to offend either side, so he told the bodyguards. Stop them. Cornered by Debbie, Louis warned. Woman, one more step and I'll escalate this. Escalate to whom? Is it Carlos you're banking on? Shouldn't you be ashamed of calling on another man to fight the stupid scuffles you started? Debbie snapped. Seeing Debbie not convinced, Louis took his phone out from his pocket. Just then she landed a punch in his belly. He winced in pain. Joining in, Casey took the chance to slap him across the face. A humiliated Louis shouted to the bodyguards, Drag them away! Helpless yet fumed with rage, Portia thought to herself, Who does she think she is? She used to be the dog of me and my brother. In her high heels, she rushed to Debbie and grabbed her arm. Debbie Nien, if you dare touch Mr. Louis Hua again, I swear it will be the end of you and my brother. Huh. Debbie's jaw dropped. Are you kidding me? You think the Gu family is something I give a damn about, don't you? To be honest, your family was even no match for Jared's family before. It is a stroke of luck that Hayden has managed to improve the lot of the Gu family in the last few years. So stop showing off. You are just from a nouveau riche family. The blunt truth in Debbie's words incensed Portia. With a sour face, she snarled. Shut up, bitch. Your mouth stinks. Debbie shook off Portia's hand. Portia Gu, I'm not the old Debbie Nien anymore. I don't give a hoot about you or your stupid brother. I'm going to teach this Mr. Jerk a lesson today. Oh, don't worry. Casey won't see him anymore. He doesn't deserve. Before Debbie could finish, Portia gave her such a heavy slap that she could feel color flaming up in her cheek. Casey, who was blocked by two bodyguards, heard the slap and turned to look what happened. When she saw Debbie's swollen cheek, she broke herself free, charged forward and yelled at Portia. Portia Goo, how dare you hit Debbie? You will pay for this. Not knowing Debbie's strong backer, Portia gave Casey a mocking smile and taunted. Really? I don't think I'll pay for it. Debbie Nian is just a worthless bitch who used to suck up to me and my brother. Two bodyguards helped Louis to his feet. As he adjusted his clothes, he scowled at Ralph and demanded, Tie them up. Ralph held Debbie's coat with utmost care. Aware that it was worth over three hundred dollars, zero 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 not something he would wish to compensate for, even if he could afford. All the same, there was no way he could disobey Lewis' orders. So he called on his men. Hear Mr. Lewis Hua? Do as he says. Debbie got raving mad when she remembered the last time she was slapped. It was on account of the same Portia. Before the bodyguards could subdue her and Casey, Debbie grabbed Portia's wrist tight, giving her such a scare that she screamed like a banshee. Debbie dragged Portia to Lewis. Mr. Jerk, how dare you cheat on my friend? Look how I'm going to teach this horror lesson. Ignoring Portia's screams of terror, Debbie slapped her so hard she saw stars. Lewis, however, had no intention of stopping Debbie at all. His eyes lit up at the sight of this. It had been a long time since he was last turned on by a woman. He wished he could press Debbie against the wall and give her an S&M right now. While Portia was still reeling from the shock, Debbie gave her two more slaps. Certain that the men around were not able to save her from Debbie, Portia tried to hit back. Flinging her expensive bag in the hope she'd hit Debbie, she yelled hysterically, Screw you! I'll kill you! But Debbie was too quick and dodged with ease. Seeing that she was no match for Debbie, 
Portia took out her phone from her bag and dialed a number. Bring guys who know martial arts to the entrance of Alioth building. Quick! She hollered. Debbie looked on with a derisive smile and casually asked, Are you done with your phone call? Have your people come. Debbie Nian, just wait and see. Why should I wait? Am I a fool? Anyway, I hope you've learned not to mess with everyone. But in case you still want us to dance, I'll be more than willing. Try me. With that, Debbie waved at a young man who was watching the fun in front of a beauty salon. E. Ansuma. The man's face blushed scarlet. He was too shy to say a word. Debbie came up to him and asked politely, Are you an employee of this salon? Can I borrow something from you? What do you want? He asked in confusion. After Debbie whispered in his ear, he got into the salon and before long, came out and handed her something. Debbie returned to Portia, who was trying to call Hayden. Unfortunately, he was on the plane, and his phone had been switched off. Portia was instantly alerted upon seeing the thing in Debbie's hand. What are you going to do? Her voice was trembling. Guess what I'm going to do? Debbie waved the scissors in her hand and gave her a wicked grin. I'll shave you bald right here. Portia's face paled. She covered her head and hid behind Louis. Mr. Louis Hua, help me please. Louis himself was no match for Debbie, but he was a man and he couldn't afford to see a woman being bullied in front of him. He tried to coax Debbie. Beautiful girl, please. Let her go for my sake. Let's put this matter to rest now, okay? It's not safe to play with sharp objects like you're doing. What if someone gets hurt? Louis was a playboy, always too soft, too patient with beautiful women. Debbie, however, didn't none of that crap. She pointed the scissors to his crotch and threatened, one second thought, I better cut your dick off. You'll never hurt girls again after this, I promised. Lewis went numb at the sight of the menacing woman, certain that if he tried to resist Debbie, things will turn nasty. He chose to corporate. He drew Portia aside, grabbing both her hands so that she wouldn't move while Debbie clipped her hair. Don't worry, better the small humiliation of a bald shave than to think we can fight her when we both know what she's capable of. Portia broke herself free and slapped Lewis across the face. You are good for nothing, wimp. Why not call your cousin? He's Mr. Hua. And you are the general manager of ZL Group's New York branch yourself. Why are you so afraid of her? Debbie Nian is just a weak woman. We have so many people here. Ask them to tie her up. Lewis had been beaten by Debbie and cussed out by Portia. He was a proud man and couldn't stand it anymore. He pointed at Portia and cursed loudly. Debbie's right. You're just like your mother. A total bitch. Get the hell out of my way. Everyone was so shocked they couldn't say a word. Debbie was not interested in the drama. She approached Portia, grabbed her long hair and cut a large hunk of it off with the scissors. Portia's hair fluttered to the ground along with her screams. Aark. Louis Hua, you puss pop. Call your cousin. Portia yelled at him. Lewis was fumed with rage when she called him that. He pointed at Debbie and demanded, Have her arrested. Now. Otherwise, you're all fired. The bodyguards urged Ralph to action. Boss, we need to do something. Mr. Lewis Hua is Mr. Hua's cousin. If we get hurt, it won't be a big deal. But I'm sure Mr. Hua will be pissed if Mr. Lewis Hua gets hurt. He's right. You can just tell Mr. Zhong that Mr. Lewis Hua forced us to arrest her. They make a lot of sense, Ralph thought. He didn't need much time and something needed to be done here before Lewis got hurt even more. This had gone too far. He nodded and gestured to his men. Do as Mr. Lewis Hua says. Arrest Debbie Nian. The bodyguards swarmed around Debbie. Meanwhile, Ralph took out his phone and called Emmett. Debbie was busy cutting Portia's hair. When the bodyguards approached, Casey stood in front of Debbie, arms out, intended to shield her from harm. What are you going to do? Just go away, shouted Casey. Debbie waved the scissors in the air and declared nonchalantly, Go ahead if you don't mind losing your dicks. The bodyguards didn't believe Debbie could fight. Not this girl, not any woman, really. Two men dragged Casey away, and the rest advanced on Debbie. Debbie kicked a man in the gut and he staggered backwards. 
There were too many of them, so Debbie had to let go of Portia. The girl almost passed out. No sooner had Ralph told Emmett what had happened than the secretary yelled at him over the phone. Ralph, that is the dumbest thing I've heard all day. Don't blame me if you're fired or something. You've really stepped in it this time. What? Why? Emmett, I only did as Mr. Lewis what asked. Wiping the cold sweat off his forehead, Emmett said. Ask your men to stop and apologize to Mrs. Ea Debinian. It's not too late. If she gets hurt because of you, you'll be so dead. Listen to me, man. Ralph was not fully convinced yet. Emmett, are you out of your mind? Debbie Nian offended Mr. Louis Hua, not to mention the daughter of the Gu family. Are you sure you want me to help her? Of course, I'm a hundred percent sure. Mr. Hua asked you to help her. She's Mr. Hua's woman, and he cares more about her than Mr. Louis Hua. Capice. Emmett said this through gritted teeth. Of course, Emmett's words came as a great shock to Ralph. What? Debbie Nian is Mr. Hua's woman? I know there's a rumor that he's married, but she could be anyone. Thinking about this, he yelled at his men. Guys, retreat. The bodyguards were fighting with Debbie, who was a formidable opponent. They were too excited to pay attention to Ralph's order. Of course, not like she was giving them a chance to think. One was on the cement nursing a kneecap, likely broken. She had also swept another with her leg, knocking him to the ground, and she had just finished punching one in the throat, causing him to stumble backwards trying to catch his breath. She didn't fool around when she fought. These men had underestimated her and were paying the price. Ralph was so anxious he dashed towards them and even got between them and Debbie. Are you deaf? I said retreat. His sudden move stunned them. They didn't dare to hurt Ralph, so they stopped. Ralph heaved a sigh of relief and wiped the sweat off his forehead. He turned around and put on an unctuous smile. Miss Nian, I'm really sorry about all this. Are you hurt? How about I take you to the hospital? Debbie was confused by his change in attitude. What do you mean by that? With an awkward smile, Ralph said, Sorry, Miss Nian. I wasn't trying to hurt you. He then turned to his men. Arrest Mr. Louis Hua. Do as Miss Nian says. Get it. Everyone was dumbstruck. At the ZL group, Emmett swallowed and told Carlos worriedly, Mr. Hua, something happened at the Alioth building. He knew Carlos would be angry, but he didn't dare keep it from his boss. Otherwise, he would end up in hell. Alioth building? Carlos raised his head and fixed his sharp eyes on Emmett. How is she? Um, Mrs. Hua is all right. Mr. Louis Hua is also there, and he got in a fight with her. She beat the shit out of him and cut Portia Gu's hair. Ralph, you better start praying, Emmett thought to himself. Louis Hua. Carlos furrowed his brows as he picked up his phone and called Debbie. The phone call connected soon. Hey, honey. Her voice was low. Carlos guessed that there might be others around her. Are you okay? Did you get hurt? He asked worriedly. I'm great. Um, I beat up your cousin. Her voice trailed off. She wondered whether Carlos would blame her or not. Carlos heaved a sigh of relief and even praised her. Nice. He deserved it. What? Nice. Debbie was confused. Aren't you mad? Yes, I'm mad, but not at you. Get Lewis on the phone. Ea. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mr. Jerk, it's for you. Carlos heard Debbie's voice coming from the other end. Mr. Jerk. Carlos chuckled. Well, she's not wrong. Confused, Lewis took over the phone. Me? Who is this? He saw the caller ID Mr. Hua and wondered, Another Hua. Do I know him? He asked casually, Hello, who is this? Me. The simple word scared Lewis to death. He recognized Carlos' voice. He eyed Debbie up and down, wondering who she was to Carlos. Hey, Carlos, what's up? Louis' words caught Portia's attention. Did Carlos who call Debbie? She looked back and forth between Debbie and Louis and thought to herself, Why did Mr. Hu call Debbie? How are they related? After Carlos said something, Louis nodded immediately. Okay, I get it. I'll be there soon. After hanging up, Louis fixed his gaze on Debbie. 
After a long time, he decided to take her with him to meet Carlos. Let's get going. He grabbed her wrist. Debbie shook off his hand in disgust and snapped. Where? Why should I go with you? I'm heading to my cousin's office. This is your fault. And you need to tell him. Louis didn't know why he had to take Debbie with him, but he had a gut feeling that he would be much safer if he took Debbie to meet his cousin. Ralph, who had just sent two patrolmen away, approached them and offered, Mr. Louis Hua, Miss Nien, I'll get the car. Debbie bid Casey goodbye and was about to get into the car when Portia grabbed her arm hard. No. We're not done. Portia yelled. Her men would arrive in a few minutes. She had no intention of letting Debbie off the hook so easily. Before Debbie could respond, Louis pulled Portia away and snapped impatiently, Get the hell out of here, Portia. I thought you were an ice queen, but you're really as clingy as an octopus. He didn't love Portia. He just took it as a challenge to melt the ice queen's heart. But now she was getting on his nerves. Portia trembled with anger at Louis' remarks. With red eyes, she pointed at him and shouted, Damn it, Louis! You're cancelled! I'm telling my mom to call off our engagement. Debbie had guessed right. Portia and Louis were about to get engaged. Whatever. Louis shrugged and got into the car. Seeing Debbie remain motionless, he urged, Hurry! Get in the car! You don't want her bitch cooties, do you? Portia broke out into curses. Louis Hua, you're an asshole. Everyone in your family is. Debbie, trying hard to suppress her giggles, got into the back seat. Louis was not angered by Portia's words. My family? Does that include Carlos? Portia stopped as soon as Louis mentioned Carlos. She cast a murderous glance at Debbie and threatened through gritted teeth. Debbie Nien, just wait and see. With a wide grin, Debbie clapped back. Oh, don't forget to tell your brother. I kicked your ass and cut your hair. You! Portia was too angry to utter a complete sentence. The car soon drove off, leaving Portia behind. Her long fingernails dug into her palms, leaving deep marks. At the ZL Group, Louis and Debbie made a beeline for the CEO's office. Most employees didn't know Debbie, but they knew Louis. The elevator came to a halt on the 66th floor. Staring at the closed door of Carlos' office, Louis nudged Debbie forward and said, Remember our arrangement. You go in first. Debbie was dumbstruck. Seriously? You're really afraid of Carlos, aren't you? I can understand why Jared is scared of Carlos. But you're his cousin. Besides, he's not that scary. She thought to herself. There were only two people in the secretary's office, Emmett and Zelda. Zelda stood up from her seat and greeted Louis. Mr. Louis Hua, good evening. She was quite surprised to see Debbie. Louis leered at her, and a wolf whistle escaped his lips. Zelda, you're as hot as ever. This was a common thing, Louis was a shameless flirt. Stop it, Zelda complained, her face reddening. She sat back in her seat. Emmett came up to them and told Louis respectfully, Mr. Louis Hua, Mr. Hua is waiting for you. Then he approached Debbie and whispered in her ear, Mrs. Hua, why are you here with him? If Louis weren't here, Emmett would have let Debbie know that Louis was an asshole and advised her to keep him at arm's length. Debbie said with a shrug, He forced me to come here. Louis got close to the office door and then realized that Debbie wasn't behind him. He cast a burning glance at her and said in a low voice, What are you waiting for? Open the door. Emmett trotted towards the office and knocked on the door. With Carlos' permission, he pushed the door open and addressed his boss. Mr. Hua, Mrs. Hua and Mr. Louis Hua are here. Louis grabbed Debbie and pushed her into the office. Caught off guard, she staggered, almost falling onto the floor. Carlos, sitting in his armchair, saw Debbie falter. He immediately stood up, strode towards her and pulled her into his arms. It's very late. Why aren't you home? You okay? That was when he saw her red and swollen cheek. Who did this to you? He asked in a cold voice and furrowed his eyebrows. Don't worry. I'm okay. I, I came here. Because I missed you. Can I get a ride home with you? Debbie held back Carlos' waist and cast a challenging glance at Louis, who couldn't believe his eyes and ears. Why was she so familiar with his cousin? 
Carlos disentangled her from his arms and examined her cheek carefully. His face turned livid. Who did this? He shifted his gaze to Louis, who also had a swollen face. Assuming that Louis hit Debbie, Carlos released her, and before Louis could respond, kicked him in the gut, knocking him to the floor. He then walked over to his prone body and placed his foot on him. Then he asked in an icy tone, You hit her, didn't you? Beside him was a table. Carlos picked up the teapot from the table and raised it overhead, as if he was going to smash it against Louis' head. Louis' face paled. Relax, man. I didn't hit her. It was Portia Goo. She slapped her. It was the first time that Debbie had seen Carlos lose it like this, and she was a little scared as well. She then realized that Carlos had always been rather kind to her when she had offended him so many times. Louis please snap Debbie back to reality. She grabbed Carlos' arm and explained, He didn't hit me. I kicked his ass. Carlos then let go of Louis, placed the teapot back on the table and warned him, If she hits you again, don't fight back. What? But why? Louis was in stunned disbelief. Carlos straightened his suit and said indifferently, She's my wife. She's Carlos' wife. That means she's my cousin-in-law. Louis almost choked on his own tongue. Ignoring Louis, who was too shocked to stand up, Carlos buzzed Emmett. Get in here. And bring some ice. Then he led Debbie to the couch, sat down and stroked her cheek softly. So it was Portia? His voice was soft, but Debbie could somehow feel danger. It came back to her now how people used to describe Carlos, cruel and cold-hearted. Debbie grabbed his hands and coaxed him. Honey, cool down. I got even with her. I slapped her several times and even cut her hair. So just let it go, okay? Carlos, however, was not easily convinced. Leave her to me, he said. A cold shiver ran down Debbie's spine, as his tone suggested that he would kill Portia. Don't, Carlos. I don't care. It was nothing. Leave it to me, please. At this moment, Emmett came in with an ice pack and handed it to Carlos. Louis was still lying on the floor, but Emmett didn't even blink. However, when he spotted Debbie's swollen cheek, he asked worriedly, Mrs. Hua, what happened? Did someone hit you? Does it hurt? Who had the nerve to hit Mr. Hua's woman? Look at Mrs. Hua's fair skin. That must be stinging, he thought. The concern that Emmett showed towards Debbie really touched her heart. It's all right. I feel much better now, but it's nice of you to ask, she said with a friendly smile. Emmett Zhong. Carlos' voice sounded as cold as ice. Emmett shifted his gaze to his boss and answered, Yes, Mr. Hua. Your heart must be broken now, huh? Carlos asked emotionless. Emmett nodded honestly. He always had a tender heart for women. Besides, Debbie had always been nice to him. Debbie somehow sensed something was not right with Carlos and winked at Emmett. However, Emmett didn't get her point. Instead, he asked innocently, Mrs. Hua, what's wrong with your eyes? You got hurt? Shall we call a doctor over to check? Debbie was speechless. I did what I could, but he didn't get me. Can't he see that Carlos is in a terrible mood right now? She wondered. Emmett, it seems that you care about my wife very much, Carlos said casually as he dabbed the ice pack onto Debbie's swollen cheek. He turned to Louis, who had stood up from the floor and ordered, Louis Hua, don't just stand there while this dumbass pokes his nose into my business. Strike him in the face. Only then did Emmett realize he had almost stepped on a landmine. His face turned pale. With a cold smile, Carlos continued, In this way, you can share in her happiness and suffering. Debbie was at a loss for words. Carlos is way too possessive, she thought. Please don't get me wrong, Mr. Hua. I, I remember I have something urgent to attend to. I'll take my leave now, said Emmett and quickly turned to leave. But just as he was about to step out of the door, Louis blocked his way. Emmett, you know, on this turf, I'll only play by my cousin's rules. Then without a second thought, he swung his clenched fist to strike. Only by a whisker did Emmett dodge. With quick darting steps, he retreated from Louis and cast an imploring glance at Debbie. Mrs. Hua, please help. The exchange at the door amused Debbie. 
Holding back her giggles, she clutched at Carlos' right arm with both hands and pleaded in a cute way. Honey, Emmett was just showing his concern for his boss wife. Don't get mad at him, okay? Besides, he's your right-hand man. How will it benefit you if he gets hurt? Do you think he's that indispensable? Asked Carlos with a dismissive snort. We have an abundance of talented people. His absence would make no difference. How cruel he is, thought Debbie. All of a sudden, a light bulb went off in her mind. Feigning sadness, she looked at Emmett and said, Emmett, you see, it's not that I didn't help you. My words cut no ice with your boss. Instantly, Carlos knew what his wife was going to say. He watched with a raised eyebrow as she continued. Not knowing Carlos had seen through her trick, Debbie cast a sad glance at her husband and continued, Emmett, I suggest you go find Miss Me to put in a good word for you. I believe her words will work. Get out. Carlos roared, at which Lewis and Emmett immediately left the office and closed the door behind them. A proud smile flashed across Debbie's face as her plan worked. Carlos sighed with profound resignation. I'll have my turn to even the score in bed this evening, he threatened. What? Why are you so obsessed with sex? Must you always link everything to what you do in bed? Debbie snapped at him. He pulled her into his arms, kissed her on the lips and said, Well, that's one of the keys to a successful marriage. Debbie pushed his hands away and complained, Stop it. Okay, okay. Is your cheek still hurting? He asked. Not at all. Just go on with your work. I'll be fine. She took the ice pack from him and dabbed it on her cheek. It was a cold winter. Fortunately, the heating system in the building was working well. I've finished my work already. Let's go home now. He had planned to teach Lewis a lesson before going back home but he hadn't expected Debbie to come here along with the jackass. And when they had arrived, he had been distracted by her swollen cheek, which gave Louis the perfect excuse to get away. In the evening, Carlos and Debbie lazily lay in bed after taking a bath together. He told her their schedule in a couple of days. As the largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club, Debbie would attend an investor's dinner tomorrow. After that, together with Carlos, she would fly to New York to celebrate New Year with the Hua family the day after tomorrow. But Megan would go there too. In the past few years, she had celebrated New Year with either the Hua family or Wesley's family. Both families doted on Megan for her bright and bubbly personality. Other than that, her parents had saved Carlos and Wesley's lives. Debbie's heart sank when she heard Megan would celebrate New Year with them. Watching her carefully, Carlos noticed Debbie's change of mood. It didn't take rocket science to tell what was on her mind. In a soft voice, he coaxed her. Actually, Megan is a good girl. I think there must be some misunderstanding between you and her. Maybe you could use this opportunity to know her better. He understood why Debbie disliked Megan. Megan was wholly dependent on Carlos and his friends. It was perfectly normal for Debbie, his wife, to feel uncomfortable when she saw another girl invading her space but Megan had just come of age. If anything, Carlos planned to send her abroad to study in a few years. Hopefully, that would put Debbie's worries to an end. If all went well, Megan might as well find a boyfriend there. Okay, Debbie answered in a low voice. She didn't want Carlos to think she was a mean woman. Carlos kissed her again. Don't worry. I won't let anyone cross you, okay? Relieved by his promise, Debbie cuddled his neck and said, you cannot go back on your words. If someone crosses me, I'll go have fun without you. Without me? How would that be? There are many things I can do. Maybe I'd even go clubbing with a random handsome guy just to blow away your money. That must be really interesting. Arg. Carlos Hua, don't bite my ear. Really? You still have the energy to mess around with another guy? Am I such an incompetent husband? Carlos pressed her against the bed, his eyes as dark as ink. A cold shiver ran down her spine as she looked him in the eye. He looked more menacing than Wolf now. No, no, no. I was just kidding. Mr. President, don't take it seriously. MMM. She was unable to talk anymore as Carlos gagged her with his lips, his hand rubbing her chest. In the Gu family's house, when Portia got home, 
Griffin and Blanche were still waiting for her in the living room. They wanted to find out how she was getting along with Louis. They were freaked out when Portia appeared in front of them. Blanche held her daughter's hands and asked anxiously, Portia, my dear, what's wrong with your hair? And your cheeks are swollen. What happened? Unable to handle the questions, Portia burst into a crying fit, wailing like a baby. When Portia finally spoke, Griffin, who was in poor health, almost had a seizure. It was Debbie Nian. Her friend has been hitting on Louis, and when I confronted the girl, Debbie attacked me with a barrage of punches. To add to the humiliation, she pulled out a pair of scissors and cut my hair, while threatening dire consequences to anyone who'd attempt to help me. More so, people fear her on account of Emmett Jong, her husband. Mom, it was so humiliating. I wished for the ground to open up and swallow me. Debbie Nian. Both Griffin and Blanche were shocked to hear that name. How the hell would Debbie have the guts to bully their beloved daughter? Blanche asked a housemaid to fetch some ice for Portia. That bitch Debbie thinks she is somebody just because she is the wife of Carlos who is secretary, she said through gritted teeth, a murderous look in her eyes. She thinks she can do whatever she wants now. Next time I see her, I'll shave her bald. Griffin was pissed. He pointed at Portia with a trembling hand. Tell me the truth. What did you do? I know Debbie. She is a fairly reasonable girl. She wouldn't have done this for no reason. He had liked Debbie a lot when she and Hayden were dating, for her natural and poised manner. He still remembered how much she had done for Hayden and how she always protected Portia. Dad, I'm your daughter, not Debbie. Why are you always taking her side? Portia protested angrily. Back when Debbie and Hayden were still dating, Portia's dad had blamed her every time she and Debbie had a conflict. And now he still did. Portia felt it was unfair. I only take the right side. Your brother is trying to get Debbie back. But you and your mom are just doing him a disservice. Griffin was disappointed in his daughter. He also blamed himself for spoiling her. Yet Blanche disagreed with his words. Don't be absurd. Hayden has agreed to get engaged to the youngest daughter of the Chin family. She's from a truly illustrious family. Debbie Nian is married. Even if she wasn't, she wasn't good enough for our son. Holding his hands behind his back, a reflective look on his face, Griffin explained to Blanche patiently, How many times have I told you about the Nian family? It was an influential family in Y City when Artie and his father were still alive. Afterwards, Debbie's grandpa was forced to sell the company to pay his deep debts to the Lou family. Plus, Artie's medical expenses cost at least $10 million. It was not until then that the family started to run into financial problems. It was fair to say that before Debbie was 10, her family had been more powerful than the Chin family. Blanche wasn't convinced. She said contemptuously, Still, the family went down. Since the day I met her, she has never been refined as a good girl from a respectable family should be. Think about those days she practiced martial arts. A girl should be delicate and elegant, but she fought and somersaulted like a boy. What was she? From some savage tribe? I wonder what Hayden sees in that poor girl. You're one to talk. Don't you know why Debbie was practicing martial arts? To save your son and daughter. It was Hayden who pushed her into martial arts. Your son was a weakling who needed her for protection from bullies. Wouldn't you have done the same thing if you were in Debbie's shoes? Look at her now. She doesn't have to protect your children anymore. She even married Emmett. And since Emmett works for Mr. Hua, by extension she also has Mr. Hua's protection. Does she need to practice martial arts anymore? Look how delicate she is now. I think you have noticed that yourself. Having talked so much, Griffin started to breathe hard. But Blanche's tone didn't soften much. You know your health condition. Why don't you save some energy? No one asked her to protect anybody. As if we couldn't even afford a bodyguard. She just wanted to show off and to let everyone know how capable she was. With his eyes closed, Griffin leaned back on the sofa to steady his breathing. After a long while, he opened his eyes and looked at his daughter, who was still sulking. Do you remember the time when you were kidnapped? Think about how Debbie saved you. Portia quieted down, her hands clenched into fists. 
I didn't ask her to save me. She made that decision on her own. Just like what my mom said, she just wanted to show off. That year, Debbie and Hayden were only friends. They hadn't started dating yet. In an attempt to save Portia, she was beaten up so badly by a bunch of kidnappers that her life hung by a thread. But those men were still not leaving her alone. When they were about to her, the police came and saved her, who was dying. Afterwards, Hayden scolded Portia for hanging out with punks. It was in the hospital that Hayden first told Debbie that he liked her. Back then, he was still a nobody in the Goo family. He hadn't achieved anything yet, and every month, he depended on pocket money from his parents. The only thing he bought for Debbie that day was a rose, which Debbie gladly accepted, and that was how their relationship had started. Hearing his daughter's response, Griffin almost had a heart attack. He tried to contain his emotions. Let go this time. If a wrong is avenged with another wrong, there would be no end to it. He persuaded while watching Blanche dab Portia's face with ice. If the matter got out of hand, he was afraid that Carlos would step in himself, not the kind of trouble the old man would wish anyone in his family to get involved in. But given that Emmett had worked for Carlos for many years, that possibility wasn't far-fetched. It was not likely that Carlos would turn a blind eye to Emmett's trouble. If Portia angered Carlos because of a trifle between her and Debbie, nobody would be able to save her. As Portia was busy massaging her stinging face, she didn't respond. However, silently, she had already made a decision in her heart. It's impossible for me to let go of this. That bitch is getting more and more arrogant. This has to come to an end, no matter what it takes. Back in Carlos' villa, he watched Debbie fall asleep. Then he got out of bed and called Emmett. What exactly happened this evening? Emmett was just dozing off when the incoming call from Carlos shook him wide awake. For the hundredth time, he thanked fate for his not having a girlfriend. Otherwise, his relationship would be strained by such calls from Carlos in the dead of the night. Emmett shook his head to expel the thought from his mind and gave Carlos a blow-by-blow -blow account of what had happened at the entrance of the Alioth building. Cancel all the ads and activities she has gotten. Shut her out for some time and you give her a warning in person. Yes, Mr. Hua. Emmett had already foreseen how the drama would unfold against Portia. The Gu family's influence had grown rapidly lately. Many advertising companies tried to suck up to Hayden by bringing in Portia, his sister to do their commercials. Although she was only a freshman at college with lousy people skills, anyone eager to please her brother could easily get that around by highlighting Portia's beauty as the main strength for engaging her. However, for the silly mistake of slapping Debbie tonight, all those advertising gigs would go up in smoke. In offending Debbie, she had messed with the wrong person. If Carlos chose to flex his muscles, Portia's life in Y City would turn into a living hell. Emmett guessed that Debbie must have pleaded with Carlos for Portia. Normally, Portia would have lost a finger for hitting Debbie. The next day, Debbie was fidgeting all day because of the investor's dinner she would have to attend that evening. That was something new to her. Before Carlos left for work, she had asked as many questions as possible about the function. Carlos spent a lot of time calming her down. After he left, Debbie got dressed and left the house too. They were going to New York for some time the following day. She felt she should put Lucinda and Sebastian in the loop about her trip before she left the city. As soon as she arrived at her aunt's house, Debbie noticed Gail and Victor fighting at the entrance. In case they saw her, Debbie didn't get out of the car, but watched them argue and fight hysterically. Since they broke up, Gail didn't pretend to be sweet and refined anymore in front of Victor, so she readily took him on in a shouting match. In a few minutes of the altercation, Victor's words got filthier. He was going to hit Gail. Debbie couldn't watch anymore. She drove the car forward and stopped beside the two fighting people. The brand new came and drew Gail's attention immediately. When she saw Debbie getting out of the car from the driver's seat, she asked with widened eyes, Debbie, whose car is this? It sounded as if Debbie had stolen the car. Standing by the open door, Debbie ignored her and looked at Victor. The one-time vice general manager of the Shining International Plaza now looked every inch a lazy slob. 
His hair looked like a roughly built bird nest, his clothes wrinkled. From the length of his stubble, he must haven't shaven for two or three days. Upon seeing Debbie, Victor found another outlet for his frustration and anger. He stalked towards the Porsche Cayman and demanded, Hey you, I've been looking for you for days on end. You got me canned so you must compensate me for my loss. Debbie rolled her eyes. How is your losing the job our fault? If Gail and you hadn't fought the other day, she wouldn't have called me. If she hadn't called me, I wouldn't have gotten involved and thus fired. As a result of that incident, Victor was fired that evening, and Gail broke up with him within two weeks. As soon as he finished his words, Victor kicked Debbie's car furiously, leaving a big footprint impressed on the red Cayman. Son of a bitch. Debbie cursed inwardly. The car cost my husband a pretty penny, you idiot. The sight of that ugly footprint gripped Debbie's heart so forcefully, you'd think she was going to have a heart attack. Gail grabbed Victor's arm and spat. Hey, idiot. This car has premium equipment. It's worth nearly two million. If you damage it, do you think you can even afford the fee for repairs with your jobless ass right now? Of course Victor was aware that the car was pricey. He loosened his tie carelessly. It's just a car. Of course I can afford the fee. Debbie limbered up a little by wriggling her wrists, seeing which, Victor already regretted what he had done. He was scared but it was too late. Debbie already came to him and clutched his collar. Memories of the last time when she had beaten him to a pulp flashed before his eyes. He started shouting shrilly. What are you doing? I'm warning you, I Debbie hauled him to the car, held his head, pressed his ugly face against the footprint, and rubbed it back and forth until the mark was gone. Gail, who had been watching the whole time, was stunned. For the millionth time, she felt lucky that she was Debbie's cousin and had never been treated so roughly. When the footprint disappeared, Debbie looked at her car. Seeing no sign of damage, she pulled Victor up and thrust him to the ground. Sent sprawling out on his stomach, Victor lay there in a crushed heap for a moment. He groaned painfully rolled and struggled to stand up. If you dare touch my car again, I'll beat the living daylights out of you, Debbie threatened, holding her fist up high. Victor was so afraid that he ignored his hurting face and started to run before he could even stand straight. In the Moo family's house, Lucinda was watching TV in the living room. She walked to the door as soon as she saw Debbie walk in with Gail. Debbie, I wasn't expecting you to come today. Debbie changed into slippers and walked into the living room. Aunt, I'm going to New York tomorrow so I came to say goodbye. Is Uncle Sebastian home? He's still at work. Why are you going to New York suddenly? Lucinda asked a housemaid to serve some fresh fruit. Hardly had Debbie sat down on the sofa when Sasha, in pajamas, came down the stairs excitedly. Debbie, you're here. I heard your voice. In ecstasy, she ran into Debbie's arms so forcefully that they both slumped into the couch. Debbie, I missed you so much. Did you come here alone? Where is my cousin-in-law? Sasha asked after giving Debbie a peck on the cheek. Expecting Carlos would be there too, she looked towards the door after breaking from Debbie's embrace. Recovering from the surprise, Debbie got up from the sofa and straightened her clothes. Stop looking. He didn't come. He has work to do. Sasha pouted her lips in disappointment. Fine. It's normal for Mr. Hoare to be busy. Even Dad comes home late from work, not to mention Mr. Hua. Gail, crunching on her snacks, suddenly stopped. She looked at Sasha in surprise. What did you just say? Who? Sasha blinked her eyes in confusion. Mr. Hua. Gail, don't you know? Debbie married Carlos Hua. Debbie married Carlos Hua? Gail had suspected that, but every time she dismissed those thoughts as far-fetched. Even though now she was hearing it, she still felt it was surreal. How is it possible for Mr. Hua to marry someone like Debbie? Sasha, your head must be muddled from sleep. Go back to sleep and don't come down until your head is clear. Gail snapped. Debbie married Carlos Hua? Was the only thing lingering in her mind. Debbie married Carlos Hua? The question lingered on. Her breathing became hard, her words slower, as if a lump had stuck in her chest. Memories flashed through her mind. 
Over and over Debbie had shouted, Carlos, I love you, in the grove, but she wasn't punished at all. Instead, Gail was the one that had gotten expelled. When Debbie told her that she was married, Gail had never taken it seriously. Actually, she had never believed a single thing that Debbie said. She remembered that when she said that she would marry to a better man than Debbie would, Debbie had retorted, no need for that, because you already lost. It also occurred to Gail the day when they came back from Southen Village, Carlos had sat with Debbie the whole time. Now everything made sense. Every one of her questions was answered. Arg. Gail suddenly screamed so loud her voice startled the other three women in the villa. Debbie looked at Gail, astonished, but Gail screamed at her again. Debbie Nian, why did you get to marry Carlos Hua? Why? Arg. That relationship must fail. Gail must be crazy. Debbie thought. Lucinda knew that Gail was acting unreasonably because she couldn't take the news well. She felt physically and mentally exhausted. Even she herself didn't know how Gail had turned out to be like that. Sitting on the sofa listlessly with red eyes, Gail mumbled to Debbie, When we were little, Grandpa often bought you princess dresses. When you wore your pretty little dress and ignored me with other kids, I swore I would marry better and be happier than you when we grew up. Gail's maternal grandpa, that was Debbie's paternal grandpa, had spoiled Debbie when he was alive. He was always buying new clothes for her. On the other hand, Gail's paternal grandpa was biased in favor of her male cousins and treated her indifferently. Therefore, every time she saw her maternal grandpa spoil Debbie, she felt jealous. When Debbie was 10, the Nyen group was given to the Lu group in payment for debts, and then her grandpa passed away. Meanwhile, her father suffered from a rare illness, which cost at least $10 million in two years. From then on, Debbie was no longer a princess. When the Nian family's financial woes began, only Lucinda and Sebastian had helped them, and Debbie had been invited to the Moo family's house very often. Unable to stand the attention her parents were showering on Debbie, Gail felt her space invaded, and soon in retaliation, she started to bully Debbie around. Not to trouble her aunt and uncle, Debbie had stoically endured Gail's bullying. But one rainy day, Debbie's endurance came to an end. That day, Debbie's dad was in the hospital in a coma. The doctors needed an adult relative's signature for the operation. Debbie thought of her aunt, so she came to her house for help. However, it was Gail who answered the door, and she wouldn't let Debbie in. If it had ended like that, Debbie wouldn't have hated her so much. That rainy night, Gail had pushed Debbie into a kennel and kept her there with a the dog for an entire night. The next morning, a housemaid found Debbie when she went to the kennel to feed the dog. She was shocked. Immediately, she woke up Sebastian and Lucinda. When the kennel was opened in the biting cold of late fall, Debbie was carried out unconscious and freezing. For three days, she remained hospitalized, running a fever. Shocked at the heinous act, Lucinda had given Gail a thorough flogging and for the next three days forced her to kneel in the ancestral temple until Debbie was discharged. Debbie was surprised that Gail had brought up the things from their childhood. In Debbie's memory when she was a child, her grandpa loved her the most. The things the other kids had, her grandpa would make sure she had them too. She also had some things that no other kid had. Her bedroom was packed with the princess dresses her grandpa had bought for her, just because she liked them. While Debbie was lost in thoughts, Lucinda stood up, intending to lecture Gail. However, Debbie put out an arm to stop her. Then she turned to Gail and said, Nobody was ignoring you. The other kids and I wanted to play with you, but you always acted haughty, as if you were better than the rest of us. Whenever we played in the garden, you always told your mom on us. With time, nobody wanted to play with you anymore. You had made your bed, and you had to lie in it. It's so unfortunate that you haven't outgrown that juvenile stuff yet. Aunt Lucinda and Uncle Sebastian are so worried about you. Last time to humiliate me, you recorded my declaration of love to Carlos and played the video at the ZL Group's new product launch event. It didn't take rocket science for Carlos to find out that you were behind the tasteless clip. As a result, you were expelled and Uncle Sebastian's company was affected too. Do you know how you were ever allowed to come back to the university again after being expelled? Familiar with Gail's narcissism before she responded, 
Debbie assumed that she had to be thinking that Carlos liked her. Actually, Gail indeed would have said so if she hadn't known that Carlos and Debbie were married. However, right now she had to keep that thought to herself. Debbie looked Gail in the eye and told her word for word. Well, the university allowed you back only by my pleading with Carlos on your behalf. And if it weren't for the fact that we are cousins, he was categorical. You'd have spent the rest of your life in the cold. Reluctant to let Gail know too much about her and Carlos, Debbie didn't tell her the whole story. But it was true that Carlos had agreed to allow Gail to come back to school because of Debbie. Since they were talking about the past, Debbie decided to discuss the matter on the table in her aunt's presence. Since I'm older than you, at least you should show some respect. I've never wanted to compete with you for anything. But you're always making things difficult for me. During the short time I struggled with adolescent problems, you always snitched on me to the teachers and even spread unfounded reports about me. I can forget all about that. But right now I'm married to Carlos. Our marriage can be found out by the press any time. I don't want Carlos to be embarrassed because of some rumor about me, so I hope you can stop starting rumors about me. If you want we can get along but it all depends on how you'll treat me. Effectively the ball is in your court. If you still hate me then it's fine by me. Let's just stay out of each other's business. Lucinda was moved by Debbie's magnanimity and tolerance. She admired the sweet girl and wished she could do more to help such an innocent, truthful soul. Standing there, motionless, Gail stared at Debbie silently. The red, long cashmere overcoat Debbie was wearing set off her fair skin. Her long inky hair was tied up without bangs. In handmade knee-high leather boots, Debbie stood straight in the middle of the living room. This was the Debbie Gale knew, but there was also something different about her. Debbie's words were wholly sincere. Everyone could see how kind and big-hearted she was. She was no longer the rough, lazy girl. Now she was so confident and refined that Gale couldn't take her eyes off her. Suddenly, Sasha chirped, Gale, let bygones be bygones. Debbie is already married to Carlos Hua. If you continue to cross her, you might only invite Mr. Hua's wrath against our entire family. Debbie's mouth twitched when she heard what Sasha had said. That's exaggerated, she thought. However, Gail remained silent. She couldn't accept the fact that Debbie had married Carlos, the most distinguished man in Y City. Without a word, she ran upstairs into her room. Lucinda lowered her head and propped one hand against her forehead in frustration. She had talked to Gail a lot of times about working things out with Debbie, but to no avail. Debbie had expressed her willingness to forgive and move on, but if Gail still held grudges against her, then she'd be vindictive, Lucinda thought. When Debbie was about to leave her aunt's house, Sasha insisted on tagging along, hoping to see Carlos Manor, thinking that it would be a good idea to have someone at her side if she took Sasha with her to the investor's dinner. Debbie texted Carlos, asking, Sasha wants to visit the manor. Mr. Hua, does she have your permission? In our house, Mrs. Hua is the boss, Carlos replied. Debbie was amused by his message. You're so sweet. I want you to take the driving seat tonight. Driving seat? After a pause, Carlos added. How about I go home and leave you in charge now? Hearing that, Debbie started the car quickly and responded. Mr. Hua, I'm driving the car. Talk to you later. Carlos, who was in a meeting with the employees of the planning department, smiled, making him look much milder. The young are fearless. A recruit of the planning department saw that smile. Mr. Hua, you look so happy. Have you been texting Mrs. Hua? She asked. Few of his employees had been brave enough to ask such questions, so Carlos was surprised to hear it, but he nodded. The entire planning department got excited. They were dying to know what kind of woman was able to win the heart of the cold, powerful Carlos Hua. But none of them dared to ask Carlos to show them his wife's picture. Wow! My goodness! Dear Lord! Good heavens! Oh my God! When Sasha arrived at the manor, she couldn't hold her joy. She ululated and screamed her heart out, feeling grateful at her favorite cousin's windfall. From the entrance to her bedroom, Debbie felt she was going deaf from Sasha's high-pitching, excited shrills. She had been shocked too when she had first come to the manor, but Sasha was on another level. 
In deep admiration, Sasha looked at Debbie and praised, You are the real Cinderella. How I wish I could marry a man as rich as your husband. But I think that's overambitious because in the real sense, I'd be contented to find a man with half Carlos' fortune. After all, successful businessmen were few and far between, not to mention someone as young and handsome as Carlos. Rest assured, you will. You are such an adorable girl. Who knows, you might find someone just as good, Debbie assured, gently stroking Sasha's cheek. To which Sasha nodded cheerfully, You flatter me, Debbie. Anyway, let's hope and pray that your wishes for me will come true. Ideally, I'd wish to make it big as a movie star. Then, even without a rich suitor like Carlos, I'll still end up just fine on my own. Yeah, I believe you can hack it as a movie star. While making small talk, Debbie took Sasha to her walk-in closet. I need a favor from you, she said as she opened the door. Name it, declared Sasha with enthusiasm. But at the sight of Debbie's clothes and jewelry, the girl's eyes lit up. I need to attend a party this evening. Apparently, Carlos is too busy to come with me. Would you mind lending me your lovely company? With a thoughtful look in her eyes, Debbie opened the closet full of evening dresses and selected a pink one for Sasha. Blown away by the luxurious collection, Sasha picked a sexy party dress. Trust me, Deb, you'll rock in this one. Why not try it on now? For another occasion, I would have loved this burgundy dress, but since tonight's party is kind of formal, I think I need an appropriate one. Debbie turned Sasha down politely. Okay, then try this white one on. This one looks good. Let's get changed together, Debbie offered. Yeah. The two girls spent a long time selecting dresses and jewelry. When Emmett called, Debbie was tired and sleepy, but Sasha was still adorning herself with jewelry excitedly. E. Emmett. Debbie Grata. While answering the phone, she took a few steps from Sasha and sat at the dressing table, playing with her lipsticks. There were so many shades that she was spoiled for choice. Mrs. Hua, I'll drive you and Miss Mu to the party, said Emmett. Every employee in the company has their hands full. Even Mr. Hua himself is too busy to see his wife, so he sent me to drive the queen of his heart to the party. She must mean so much to him. If he could even squeeze out half an hour, I believe he would be here to drive her to the party himself, he mused. Okay, where are you now? We're almost done, said Debbie. She grabbed a lipstick with a low-key shade and walked toward the closet. Adorned in excessive brilliant jewels and pearls, Sasha looked like a moving display shelf. Meanwhile, Emmett killed the engine and answered, I'm waiting for you at the gate. You can come out if you're ready. Okay, we'll be there soon. After hanging up, Debbie put on the lipstick and left the villa with Sasha in a hurry. In a five-star hotel, many people paid attention to Debbie and Sasha especially to the huge differences in their outfits. Debbie was wearing a beige dress with little jewelry, while Sasha was wearing a light green one with as much jewelry as possible. Sasha whispered in Debbie's ear, Deb, everyone is looking at you. I don't think so. An embarrassed smile flashed across Debbie's face, but the ecstatic Sasha couldn't stop talking. Actually, I put on much jewelry just on purpose. This way, people will notice your standout sense of fashion and persona, without breaking a sweat. Whatever floats your boat. It was a topic that Debbie didn't want to dwell on. The guests in attendance at this party were all successful businessmen in Y City. Among the few that Debbie could recognize, she saw Sebastian, Griffin, Hayden, and Olga, whose name she had often mentioned to Carlos. Whenever he annoyed her, she would mention Olga just to get back at him. As they made their way through the auditorium, Sebastian approached them and eyed his younger daughter up and down. Look at you, he reprimanded with a frown. Why did you have to come here looking like a peacock? Do you think you eat on a blind date? Couldn't you have borrowed a leaf from Debbie? Debbie felt flattered. No wonder Gail always doubted whether Debbie was Lucinda and Sebastian's daughter because of her parents' unfair tendency to find fault with her and Sasha over petty issues while flowing with praises for Debbie. Sasha pouted her lips grumbling. Dad, stop it. My coming to this party was only to keep Deb company. Why would I get dressed as if I was going to give a speech on the podium? 
Debbie chimed in to reassure Sebastian. Uncle, it's my first time ever to give a speech on such an occasion, and I feel really nervous. With Sasha's company, I feel much better. Sebastian, a hard-nosed man, cast a warning glance at Sasha and turned to Debbie asking in a low voice, Under what name did you come here? The legal representative of Orchid Private Club, answered Debbie. Sebastian thought he heard her wrong. If she was telling the truth, then Carlos was really nice to her. I thought the legal representative of the club was Brooks Hua, Carlos' cousin. Since when did you take it over from him? Who's the largest shareholder now? With an awkward smile, Debbie stammered. I don't know either. Carlos just asked me to come here and said nothing more. Okay, the host will invite some entrepreneurs to give us a short speech. I guess you'll be one of them, said Sebastian. As a norm, he knew the host would introduce the most important faces. Among the names to be recognized, the host would no doubt have the legal representative of Orchid Private Club atop his list. After Sebastian left to chat with his friends, Debbie and Sasha joined a smaller group of people nearby. The two girls were unknown to anyone, so naturally people had many questions coming their way, such as which company they were from and what their positions were. Debbie and Sasha had foreseen this before they came here, so they evasively fielded the questions with a smile. Where they couldn't comment, they simply said, The party will start soon, and the host will announce it. Please be more patient. Now that they were unable to get any information from the two girls, they soon left one after another. Then, a man in a white suit approached Debbie with a glass of wine in his hand. He just smiled at her without saying a word. Sasha whispered in her ear, Deb, he's your ex, isn't he? When did he come back from abroad? Politely, Debbie nodded at Hayden and then looked away. In a low voice, she said to Sasha, It's been a while. Hayden had fixed his gaze on Debbie since he entered the hall. He had seen her chatting with the businessmen and joking with Sasha. She was absolutely stunning. Soon, the party started with the host going through introductions after a short opening speech. First of all, let's welcome Mr. Hayden Gu, an excellent entrepreneur, the CEO of the Gu Group, one of Y City's 10 outstanding youths, and the founder of Weihei Electronics. Hayden had made a great achievement in the past few years. People nodded in approval at him when his accolades and titles were mentioned. Before taking to the podium, he gave Debbie a smile and went on to deliver his short speech. After Hayden, several key guests made their speeches as well, including Olga. It was not until then that Debbie knew Olga was the general manager of her family business despite her young age. Besides, her short resume as presented read like someone who was already carving out a name for herself in business. As Debbie followed the proceedings, her heart beat faster, her mind pondering on what she was going to say on the podium. Before long, it was her turn. The last person I'm going to introduce is Miss Debbie Nien, the legal representative and largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club, legal representative of Angel's Love Foundation, and the CEO of Decar Cosmetics. Let's welcome Miss Debbie Nien. To calm her nerves down, Debbie took a deep breath and let go of Sasha's hand, who had been encouraging her all this time. With confidence, she then strode on the red carpet, ignoring all the heads turning around her and hushed whispers across the auditorium. She looks so young. How old is she? For her tender age, the titles are a little too many. Must be through some powerful influence somewhere. I thought the legal representative and the largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club was Brooks Hua. Since when did this little known girl take them over? I've never heard of her before. What's her real background? I guess she must be some powerful man's mistress. Stop your speculations. She's related to Mr. Hua, said a man in a raspy, deep voice. He had had dinner with Carlos and Debbie before, and he knew she was Mrs. Hua. Through it all, Debbie remained calm. Although she correctly guessed what people were saying in hushed tones, she reminded herself to focus on the task at hand and not be carried away by sideshows. Gracefully, she made her way to the podium, keeping as calm as possible. She must pay attention to her demeanor. After all, she represented Carlos. Once she got the microphone from the host, she took a deep breath and began her speech with a deliberately slow, emphatic speed of delivery. 
The audience fell silent, eager to know what she would bring to the table. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Debbie Nian. I deem it a great honor for me to come here and be part of this auspicious occasion. First and foremost, I must acknowledge that I'm relatively new in the industry, and as such, I would appreciate your guidance. In all, her words were modest and sincere. Most importantly, she was a pretty lady with brains. The party began to warm up. A CEO of some company joked, Miss Nian, you are such a young and beautiful businesswoman. In all honesty, you'll have the world at your feet. We are willing to guide you in any aspect in the future. Miss Nian, I hope you may give me a VIP card for Orchid Private Club. Most people took his words for a light moment. With a sweet smile, Debbie replied playfully, Everyone here is a big shot in Y City. My humble club will be honored by your presence. I promise that you'll all get a VIP card for the club. Debbie was now completely relaxed. The man's touch of humor had just come at the right time. The audience seemed much at home now. Although she's young, she's already a CEO. My daughter is several years older, but she still has no job. When I get home tonight, I'll sit her down and talk sense into her head. She must go out and find a job now, another man said. Despite her age, Miss Nian's no doubt on a meteoric rise. People wouldn't stop complimenting Debbie. Actually, they all knew that Debbie had to have a strong background. Otherwise, she wouldn't have become the largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club and the CEO of Decar Cosmetics at such a young age, even if she was a genius in business. They were all sophisticated businessmen. They wouldn't offend Debbie before they knew who was her backer. Debbie nodded at them and then walked off the podium. Hayden had been waiting for her all this time. As soon as she got off the podium, he came up to her. But before he could say a word, a few people began gathering around them. Aware of Debbie's massive influence, they were eager to rub shoulders with her. Miss Nian, you look so young. Have you graduated yet? Miss Nian. Debbie would rather talk with Hayden than mingle with all these people. She felt a little uneasy now. After all, the accolades were all thanks to Carlos and had very little to do with her own effort. She was only lucky to have married a powerful man. Politely, she excused, I'm sorry, but now I have something to talk to Mr. Gu about. That caught Hayden off guard. For a long time, Debbie had kept him at arm's length and meeting her here, he hadn't expected her to take the initiative to talk to him, but he then realized that she was using him as an excuse. It was okay by him, anyway. With a smile, he nodded at the people, then held Debbie's hand and led her to a quiet place. When the people were out of sight, Debbie heaved a long sigh of relief. She really hadn't anticipated so much attention on her. I must warn Carlos against decorating me with faux accolades that make everyone run to me with unrealistic expectations. This is just crazy, she mused. Lost in thought, she didn't notice Hayden had placed his right hand tenderly on her waist. Not until he lifted off the hand did she realize it. The way he fixed his eyes on her was revealing. Behind his gaze, she could see his images of regret at chances lost. Now, she was another man's wife. The thought of Debbie moaning under another man in bed was torture to him. He clenched his fists and asked in a cold voice, Deb, the assistant gave you all this, huh? If you need this, I can give you more. Hayden had no idea how Emmett managed to make Debbie the largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club. All the same, he had to admit that the man was really nice to her. Debbie was confused. The assistant? Who? I get it. He must be referring to Emmett. Although I major in economics and management, I don't like business, she said. The only reason she ended up at the economics and management school was that Carlos had arranged for it, through Philip. So as not to disappoint Carlos, she had agreed to switch from her preferred course without complaining. After all, she lived in dependence on him. Looking Debbie in the eye, Hayden said in a sad voice, Deb, what can I do to make you come back to me? Mr. Gu, I cut your sister's hair. Yet you don't mind and even confess your love to me. Are you not afraid that your beloved sister will be mad at you? Debbie asked as her eyes darted around, looking for Sasha. Hayden knew the conflict between Portia and Debbie. 
His mother had snitched on Debbie to him as soon as he got back home from a business trip. Portia is a willful girl, and you didn't hurt her. I don't think it's a big deal, said Hayden, making it sound easy. But staring at him, Debbie said word for word, Mr. Goo, I cut your beloved sister's cherished hair. Hayden was amused by her seriousness. Deb, I've known you for many years. I know what kind of girl you are. You never stirred up trouble. She must have offended you. When Debbie was still with Hayden, she had been really nice to Portia. But neither Hayden nor Portia had treasured Debbie back then. Debbie cast a meaningful glance at him. Since when has he trusted me so much? But she had to repeat what she had said before. I'm sorry, but it's too late. Adamantly, he said, I don't care. I will wait for you. Remembering what Blanche had told her, Debbie was a little angry at Hayden's words. I will never go back to you. Your fiancé is a poor girl. Does she know her fiancé loves someone else? She taunted. Hayden was excited at her words, thinking she was jealous. Do you mind that? Deb, trust me. I won't get engaged to her. Really? I only love you. Hayden's intense reaction annoyed Debbie. She tried to pull her hand away, but his grip was too tight. Debbie? Mr. Goo. A sarcastic voice cut in. It sounded familiar. Debbie turned her head to find that Olga was standing behind them, watching with a smirk on her face. To avoid trouble for both Debbie and himself, Hayden reluctantly released her hand. Debbie never liked Olga, and life was too short to spend it around people she didn't like. She'd long ago promised herself that if it didn't make her happy, make her money or make her better, she didn't have time for it. So certainly she didn't have time for Olga. She turned around and walked away, as if the newcomer were invisible. Olga's cheeks were burning with embarrassment. What a snooty bitch! And right in front of Hayden, the most eligible bachelor in the city, Olga decided that she had to do something to save face. Debbie Nien! she called out shrilly. Debbie turned and looked at her coldly. What? You want more? Another glass of wine on your dress, maybe? Olga replayed the events of their last meeting in her mind. It consumed her, and she was lost in thought for a moment. She remembered how Debbie had humiliated her in front of so many people. She remembered the crushing embarrassment, the cold, wet feeling of the wine seeping through her gown, the looks on the faces of the other guests. The happenings of that night still burned in her mind, fueled her rage and sapped her self-control. She finally gave in to her feelings and lost it. Looking at Debbie riding on the crest of success, she sneered, Shut up, you show off. Who the hell do you think you are? You think because you're married to Emmett you can do what you want? When I become Mrs. Hua, I'll kick you and Emmett out of ZL Group and out of Y City. Her stupid words sent Debbie into a wild wave of laughter. She couldn't stop. After a long while, she finally calmed herself down and said, I think Mr. Hua is married. So you're Mrs. Hua? Or just the other woman? Instinctively, Olga thought it was a good idea to make Debbie think she was Mrs. Hua, so she retorted, God, you must really be stupid. As a daughter of the Mi family, I would never be the other woman. Raising her eyebrows, Debbie pretended to be surprised. So, you mean you're Mrs. Hua? And why would I tell you? Olga snorted. Debbie put a hand over her mouth to stifle her laughter. It was getting harder by the moment not to expose Olga's lie. Then she remembered that Carlos had said he would take care of things with Olga, so she decided to leave it to him. However, their bickering confused Hayden. He looked at Debbie and asked, You're Emmett's wife and you don't even know who Carlos' wife is? Olga's face turned pale. She had forgotten Debbie's relationship with Emmett, Carlos' personal assistant. If anyone knew who the real Mrs. Hua was, it was him. And Debbie probably knew too. What if Debbie blows my cover? Olga was worried. Debbie acted as if she didn't notice the expression on Olga's face. It was pretty easy to ignore her normally so this came naturally to her. She told Hayden conspiratorially, Of course I know who Mrs. Hoar is. That's why I was laughing. Looks like someone's pretty on the outside, but ugly and stupid inside. Debbie let out a laugh and turned her back to Olga. The other woman's blood was boiling when she heard Debbie's last sentence. 
She strode over to grab Debbie, but Hayden stopped her. Miss me, we're in public, he reminded her. Thinking of what a grand occasion it was, Olga managed to fight down her anger. Fine, Debbie Nian, I'll deal with you later. Mr. Gu, are you trying to steal Debbie from her husband? Olga said to Hayden in a sarcastic tone after she calmed down. Watching Debbie, who was walking towards Sebastian, Hayden admitted, I'll wait for her. She'll come around. Envy surged in Olga's chest like a gushing storm overwhelming and engulfing her. Why? Why is everyone hot for this woman? She's rude, unrefined, and has no boobs. I don't get it. Even Hayden? You'd think he'd have better taste. Are they all blind? She thought resentfully. What do you see in her? She's married. Olga couldn't help asking. Hayden drained his glass. She's awesome. Much better than you, Miss Me. He replied coldly before standing up and leaving. She was livid. Her face a mask of fury. Olga stomped her feet furiously, cursing the both of them. Debbie didn't like these kinds of parties. She found little to say to those CEOs, so she called Carlos to ask him if she could leave early. Carlos told her to wait for him. He would come pick her up. Ten minutes later, she got his call. He was waiting for her in the car across the street. Debbie took Sasha to Sebastian and left through the back door. Hayden's eyes had been on Debbie all the time. When he noticed her leaving, he followed her outside. He got there in time to see Emmett closing the door for her after she got in the car. He didn't go over to her. Instead, he told his assistant to find out what Emmett's phone number was. He figured he'd get to her another way. As soon as Debbie got in the Emperor, Carlos enthusiastically took her into his arms and kissed her passionately. Debbie could feel that he could hardly control his urges. If she hadn't been rejecting his advances, he would have taken her right inside the car. Not long after she got in, the intimate moment seemed to last forever. How long it actually lasted, no one could say. Hi, Mr. Handsome. I pissed off your dear Miss Me today, she said, nestling in Carlos' arms. Miss Me. Carlos was puzzled for a moment. Then he realized she was talking about Olga. She's not dear to me. Don't say that again, or I'll punish you like never before. Anger flashed in his eyes. Emmett, who was driving the car, was embarrassed by what he had said. Mr. Hua, please, even if you don't care, I do. I don't enjoy watching that kind of scene. But Emmett didn't dare express his thoughts, so he silently rolled up the interior screen to spare himself the awkwardness. Although the interior screen had been rolled up, Debbie covered Carlos' mouth tightly in case he said something cheekier. Carlos smiled and took her hand in his. Why were you embarrassed? Emmett doesn't mind. Look, he even put the privacy screen up. Is this why you're acting like this? Debbie rolled her eyes. Carlos moved closer to her with a mischievous smile. How would I ever get lucky with my wife if I cared what anyone else thought? Debbie cupped his face and said, Seriously, I made Miss Me very angry today. Carlos took her hands away. How? Last time, I poured wine onto her dress. This time I threw shade at her and called her out on her lie. What lie? She said she was your wife. Is it true? Debbie looked at him, expressionless. You want to know who my wife is? How about I show you? That would be more convincing. With that, he pressed Debbie against the back seat and climbed on top of her. Meanwhile, he blamed Emmett in his heart. Next time, I'll pick up my wife by myself. And once again, I've missed the chance to have a moment with my wife in the car, thanks to Emmett, the third wheel. Damn it, honey, just wait. I fought with that chick a lot. And today I didn't reveal we were married. But it felt like I was playing her. What will happen when she finds out? Carlos grabbed her hands, trying to stop her from pushing him away. I don't think we need to worry about Olga. I told her grandfather I'm married. I didn't stutter. He promised me he wouldn't try to fix me up with her anymore. Debbie replied. There's another problem. She likes you. Great, you got her grandpa off your back. But you need to let Olga know. I'll tell her you're my wife next time. I'll keep my distance. He was glad to do that. He had been waiting to tell everyone Debbie was his wife. Okay. 
She didn't like Olga and couldn't be happier to keep her away from their lives. The further away she was from Olga, the happier she'd be. She and Carlos had enough problems to fill a lifetime, and it would be nice to get some peace and quiet every once in a while. After driving Carlos and Debbie back to the manor, Emmett went back to his own house. On the way, he got a call from Hayden. So apparently Hayden's assistant came through and found the number for him. Emmett answered the call, wondering why he didn't recognize the number on the caller ID. Hayden didn't mince words. Emmett, I'll give you five million. Divorce Debbie Nien. Emmett was always on the ball and a quick thinker, but at this moment, Hayden's abrupt words confused him. Mr. Gu, what do you mean? Not enough? How about 10 million? I can tell you don't love Debbie. I want her back. So just give me a chance with her. Of course I don't love Debbie. How could I? Emmett mused. Mr. Gu, there must be some misunderstanding, he said. What is it? More money. Just say the word. If you're worried that you won't be able to find someone else, I'll help you out. With 10 million burning a hole in your pocket, you'll be married in a flash. Emmett wanted to cuss this guy out. He was stupid, this man on the other end of the phone. He wouldn't stop talking for one, and he wouldn't let Emmett get a word in edgewise. He kept outbidding himself to boot. Even if Emmett were in a position to bargain, the man just kept going. Emmett couldn't even accept his offer. Finally, he interrupted him. Mr. Gu, I know I'm just a secretary, but I can't be bought. Besides, I don't care about your money. If I were you, I'd spend more time with Miss Cheen. It's late. Good night, Mr. Gu. Emmett hung up the call without giving Hayden time to respond. Everyone in Y City knew that Hayden was getting engaged to a daughter of the Cheen family. Hayden was furious and tossed his phone on the desk. He hated being hung up on. He rubbed his cheeks in frustration and sighed heavily. How do I get Debbie back? The next morning, Carlos and Debbie were going to make the trip to New York. Before leaving for the airport, Carlos went to his office to delegate his duties. Other people needed to pick up the slack. He wasn't going to have his company fall apart simply because he wasn't there. Debbie slept in. She didn't start packing until she finished her late breakfast. Still, when she was done packing, Carlos hadn't made it home. She waited, and then she even took a nap. It was not until nearly noon that she heard the sounds of a car pulling up. Debbie got out of bed swiftly and dashed onto the balcony. Carlos was back. She waved at the car happily. Emmett got out and opened the back door. Carlos looked at her as he stepped out of the car. Mr. Handsome. Debbie shouted to him. Carlos stretched out his arms. Debbie dashed through their bedroom and across the hallway. From there she raced down the stairs into the living room, threw open the main doors to the villa, and ran into the arms of the man who strode towards her. Wow, you're sure in a good mood. Is it because we're going to New York? asked Carlos. Debbie shook her head. Nope. She had time off classes the past couple days and it was getting boring. She had nothing to do. But now that she saw Carlos, she wished she were a cuff link going with him everywhere. Debbie opened her mouth, trying to say something else when a joyful voice came from behind them. Aunt Debbie, are you done packing? Debbie craned her neck to see around Carlos. When she looked at the car, she saw a girl sitting in the back seat, Megan. Oh, right. She's going with us to New York, Debbie remembered. She nodded to the girl. Just then, a servant carried Debbie's luggage out of the house. Debbie thought it bad form to whisper in front of someone, but there was something she just had to say to Carlos. She needed to get this off her chest, and she didn't care about what kind of strange look she got from others. This was extremely necessary. She stood on her tiptoes to whisper in his ear. I want to sit in another car with you, just the two of us. Want to. Carlos knew exactly what she was up to, but he loved how flirty she was being right now. He started to get horny. He beckoned Emmett to come closer and said to him, You and Megan go ahead. Emmett was confused, but he was too afraid to ask. He remembered how vengeful Carlos could be, so he didn't question his orders. Yes, Mr. Hua, he nodded. When the car was started, Megan stuck her head out the window and asked, Uncle Carlos, aren't you getting in the car? Go on. 
Your Aunt Debbie and I will be along soon. The emperor left. Carlos called his driver, Matan, and soon another posh car was driven out of the garage and stopped in front of them. This one had some serious dramatic flair, the Maserati Quattroport. She climbed into the sumptuous leather-lined cabin. The seats were exquisitely padded, covered in brown leather, along with the gray subcushion of memory foam for optimal comfort. Carlos sat next to Debbie. The glossy black car drove slowly out of the manor. Debbie leaned against his shoulder and started asking all kinds of questions. Is Grandpa awake yet? Will Grandma and Dad like me? Who else is living in the house besides Dad and Mom? Where will we live? Will you stay with me every day after we get there? Carlos was totally speechless. He swore this wasn't the flirty moment he was hoping for. Although resigned, he didn't lose his patience. Grandpa is getting better, but he still hasn't come around yet. My family will like you. You and I will live in the manor in New York just like everyone else in my family. I'll work there, but I'll also make as much time for you as possible. Then Carlos gave Debbie a general rundown of his family members. My dad is a hothead. You'd better not talk to him alone. If there is something that requires you to talk to him, tell me first and I'll do it for you, he added. Got it, Debbie replied. She was curious. How short-tempered can my father-in-law be? Is his temper worse than Carlos? When they got to the airport, Megan had already checked in. Emmett was waiting for them at the luggage consignment area. After checking the luggage, Emmett turned to them and said, Mr. and Mrs. Hua, Happy New Year. I look forward to seeing you soon. Huh, aren't you going with us? Debbie asked. Ever since she met Carlos, Emmett had been around him every day. Now that he wouldn't be around, Debbie found it weird. She had gotten to like the fellow. Knowing that Debbie was disappointed, Emmett was moved. Don't worry, tomboy. All of my family members are in Y City, so it would be bad form to leave. The secretaries in New York will pick you up when you get there. I'll see you next year. I'll miss you, he joked, which was rare. Tomboy. Carlos asked icily, Since when are you and my wife so close? It's Mrs. Hoare to you. Emmett had no words, spending his time in stunned silence. He had gone over all the other forms of addresses in his head. Tomboy seemed to be the least likely to make his boss jealous. However, obviously he was wrong. Carlos was way too possessive. Emmett looked at Debbie sympathetically and said, I feel for you, Mrs. Hua. What? Carlos asked immediately before Debbie could say anything. Emmett wasn't stupid enough to share what he really thought. He chuckled nervously. I feel for Mrs. Hua because she has such a wonderful husband. Right, Mrs. Hua? The man of your dreams. It didn't make sense. Carlos knew it. If Emmett really thought he was a good husband, he wouldn't have used the expression feel for her. I hear that your family is trying to arrange blind dates for you. I'll call Professor Doe. Hearing this, Emmett became fretful. Hey, it's almost New Year. Do you have to be so cruel? Hmm. Debbie looked back and forth between the two. Why call Professor Doe? Which Professor Doe? Debbie couldn't help asking. Carlos pulled her into his arms and ignored Emmett. Professor Mark Doe. He answered while they walked towards the VIP passage. Then Debbie learned that Carlos was Professor Mark Doe's student too, which came as a surprise. And Emmett turned out to be Professor Mark Doe's stepson. When Emmett was 13, his mom remarried Mark. And Emmett had lived with his mom in the professor's house afterwards. As Emmett's stepfather, Mark didn't spoil the boy. On the contrary, being an educator, he was strict with him, especially about his education, which turned the rebellious adolescent against him. Emmett vowed that he would never call Mark father, nor would he ever use Mark's family name. To this day, Emmett kept his family name Jean. Therefore, despite being father and son, Emmett and Mark had different family names. That was why the connection between them had never occurred to Debbie. But as Emmett grew up, he realized that Mark cared about him a lot. When it came to Emmett's marriage, he was even more concerned than Emmett's mom. He had sent Emmett on more than 30 blind dates within a couple of months. If Emmett hadn't been so busy, Mark would have made it three blind dates a day for him. 
When they walked out of the VIP passage for first-class passengers, Carlos took out his phone and called Mark just as he had said. Professor Doe, Emmett has been so idle lately. He has even started to sabotage my relationship with my wife. If you run out of candidates for his blind dates, I can have Tristan send you the name list of all the socialite divas and rich girls in Y City. You're welcome, Professor. Yes, my wife is with me right now. We're flying to New York. We'll visit you after the new year. Please send my regards for your wife and wish her a happy new year. For me. We're boarding. Bye, Professor. When the call ended, Carlos turned his phone off. Mr. Hoor, are you sure you haven't gone too far? Aren't you worried that Emmett might rise in revolt? Not far at all. Carlos had kept his cool in Debbie's presence. If she weren't around, he would have humiliated Emmett with useless errands, just to remind him who was in charge here. For getting too close to Debbie, Carlos would use every opportunity to put that man in his right place. Seeing how jealous her husband was, Debbie was lost for words. On the plane, since Carlos' private jet was in New York, the mighty CEO had ordered Emmett to charter the entire first-class cabin. Two flight attendants led them through the bar full of refreshments and into the first-class cabin. Megan had a separate seat with a curtain, while Carlos and Debbie had a private booth with a sliding door that could be locked from inside. The booth was large enough for the two of them. It was a pleasant surprise for Debbie that she could have some alone time with Carlos on the plane. Before getting on the plane, she had been troubled. She was thinking, what if Megan insists on sitting next to Carlos? Should I go ballistic or put up with it? Thankfully, she didn't have to worry about it anymore. Although Megan's seat was near their booth, the privacy of the booth was priceless. It was 12 hours later that the plane touched down. In New York, it was evening already. To pick them up from the airport, Carlos had some of his staff from the company offices in New York on standby. After some pleasantries, everyone got in the car. They went straight to the Hua family's offshore manor. When they arrived, the gates were wide open. In a traditional Chinese decor, with lanterns on either side, heralding the arrival of the new year. It was past 7 p.m. knowing that Carlos was coming with his wife. The whole family was waiting to have dinner together. As soon as the car stopped in front of the main building, a servant came immediately to open the door for them. Debbie gripped Carlos' hand nervously and followed him into the house. Nevertheless, bang, a porcelain teacup was smashed into pieces at Debbie's feet. It would have smashed her if Carlos hadn't pulled her away. Everything in the living room turned silent all of a sudden. It was not until then that Debbie noticed that more than ten people were sitting in the living room. Even Mr. Jerk Lewis, who was always frivolous, was now sitting nicely with a serious look on his face. When he saw Debbie, he seemed excited. Debbie's eyes eventually fell on the middle-aged man in front of the table. His face was red with rage. When her eyes met the man's, she could see that his eyes were filled with nothing but disgust. It was him. It must have been him who smashed the teacup. Who is he? What a head-on blow at our first encounter. Carlos' menacing presence seemed to grow. Unknowingly, he squeezed Debbie's hand. Ignoring the broken teacup, he took Debbie to a distinguished old lady with silver hair. Grandma, I'm back with Megan and Debbie. This is Debbie Nian, my wife, he said to the old lady. Then turning to Debbie, he said, Deb, greet Grandma. The grandma wore a long garnet cashmere sweater, top-notch pearls around her neck and her wrists. She had been gazing at Debbie stone-faced since she walked in. Just sitting there quietly was enough for her to intimidate everyone. Both her stern face and sharp eyes were telling Debbie, Don't mess with me. Debbie had to keep herself calm by all means. She took her hand out of Carlos' hold and smiled at the old woman. Good evening, Grandma. I'm Debbie. Nice to meet you. Valerie Chung only smiled at her perfunctorily and said nothing. But when she saw the two people behind Debbie, she blossomed. My dear grandson and little Megan, let me have a look at you. How have you been? She smiled, she cared. She stroked their faces affectionately. It seemed all of a sudden she had turned from the icy cold which into a cordial, loving grandma. It struck Debbie that the Hua family didn't care for her. Neither the dad nor the grandma. It sucked. 
The old lady's smiles lightened the atmosphere in the living room. Megan ran to Valerie Chung and hugged her tightly. Valerie, I missed you so much. I've been thinking about coming to visit you all along, but Uncle Carlos had been busy, so we weren't able to come until today. It was the Lunar New Year's Eve in China. Gradually, everybody lightened up. Louis, the chatterbox, began. Megan, Grandma has missed you and Carlos. She just couldn't stop talking about you. Grandma, now that they are here, can we eat? I'm starving. Valerie Chung nodded, holding Megan's hand. Carlos, Megan, after a long flight, you must be hungry and tired. Let's go eat, she said. Carlos didn't respond. He pulled Debbie, who had been slighted and embarrassed, close to his side. His eyes swept over the others in the room. Wait, he said coldly. His icy tone brought everyone to a halt. Nobody dared to take one more step. Valerie Chung, who had just gotten up, slumped back into the couch at Carlos' command. Everyone could see that the dad and grandma didn't like Debbie. Watching Carlos, they all wondered what he was going to say. It was Carlos who provided everything for the entire Hua family, so whenever he spoke, both his dad and his grandmother listened. At least those two, James and Valerie, were less authoritative in front of him. Sensing Carlos was about to say something, Megan suggested, Uncle Carlos, Valerie hasn't eaten dinner yet, but she wanted to have dinner with us. Why don't we eat first? Do it for Valerie. Carlos ignored her. He pulled Debbie into his arms and announced, I only need three minutes, and I'm going to say this only once. If any of you has a problem with Debbie, you have a problem with me. She is my wife and I love her. If you can't treat her nicely, then we're not staying. There was dead silence in the living room. Valerie sighed. After a while, James roared. Shut up, you ungrateful son of a bitch. Did I say you could marry her? She's not welcome here. Carlos was going to talk back, but Debbie pulled at the corner of his shirt and shook her head when he looked back at her. He knew she was worried about him. After giving Debbie a comforting look, Carlos told James, Grandpa blessed our marriage. Although he's sick and in hospital, he's still the head of the family. He speaks for all of us. Grandpa's blessing means that she's part of this family. Dad, if you think I should listen to you, you should listen to your dad too. If you have a problem with his decision, take it up with him. Hua men are gentlemen. You should treat women with more respect. James pointed at him furiously. His mouth opened and closed, but words failed him. They knew Carlos never backed down, so Valerie compromised. James calmed down. If your dad made the match, it isn't the kid's fault. Carlos did the right thing, defending his wife. Okay, enough. Time to eat. Debbie blinked in disbelief. Has Carlos' grandma actually accepted me? My husband is awesome. Tabitha, who had been quiet the whole time, echoed. Mom's right. It's New Year's Eve. James, please stop. Let's have dinner first. She barely ever spoke in James' presence. However, as Debbie's mother-in-law, she thought it wrong to remain silent any longer. Since Tabitha had spoken up, Wade Hua, James' elder brother, spoke up too. He looked at his three sons and reprimanded. Are you blind? Escort your Uncle James to the dining room. Debbie now started to understand how these people were related to each other. Wade Hua was Louis' dad, Carlos' uncle. He and Louis' mom, Miranda Shu, had no daughters, only three sons. Their firstborn, Fraser Hua, was kind and honest. Both he and his wife, Gloria Mo, were professors. Their second son, Brooks Hua, was a lawyer. Being a hothead, he tended to go from one extreme to the other. But his heart was in the right place. He was soft hearted. His wife, Connie Fong, was a photographer. The youngest son was Louis, who wasn't married and had tons of girlfriends. All playboys, yet Louis was different from Damon and Jared. The Han brothers had new girlfriends from time to time, but they weren't lewd. Louis, however, was disgusting, despicable, lewd, and a total loser. He dated many different women at the same time. The other day, he was almost engaged to Portia, but then he split that one off, and Portia was better off not being around him. Carlos had warned Debbie to stay away from Louis whenever she saw him. 
Back in the present, wait was remark annoyed James. I'm not crippled. Why do I need anyone to take me to the dining room? They started to take seats around the table. Debbie sat next to Carlos. Connie phone came to Debbie and wanted to sit next to her. But someone beat her to the punch. It was Louis. He rushed to the chair and elbowed Connie phone away. Debbie, I didn't expect you to come here for New Year's. It's been only a couple of days, but you're even more beautiful than the last time I saw you. He said impishly. Ahem. Someone coughed heavily, interrupting Louis. Debbie turned to look, only to find that Louis' mom, Miranda Shu, was staring at her youngest son coldly. Louis was afraid of his mom. He grinned and said, I know, I know. More eating, less talking. Finally, dinner began. At the table, Megan busied herself with picking up food and ladling soup for Valerie. The old lady just couldn't stop laughing. It looked as if they were grandma and granddaughter. Then suddenly Megan looked at Carlos and said, Uncle Carlos, I would like some of the Dongjiang salt-baked chicken. The bratty charm was obvious in her voice, as if you could see it. Debbie looked at the dish Megan mentioned. It was right in front of Carlos. Since she asked, Carlos picked up the serving chopsticks and grabbed some chicken for her. Thank you, Uncle Carlos. Megan smiled like a sunflower at which Carlos simply nodded. Debbie puckered her lips. Ugh, I can't believe it. Carlos is my husband. I didn't even ask him to pick up food for me. You did it on purpose. I hope you choke on it. As soon as dinner was over, Valerie and James called Carlos into the study, and a housemaid took Debbie into Carlos' room, at the end of the second floor. Diagonally opposite Carlos' room was Valerie's. Debbie wandered around Carlos' bedroom, trying to know more about the man she loved. The decor of the room was exactly the same as that of their bedroom in the manor in Y City. Many of the items she simply left in their places as she walked around the room, hands behind her back. But soon, the urge to be proper was overwhelmed by her curiosity. She started to pick up various items to look at them in more detail. On the bookshelf were the trophies Carlos had won when he was a teenager and the medals he had been awarded in the army. There were medals for first-class merit, second-class merit, and third-class merit. Looking at the medals and trophies, Debbie found her husband was outstanding. In the study of the manor in Y City, there were more than 100 trophies which he had won in the past few years. Now in this bedroom there were dozens of trophies. He even started winning trophies in kindergarten. He was a remarkable man, driven from the earliest age to excel in everything he put his mind to. A lot of this explained his exceptional nature and some of his control freak tendencies. He had to be in control or dominate every aspect of his life. And sometimes that was a charming trait, other times quite frightening. None of this occurred to Debbie at the time. How lucky I am to be married to this exceptional man. Debbie thought to herself. She took a picture of those trophies and medals and sent it to her friends through the group chat function on WeChat. Carlos is so awesome. I feel inferior compared to him, she exclaimed. Jared saw the picture and complained. Shit, how could you put me in such an envious mood by posting this so early in the morning? Damn. He was even awarded medals for first-class merit. That's a state-level honor. Is your husband even human? He is under 30, for God's sake. How can I ever be as accomplished as him? Christina asked. When did you touch down in New York, tomboy? It has to be night there, right? Before Debbie could reply Christina's question, a commotion started in the study. Carlos' dad must have exploded with rage again, Debbie thought. Never mind. Since Carlos is there, he should be able to handle it. I'd better stay away, in case his dad gets even angrier when he sees me. As Debbie thought about it, she added in the group chat, Guys, Carlos' family doesn't like me. For a moment, no one said anything. It was Dixon who first chipped in. It doesn't matter as long as Mr. Hua likes you. Later, Christina cut in, You never know how complicated life in rich families can be. Before you left, I had thought to caution you, but I downplayed it. Ignore the others. Just as doctor said, all that matters is that Mr. Hua loves you. Tomboy, since when do you care about other people's opinions? 
This isn't you, frankly wrote Jared, alongside an eye-rolling face emoji. Debbie's eyes turned teary as she read through her friend's comforting words. In such trying moments, it was enough that her friends were always there for her. There was a knock on the door. Debbie calmed herself down and opened the door, only to meet Megan with her usual pesky attitude. Without waiting for Debbie's permission, she walked in uninvited and locked the door from inside. She acts as if she was the hostess of the Hua family, Debbie sneered. What do you want? she asked indifferently. Megan stared at her curtly. If I were you, I would leave the Hua family this instant. The ridiculous way she sounded made Debbie chuckle. What's that supposed to mean? Since there were only the two of them in the room, Megan took off her masquerade and snorted. Don't you see? You have turned the family into a war zone. Uncle Carlos' dad got so angry he almost passed out. It's New Year's Eve today and everyone is having a crappy mood. Just because of you. Don't you feel bad for what you've done? Why should I feel guilty when I did nothing wrong? Carlos' dad almost passed out because he has a bad temper. Do you think I don't know that? Debbie retorted. She wondered why James hated her so much. Did you just say Uncle Carlos' dad had a bad temper? I can't believe you've been talking about people behind their back, and you don't think it's rude? No wonder nobody likes you. I don't understand why Uncle Carlos is defending you all the time. Debbie was having a meltdown. When did I talk about people behind their back? Stop making things up. Is this what you're here about? Are you done? Now get out. No, I'm not yet done. Debbie Nien, do you know? That was just the provocation Megan was looking for. In an instant, her face flushed red, taking on a threatening aura like a cobra ready to strike. Through gritted teeth, she blurted, If it were not for you, I would definitely marry into the family. I knew it. I knew she liked Carlos, Debbie thought. Which one exactly do you want to marry among them for? Carlos? Mr. Lou? Wesley? Or Damon? Because sometimes it's really confusing. Megan raised her voice. The look in her eyes was weird. What the hell are you talking about? I've always only liked Uncle Carlos from the beginning. Only liked Carlos? Don't think I haven't seen you hug and kiss Wesley and Curtis. You want them all, don't you? You act like an innocent little girl. But who can imagine that deep down you are such a loose little slut? You have deceived them all, using your pure sweet facade. What a scary manipulative bitch. Debbie looked Megan up and down in disbelief. Megan's face twisted with fury and embarrassment. I'm going to tell Uncle Carlos that you not only said his dad was bad-tempered, but also defamed my relationship with him and his friends. So now you are going to tell Carlos on me? Stop fooling yourself. Don't you know how much your Uncle Carlos cares about me? Yes, he cares about you. But he spoils me more. Just because he married you doesn't mean he loves you. Debbie Nian, Uncle Carlos loves me, not you. If you think he loves you, you can stop dreaming. Debbie burst into derisive laughter. You like my husband, don't you? Megan neither admitted nor denied it. You want my husband to love you, don't you? I don't have to want anything. Your husband loves me from the beginning. If you hadn't popped into the equation out of nowhere, he would have been my husband. From the time she arrived to the hostel reception, Debbie had been wondering if she had killed someone from the Hua family lineage in her previous life to be hated so much by her hosts in this life. Carlos' dad had smashed a teacup as soon as she entered the house. Now even an 18-year-old was trashing her right to her face. Did they see her as a pushover? Debbie sighed. Calling Carlos uncle isn't enough to show how important he is to you. Since he's fostering you, why not call him dad? And since I'm his wife, you should call me mom. I'll spoil you more than he does. You. You. Megan's face turned livid. She stomped her feet and finally managed. You're taking advantage of me. I am, so what? Cool me. Cool me. Call me mommy and live with me from now on. Then you can see your daddy every day. In a fit of rage, Megan stormed out of the room in tears. But before she left, she warned. Debbie Nian, you are dead meat. We'll see. Debbie snorted. Then with a bang, Megan closed the door, leaving Debbie with so many questions. 
Gail, Portia, Olga, and now Megan, why do they all hate me so much? Is it something to do with my personality? Then she thought of Carlo's family. Oh heck, what have I done to deserve this? As soon as Megan left the room, she ran into Tabitha, who was lingering outside the study. Megan, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Tabitha asked. But Tabitha's questions only made things worse. Intent on creating drama, Megan wailed even louder. Hey, stop crying and tell me what's wrong, Megan, Tabitha demanded, genuinely concerned. Who upset you? Since she realized how furious James was, Connie had been hiding in her room to stay out of trouble. But Megan's wailing made her curious. Why is Megan crying? She asked Tabitha, who unfortunately had no idea either. For the life of me, I can't tell. She has been crying from the time she walked out of Carlos' room. But when I tried to find out from her what the matter was, she wouldn't say a thing. When the little brat finally stopped weeping, she said to Tabitha between sobs, I saw that James seemed angry to see Aunt Debbie, so I went there to comfort her. But Aunt Debbie didn't appreciate it at all. And she even called me names. Who? Who? Debbie called you names? Incredulous, Tabitha looked at the door to Carlos' room and asked, Why? I don't know. Maybe she was in a bad mood. But how could she take it out on me? It wasn't my fault. To make it worse, she even had the nerve to tell me that James was cranky and I shouldn't be here, because I am nobody to the family. I'm just a freeloader. Can you imagine? She boasts that she'll only be nice to me if I call Uncle Carlos dad and call her mom. Boo. Who? Tears welled in her eyes once again. Just to create a scene, she started panting for breath. Her face so downcast, you'd think she was going to pass out any minute. Even Tabitha, who had been skeptical at first, was moved. Could she be telling the truth? But then it didn't seem possible that Debbie would stoop so low. Just then, the door to another room opened and Miranda walked out. Casting a cold glance at Megan, she demanded, What are you doing here? Don't you need sleep? Tabitha smiled. Miranda, Megan, and Debbie had a squabble. We're trying to sort the issue out before she goes to bed. Miranda furrowed her eyebrows, annoyed by Megan's crying. Stop crying for heaven's sake. It's New Year. A day of celebration. Crying is bad luck. Besides, are you a snowflake or something? I hate people bawling all the time. You should learn something from Debbie. Now get back to your room and get some shut-eye. Instantly, Megan stopped crying. With a pitiful expression, she apologized to Miranda. I'm sorry, Miranda. I'm leaving now. Have a good night. Connie helped Megan walk to her room. When they walked past Miranda, Connie said softly, Mom, have a good rest. Miranda nodded at Connie and then went back to her room. Despite Connie's humble family background, Miranda was pretty happy with her. Connie was kind-hearted and was never a troublemaker. No drama was Miranda's rule, and Connie adhered to that. When Tabitha and Connie left Megan's room and walked past the study, they could still hear James roaring. Tabitha shook her head with profound resignation. Debbie was unpacking when she heard a knock at the door. She opened it and saw her mother-in-law. Mom, why aren't you in bed? It's late, she said with a smile. Tabitha looked at her, not as close to Debbie as before. Hearing Megan trash-talking, Debbie definitely changed the way she saw the woman. What are you doing? she asked. Pointing to the luggage on the floor, Debbie replied. Unpacking. Don't mind James. He's short-tempered. Don't take his words to heart, said Tabitha. Debbie was stunned for a while. Then she nodded. Mom, I can understand. Dad. Maybe to him, I'm just some rando off the streets. Maybe he just can't accept it. Back on the plane to New York, Debbie had secretly practiced addressing Valerie and James as grandma and dad hundreds of times. Unfortunately, she didn't have the chance to call them that to their faces. Yeah, I think you're right, Tabitha smiled. Then she pretended to mention Megan casually. By the way, how well do you know Megan? Her parents saved Carlos and Wesley. Did you know that? Debbie didn't know why Tabitha suddenly talked about Megan's parents. After short consideration, she realized that Megan must have snitched on her to Tabitha. She nodded honestly. Carlos told me about that. 
Mom, don't worry. I'll be nice to her and treat her like my own niece. Tabitha was at a loss for words. She didn't know whom she should trust, Megan or Debbie. Megan is an adorable girl. We all like her, especially Carlos' grandma. She's like family. You'll like her when you get to know her. I'll like her? A girl who said she could have been married to my husband? Not a chance. Debbie thought. If they weren't in the Hua family's manner, she would have already taught Megan a lesson. But she decided to be obedient to Tabitha. I'm three years older than her. I will humor her as much as possible. Don't worry, Mom. Debbie's conciliatory attitude reassured Tabitha, who nodded in satisfaction. There wasn't much more she could ask for, and Debbie seemed sincere. At least there'd be less drama this way, she hoped. Tabitha didn't like family fights much. After a long pause, Tabitha stammered, Debbie, why don't you go to the study and get Carlos out of there? You know James' temper. If I go there, I don't think he'll listen to me. Debbie's heart sank when she heard James roaring coming from within the study. If James wouldn't listen to Tabitha, then why does she think he'd listen to me? Debbie thought. But now that Tabitha had asked, Debbie decided to do as she was bidden. She didn't want the Hua family members to argue with each other over her. Perplexed, she knocked on the door to the study. Come in, came Wade's voice. Debbie pushed the door open and saw Carlos leaning against a couch, smoking. Valerie and Wade were sitting opposite Carlos, and James stood before a desk. The floor was a mess, papers, pens, pen holders, knickknacks, paperweights, paperclips, and staples. There was barely any place to step on that wasn't covered with debris. Grandma, Uncle, Dad, sorry to interrupt you, said Debbie. James got even angrier at the sight of the girl. What are you still doing here? Get the hell out of our house. Go back to Y City, he thundered. James Hua. Carlos called out his father's name as he stood up from the couch and put an arm around Debbie. He had kept silent all this time in the study, not giving a damn about what James said. In fact, he had even dozed off during James' tirade. He had heard it all before, and it bored him silly. But he couldn't bear to see James belittling Debbie. James didn't expect his son to argue with him over a woman. He pointed at Carlos with a shaking hand and said through gritted teeth, Ungrateful cur! Hardly had his voice faded away when he threw a thick book at Carlos. Watch out! Debbie shouted and held Carlos to protect him. The book hit her arm and then fell to the floor. She gave a choked cry that really stung. Luckily it was winter and she was wearing thick clothes. Otherwise she might have gotten hurt. Debbie! Carlos grabbed her arm and rolled up her sleeve to check if she was okay. Debbie heaved a sigh of relief and gave Carlos a wide grin. I'm okay. Don't worry. It doesn't hurt much. Why did you do that? He asked through gritted teeth. Why did you try and protect me? Why didn't you move out of the way? You know kung fu. Silly woman. He cursed inwardly. With an embarrassed smile, Debbie replied in a low voice. I was too nervous to remember you know kung fu as well. Carlos was better at kung fu than Debbie. He had had several years of formal instruction and was a second Dan black belt. It was a piece of cake for him to dodge the book. He was tense and worried until he saw that Debbie's arm was okay. It only made James feel worse when he saw the couple care for each other so much. Stop showing off. Debbie Nian, I'll be frank. You're not part of the family. If you promise you'll divorce him when you're back in Y City, you can stay here for a couple of days. Carlos was about to say something when Debbie grabbed his hand. She knew it was time for her to make a stand. She stood straight with her head held high. Grandma, Uncle, Dad, sorry I make you unhappy, she began, looking at them with no fear. I don't know why you don't like me, but I'm Carlos' wife. We've been married for more than three years, and we love each other. We'll go through thick and thin together. Whether you accept me or not, I won't give up on him as long as he doesn't ask for a divorce. Carlos held her hand in his, and this bolstered her courage. She went on, No one gets a say in our marriage except me and Carlos, and my temper's short. Dad, if you keep on treating us like this, I won't put up with it just because you're his father. James was stunned, while Valerie stared at her like a poisonous snake. 
Debbie, however, didn't flinch. Sorry, I guess I said too much. In short, no one is going to split us up. And I'll come at anyone who tries to harm Carlos. Family members should care for each other. You should be happy to see Carlos have a happy married life. But on the contrary, you're all mad at him. You just want him to marry a woman that you like, even if he doesn't want to. Are you really Carlos' family? Confusion could be seen in Debbie's eyes. How dare you? Valerie bellowed and banged on the desk. Debbie shut her mouth immediately. As the saying goes, he who talks much airs much. She wondered whether she had said something wrong that caused Valerie's fury. But she didn't say anything wrong. Debbie Nian, you are so rude. Didn't your parents teach you about self-esteem and self-respect? Valerie's words cut Debbie's pride like a sharp knife. Her face was hot as she felt both sad and humiliated. Grandma Deb. Before Carlos could finish, Debbie interrupted him. Carlos has been yelled at by his family this whole time because of me. I should do something, she thought. Looking Valerie in the eye, she flashed a smile and said, Grandma. I don't think it's a big deal to leave self-esteem and self-respect behind to be happy. Carlos had done a lot for her, and she should repay him. And this was the best way she knew how. By carefully choosing words that they couldn't argue over, maybe she could stop them from fighting. Maybe she'd even win one for Carlos. Who knew? But it was important that she stood up for herself and for Carlos, not to mention for their marriage. Carlos' eyes lit up when he heard this. Meanwhile, his heart ached as Debbie had to fight against three elders. James knew he was in the wrong, so he had to find another excuse to yell at her. Debbie Nian, who do you think you are? We're older than you. Show some respect. Debbie blinked and sighed with resignation. I wanted to respect you, but respect is a two-way street. You haven't shown me any respect at all. No one had ever dared to talk to James like that before. His face twitched as he said through gritted teeth, Fine. You have guts. Aren't you afraid that I'll drive you out of the Hua family's house? Upon hearing that, Debbie held Carlos' arm and said playfully, Honey, your father wants to throw me out of the house. Protect me. Ha ha ha. Wade burst into laughter at Debbie's reaction. The tension in the study was eased a little by Wade's laughter. However, Valerie and James still wore long faces. It would take more than just that to change their minds. Carlos pulled Debbie into his arms and said to his family, I hope you'll be nice to my wife from now on. If someone dares hurt her while I'm away, Grandma, Dad, Uncle. He left it there an unspoken threat, more menacing than anything he could have said. After that, he took Debbie's hand and left the study. Ingratful retard. James roared behind Carlos' back, but Carlos paid no attention to him. When Carlos and Debbie went back to their room, she shut the door behind them and rested her head against his chest. Honey, I just pissed off your whole family, she grumbled pouting her lips. Carlos kissed her forehead and said, That was awesome. You should get a medal. Will you be serious? This isn't funny. When you were in the study I made Megan cry. Mom looked unhappy too. And I even talked to your grandma, dad, and uncle like that. Did I go too far? For some reason, she regretted what she had said in the study. After all, they were Carlos' family. I know you were trying to protect our marriage. You didn't say anything wrong. Deb, you did a great job. When James lost his temper, Carlos wanted to leave the study. But Tabitha had urged him not to argue with James, for he had been taking blood pressure medicine these days. What? Is this really happening? He just praised me for fighting against his family. Debbie thought to herself. If Dad heard this, he would throw another book at you, she remarked. Carlos took her to the bedside and took off her down jacket. Why are you wearing this? Aren't you hot? He asked in confusion. The central heating in the villa worked very well. Debbie wiped her forehead, which had grown damp. Of course I'm hot. But I was trying to be respectful by dressing decently, said Debbie. She was wearing a short-knit t-shirt and jeans inside the down jacket. Carlos' heart broke. His dad wanted to drive Debbie out of the Hua family's house, while she wanted to show respect to his family. Stroking her smooth face, he said softly, 
I know it's a holiday, but I still have to go to the branch office here for work. Are you going to be okay here? Don't hesitate to call me if anyone tries something. No one's going to harass you if I have anything to say about it. Sure. Don't worry. I don't think they'll harass me. They didn't call me into the study, did they? You're overreacting. Carlos shook his head, smiling. Deb is so simple-minded. He changed the topic. So what happened between you and Megan? She came to my room and tried to piss me off. Then she left, crying. I don't know why she cried. Debbie looked at Carlos carefully, wondering whose side he would take. Carlos stroked her hair and asked casually, What did she say? I don't want to talk about it. Can we go for a walk now? I'm not tired yet. Although it was already midnight, it was still daytime in Y City. She was still suffering from jet lag. Me neither. Carlos flashed a grin. Debbie thought he agreed to go for a walk. She was thrilled and cradled his neck asking, Where are we going? To the beach. Beach? No problem. We'll go there tomorrow, said Carlos with a dirty smile. His thoughts were not about going anywhere, though he could take her to the privately owned beach and have wild sex with her there. His family owned that beach and didn't let just anyone go out there. But it was winter now. He didn't want her to catch a cold. Tomorrow? Then where are we going now? Now, we're going to bed. Hardly had his words faded when he pressed her against the bed and kissed her lips. Meanwhile, a picture posted on Weibo had caused a flurry of rumors in Y City. A paparazzo had taken a picture of Carlos and his wife waiting for their flight in a VIP lounge. Megan was there as well. Debbie's face was blurred and indistinct. No one liked that, least of all the netizens. According to the news, Carlos had taken his wife to New York to meet his family and celebrate the new year. He had also taken Megan with them. People believed that Megan was the apple of Carlos' eye. By the time Casey saw the post, there were already hundreds of thousands of comments. She couldn't help but feel sorry for Debbie, so she left a comment. Poor Mrs. Hua. There's always a third wheel between her and Mr. Hua. Miss Lon, why were you looking at your uncle like that? Like you have a thing for him. I heard Miss Lon always pestered her uncle even if Mrs. Hua was there. Miss Lon, you are not a little girl anymore. And the winter vacation started a long time ago. Can you please fly to New York alone next time? Mr. Hua is busy, and I'm sure he wants some alone time with his wife. Debbie had complained to Casey before that she felt there was something wrong with Megan's feelings towards Carlos. Casey had also warned Debbie not to let Carlos and Megan stay with each other alone. After all, Carlos and Megan weren't related by blood. It was perfectly normal if she had a thing for him. Actually, Debbie was never a troublemaker. If Megan hadn't gone too far, Debbie wouldn't have cussed her out. No woman was willing to give up her husband without a fight and Debbie was no exception. Any news related to Carlos was a hot topic. Before long, Casey's comment on Weibo was in the top three with a ton of likes. Many people agreed with Casey. When Carlos had come out of the hotel with Debbie in his arms back then, paparazzi had asked him whether the girl was Megan. But Carlos, the man of few words, had simply said, Megan is my niece. Megan's name had always been linked with Carlos, and many people actually thought she would be Mrs. Hua, or worse, already was Mrs. Hua. As the saying goes, there's no smoke without fire. If Megan really treated Carlos like her uncle, things would never have developed like this. The truth was they had spent too much time together and the press was on that. And tabloids love to spread salacious rumors. Casey's comment had been shared a countless number of times. Weibo users left comments under Carlos and Megan's Weibo posts, asking about their relationship. When Casey opened her Weibo again, she was startled by the number of likes and comments. She was thinking of deleting the comment, as she didn't want to offend Carlos. But it was already too late. She herself became a hot topic, as her comment was shared via screenshot to all the online gossip rags. Some staff at these websites even sent her private messages about her relationship with Mrs. Hua. What was more, her post had caught the attention of the ZL Group's PR department. It was Emmett who was responsible for dealing with news related to his boss. After all, he was Carlos' right-hand man. 
When Emmett saw the comment, he thought something wasn't right and asked the technology department to find the poster's profile. That was when he found himself staring at Casey's information. Many Weibo users left comments under Megan's posts and asked her, Why are you bugging Carlos, Hua? Huh? Are you trying to seduce him? The next morning, Carlos got dressed and went downstairs to have breakfast. Debbie had just fallen asleep. The Hua family was having breakfast in the dining room. Everyone was there except Louis and Debbie. Valerie cast a glance at Carlos and then at the stairs. Where's your wife? She asked in a cold voice. Carlos sat at the table and answered casually, sleeping off the jet lag. James banged his chopsticks on the table and shouted, Then why didn't Megan have to sleep off the jet lag? I swear that woman is so delicate. Megan was sitting opposite Carlos. Her face went pale. At the mention of her name, she began, I, I didn't get any sleep last night. What happened? I thought you had gotten used to New York time, said Valerie, concern in her voice. Megan looked at Carlos, who was placing a table mat in front of himself. He raised his eyes and saw her reddened orbs. Why are you crying? He asked indifferently. His words caught everyone's attention. Tabitha's heart broke when she saw how sad Megan was. She handed Megan a tissue and asked, Sweetheart, what happened? Are you okay? Just tell us if anything is wrong. Megan was always a cheerful girl, and the Hua family seldom saw her cry. They all looked at her, wanting to know who had bullied their beloved girl. Miranda, however, was an exception. She always thought Megan was a troublemaker and disliked her. She thought this woman was two-faced and cozied up to Carlos too much. As if she heard nothing, she continued eating her breakfast. I, I got cyberbullied last night. Tears streamed down Megan's cheeks. She dropped her chopsticks, her voice choked with tears. Valerie was anxious. Tell us what happened. Megan wiped her tears with the tissue and said with a sad smile, I'm sorry, Valerie James Tabitha. I'm okay now. Please just keep eating. Carlos furrowed his eyebrows, but he said nothing. He just ate his breakfast silently. After the breakfast, Tabitha dragged Carlos to a corner out of earshot and told him, Megan cried last night, and now she's crying again. Put your people on this. Find out who this cyberbully is and deal with it. Tabitha treated Megan like her own daughter and couldn't bear her beloved girl suffering from any kind of bullying. The moment Megan said she suffered from cyberbullying, Carlos knew why she was crying. He had already knew that the media had talked about him flying back to New York with his wife. Emmett kept him informed as well, and let him know that Casey was the one who had caused this stir. You got it, answered Carlos. He then cast a glance at his family. They were busy consoling Megan. Then he walked up the stairs. Uncle Carlos. Megan called out in a choked voice. Carlos stopped and turned to look at her. Megan stood up from the couch, her eyes and nose red. Uncle Carlos, I know she's Aunt Debbie's friend. Just pretend that you don't know anything, okay? I don't want you and Aunt Debbie to end up in a fight. Keep Grandma company, Carlos nodded. Then he turned around and left, saying nothing more. When she heard this had something to do with Debbie, Valerie kept on prodding Megan. Tell me what happened. Grandma, it was all my fault. I should have flown here alone. Some paparazzo took pictures of Uncle Carlos, Aunt Debbie and me waiting for the flight. Aunt Debbie's friend was so mean. He said, I, I wanted to seduce Uncle Carlos, but I never thought anything like that. Megan started crying again. Valerie's heart broke at the sight of her tears. It's okay. Don't cry. I trust you. Before that Debbie Nien popped up out of nowhere, you flew here with Carlos every time. Don't worry, Megan. I won't let that woman off the hook so easily. James snorted. I knew it. Debbie Nien is just a drama queen. Birds of a feather flock together. She and her friend are both troublemakers. It was the first day of the Lunar New Year. No one in the Hua family had to work today. They were all gathered in the living room, listening to the conversation. Most of them chose to remain quiet until they could find out more. Megan pretended to be anxious and began to defend Debbie. James, you don't get Aunt Debbie. She's nice. Can she control what her friend did? 
I don't think so. James shook his hand. You don't need to put in a good word for her. She's rude and doesn't respect her elders at all. She certainly wasn't raised right. She's not my daughter-in-law. Miranda had changed her clothes and walked down the stairs. When she heard James, she taunted. It's too late for you to disagree. They're already married. James was shocked speechless. His sister-in-law always had a way to shut him up. Miranda put on her sunglasses and left the house with her head held high. Meanwhile, Carlos pushed open the door to his bedroom, and Debbie was still sound asleep inside. He kissed her softly on the forehead and entered the adjacent study. He closed the door behind him and called Emmett. Delete everything that says something negative about Megan. All the news posts and all the comments. Emmett opened his laptop and began complaining to his boss. Do you know where I am right now? I don't care where you are, Carlos answered nonchalantly. Emmett's heart broke. You should care. I'm your assistant and I've worked for you for so many years, he retorted. Carlos lit a cigarette, took a drag on it and blew it out. I heard you've been at the cafe near the office the last couple days. Covering his chest, Emmett said excitedly, Boss, it's the first day of the Lunar New Year, yet you expect me to work. There's a reason I'm at this cafe. This is my 36th blind date, and she'll be here in 10 minutes. It was already late at night, but he couldn't even go back home. That can mean only one thing, Carlos said. What? Emmett asked while working on his laptop. Your taste in women has improved after you started working for me. Isn't that a good thing I have better taste? As for my future wife, I hope she's at least half as pretty as Mrs. Hua, and at least half as cheerful. She doesn't need to know anything about martial arts. I hope she can learn yoga and dance like Mrs. Hua. Carlos knitted his brows as he felt like Emmett had some special feelings towards his wife. You like my wife, huh? He pried. Emmett was too focused on deleting negative comments under Megan's posts on Weibo to figure out what his boss was getting at. Of course. She's a classy lady. She's so special, the one and only. You are so lucky, dude, he said casually. Emmett Zhong. Carlos' voice was as cold as ice. A shiver ran down Emmett's spine. He raised his head to look at the central heating which was still working. Boss, I'm deleting the comments on Miss Lan's Weibo. These kids are so mean. Why am I cold? That's weird, he thought. After the Lantern Festival, I'm reassigning you to L City's branch in D Country. Gay marriage is legal in D Country, and you can find a husband there. I'll ask the manager there to introduce you to some excellent men. I remember you seem to like muscular men like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Don't worry. You'll find the perfect husband there, said Carlos. Emmett was stunned into silence. He couldn't believe his ears. What? Mr. Hua, why would you do that? Did I say anything wrong? I'm really sorry if I wait, wait. Don't hang up. Staring at the phone, Emmett was desperate. Carlos had already hung up. Then he dialed Debbie's number. She must know how to cool Carlos down. However, she had turned off her phone. It went straight to voicemail. Emmett slapped himself across the face. I was such a fool. Why did I say anything like that? He's super possessive when it comes to his wife. At the same time, Casey arrived at the cafe. When she found the table, she saw Emmett slapping himself. Mr. Jean, why are you doing that? She asked. Is this Taylor's date? Emmett Jean. Casey was shocked. Emmett cast a glance at the girl before him and asked casually, Why are you here? Casey looked around the cafe, then back at him. Are you Taylor Moe's date? Emmett took his phone out and checked the name. It was Taylor, Missouri. You're her friend, huh? Where is she? She asked me to tell you she couldn't make it. Casey answered. Then a thought occurred to her. Wait a minute. You're Mr. Hua's assistant. Why do you need a blind date? Didn't Mr. Hua arrange someone for you? Emmett shivered at the thought of Dwayne the Rock Johnson and changed the topic. None of your business. But I have something to ask you. You know you're in big trouble. Of course she knew. Her comment regarding Megan had caused a stir. She was scared to death. 
What if Carlos asked his men to kill her just to please Megan? All she could do now was call Debbie and ask for her help. But she couldn't get through to Debbie on the phone. Casey stroked her hair to conceal her nervousness. She gulped and replied, Big trouble? What are you talking about? She didn't think Emmett had any proof against her. Emmett was amused by her reaction. On the one hand, he knew she was the one on the Weibo account. On the other hand, her reaction had already sold her out. He turned his laptop and pointed at the screen. See? You posted a comment. And I've been busy solving the problem for the last two days because of you. I had to do damage control on Mr. Hu's public image yesterday. And I've been hard at work deleting the comments and news posts related to Megan Lawn today. You're Mr. Hua's assistant. Isn't this IT's job? Casey asked in confusion. Come on. It's the spring festival. No one is still working but me. What's more, Mr. Hua only trusts yours truly. Emmett had a perfect reason to neglect his dates. He had to work for Carlos and had no time to chat. It made it hard to have a social life when he was on call 24-7. Looking at Emmett, Casey pried. Can you please not delete my comment? Why not? Now that Emmett already knew she had posted the comment, she decided to admit it. I said nothing wrong. Megan Lawn is the third wheel. Well, true or not, it has nothing to do with me. I have my orders. Casey rolled her eyes. He has his orders? He thinks he's a soldier, huh? The struggle is real, not. She stood up from her seat and said, I only came here to pass on Taylor's message. I'll leave you be. Bye. Wait. Emmett stopped her. What? Just stay. Maybe have a cup of coffee. Emmett suddenly had an idea. Casey rolled her eyes at him. Do you think I need you to buy me a cup of coffee? Just do me a favor. Please. Huh. In Casey's mind, Emmett was a sly fox. She needed to be more careful. After a moment's consideration, Emmett said, Let me take a picture. Then I'll put in a good word for you to Mr. Hua. That way you're in the clear, and he won't pursue charges of slander. Deal. Casey was enraged. I didn't slander her. Yes, I posted the comment. But what I said is the truth. Watch your tongue. Okay, okay. My fault. Miss Zheng, the problem is not whether you slandered her. The problem is cyberbullying. Megan is distraught, and Mr. Hua is very angry. He might have me come after you. You get it. If Casey weren't Debbie's friend, Carlos would have already asked Emmett to get rid of her. But the problem was that Casey was one of Debbie's best friends, and Carlos did what his wife wanted. Emmett had no idea whether his boss would punish Casey or not. He just wanted to frighten Casey using Carlos. After some hesitation, Casey argued, I don't care. Debbie will help me. Mrs. Hua? She's sleeping off jet lag. When she wakes up, you could be dead. His words did make sense. Casey had called Debbie countless times, but her phone had been switched off. She pried. Will you put in a good word for me? Little did she know that Emmett was unable even to fend for himself. Of course. Emmett promised without hesitation. Great. Okay. You can take a picture of me. By the way, why do you want my pic? She asked in confusion. Emmett told Casey honestly. I'm really fed up with blind dates. I can't stand them anymore. I'll send my father your pic and tell him we're dating. Then at some time in the future, I'll tell him we've broken up. Sounds good. Get bent. You think I'm that desperate? Emmett stared at her eyes wide. He really knew next to nothing about women. But I'm not asking you to be my girlfriend. It's just... a uh, screw it. Name your price. He offered resignedly. Well, you buy me a bunch of roses, a handbag, and some clothes. Do that, and you won't just get my pick, but we can take selfies together. Way more convincing. Okay. What? That's some serious time and money. This woman's gone too far. I'd rather find a boyfriend who can support me, Emmett cursed inwardly. But the more he thought about it, the better it sounded, Casey's demands, not the boyfriend part. Maybe then his dad would get off his case. Despite his thoughts, he said through gritted teeth, Deal. You're Mrs. Hua's friend, after all. I just need to make some arrangements and pay the bill here. 
Then we'll go to the mall. He called the IT manager and assigned some tasks to him before leaving the cafe with Casey. After they arrived at Shining International Plaza, Casey led Emmett to a store, picked up a handbag which she'd had her eye on for a long time, and put it in Emmett's hands. Just buy this. I don't need roses or clothes. The handbag stood out because of its strange shape. Emmett was a little shocked by Casey's taste, but said nothing. He needed this so he just went along with whatever she wanted. He took it to the cashier's desk and much to his surprise, it only cost him around $200,000. He had thought it would cost more than $1 million. Then he went back to Casey and handed the well-packed handbag to her. She kissed the package cheerfully. He's not a bad guy at all. Even more generous than my dad, she thought. Hey, Mr. Zhang, if you buy me a handbag every month, I'll be your girlfriend, she offered. Really? A handbag a month is enough to buy you? Emmett retorted, rolling his eyes. I thought you loved Mr. Louis Hua. What would he think? Do I look like a fool to you? With a serious look, Casey explained. Louis? I broke up with him a long time ago. Besides, you do look like a fool to me. If he wasn't a fool, then why would he buy such an expensive handbag for a woman he'd only met a handful of times? It was the first time that Emmett had been called a fool, and he was hot with rage. He reached out his arm and put it around her neck as if he were going to strangle her. Let's get a selfie together. My dad's already called a couple of times. I better send a pic to him. Casey struggled trying to loosen his grip. You want to kill me, don't you? Emmett didn't let go of her, but took out his phone and started taking pictures of them. Casey put on a fake smile and leaned in close to Emmett. After taking some pictures, he was about to let her go when a familiar voice came from behind them. Mr. Zhang? Casey. Casey and Emmett turned around in confusion, only to see Hayden, followed by his secretary. Emmett released Casey straightened his clothes and greeted him. Mr. Gu, what a coincidence. Hayden looked back and forth between Emmett and Casey, his glance settling on each. With a sneer, he said, I wonder whether Deb knows her husband is tight with her bestie. Casey couldn't figure out what he meant. What is he talking about? Since when was I close with Mr. Hua? With a tiny smile, Emmett responded, Mr. Gu, this is a private affair. Kindly but out. Hayden snorted and cast a scornful glance at Casey. You've always been Deb's best friend, and now you try to seduce her husband. Hayden Gu, watch your tongue. When did you see me seduce Mr. Hua? Emma Mempage. Emmett quickly covered Casey's mouth, but it was already too late. Hayden heard Casey mention Carlos and was confused. Carlos Hua. Unable to speak, Casey stared at Hayden with burning eyes. She thought Hayden knew Debbie was Carlos' wife, but apparently she was wrong. Okay, Mr. Goo, we're leaving now. But bye, said Emmett. He dragged Casey away, leaving Hayden behind. Staring at their retreating figures, Hayden was lost in thought. As a man who was able to develop the Goo group to such an extent in only a few years, he was never a fool. He was renowned for his business acumen and his sharp mind. He began to recall all the occasions he had seen Debbie and tried to link them with Carlos. Debbie is celebrating the Spring Festival in New York now. And according to the news, Carlos took his wife to New York to celebrate the Spring Festival with his family. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in his head. Debbie wasn't married to Emmett. Instead, her husband was actually Carlos Hua. If she's married to Carlos Hua, that would explain why she wore a priceless diamond ring and why Curtis Liu and Damon Han protected her at that party. Not to mention why she's the largest shareholder of Orchid Private Club. Hayden mused. Only Carlos was able to spark a change in Debbie in such a short time. She was much more graceful and elegant than in the past, and one of the most prominent figures in Y City. No wonder Hayden had never seen any kind of affection between Debbie and Emmett. I was such a fool, he thought. His face paled at the thought. In the past, he was sure that Debbie would come back to him, despite the fact that she had already married. After all, he was practically a prince compared with Emmett. He really thought her husband was Emmett, 
who couldn't hold a candle to him. But now he knew Debbie's husband was Carlos Hua, the richest and most powerful man in Y City. Hayden clenched his fists tightly. He didn't think Carlos would actually fall in love with Debbie. It was not that Hayden looked down on Debbie. He just thought that no matter what she did, she didn't deserve Carlos. There must be a reason behind this. Maybe Carlos is hiding something? Like sexual dysfunction? I guess so. No wonder he won't tell the public who his wife is, Hayden thought to himself. He took out his phone and dialed Debbie's number to ask her something. But to his disappointment, her phone was off, and the call went straight to voicemail. As soon as they left Shining International Plaza, Casey asked Emmett, Hey, why the hand over my mouth? Emmett turned to look whether Hayden was behind them. Then he looked Casey in the eye and explained with resignation, Mrs. Hua doesn't want everyone to know she's married to Mr. Hua. I know. Tomboy is my best friend. And we have no secrets between us. Then do you know Tomboy turned Hayden Gu down? Told him she was a married woman. Casey nodded. Yeah. So, get to the point. Mr. Hua loves his wife, and he wants the whole world to know Tomboy is his one and only. But she doesn't like the limelight. So Hayden thought I was her hubby. I let him think that because I want Tomboy to be happy. And if she's happy, so is Mr. Hua. Casey was totally confused. Okay, so why did you shush me? Remember, mum's the word. It all rests on Tomboy's decision. Anyway, I'm just helping them to cover their marriage. And I can't do anything until I get the green light to let everyone know. So I have to pretend that she's my wife until she says otherwise, explained Emmett. Casey finally made a sense of the situation. So you mean that everyone thinks you're Tomboy's husband, even though you never said anything? You just let people think what they want, right? Exactly. Emmett sighed helplessly. His boss's wife wanted to keep a low profile. But still, why keep it a secret from Hayden Gu? Isn't it better to let him know? If he knew Mr. Hua was Tomboy's husband, he might stop pestering her. Emmett and Casey continued to walk along the road, engrossed in a talk centered around Carlos and Debbie. She asked, and he felt it was only fair to let her know what was going on. That way, she might not let anything slip either. Carlos wasn't happy with her at the moment, and maybe if she understood more about the situation, then she might even be able to help. After pondering Casey's question for a short while, Emmett said, Maybe Tomboy just didn't bother explaining anything to Mr. Gu. Emmett had always been impressed by Debbie's unique personality. There were many reasons why. But what impressed him most was her attitude toward the title of Mrs. Huer. If any other woman were in Debbie's position, they probably would let the whole world know that Carlos was their husband. But Debbie was different. She had silently kept it a secret for three years, and more surprisingly, she had even wanted to divorce Carlos. She was actually Trill, not a faker, not just trying to attract Carlos' attention. Luckily, Carlos had figured out who she really was and had done everything to win her over. Or else, they probably would have already divorced. Emmett and Casey kept carrying on like this until they reached the gate of Casey's apartment building. Before they bade each other farewell, Emmett tried to call Debbie one last time. To his surprise, the call went through. Casey's jaw dropped when she saw how Emmett's face changed all of a sudden. With a pathetic expression on his face, he begged in a feigned sobbing voice, Mrs. Hua, you have to help me. Emmett. Debbie stifled a yawn trying to wake up. What's wrong? She asked in confusion while rubbing her sleepy eyes. She had just woken up and powered her phone on when Emmett called. Hearing the noise from the bedroom, Carlos guessed that Debbie was finally awake. He put aside his work and walked out of the study, only to find that she was on the phone. Then he called a housemaid downstairs and asked her to prepare food for Debbie. I was only complimenting you, but Mr. Hua got angry with me and intended to send me to D country. You know there are too many strong men there. What if I get hurt? Mrs. Hua, you know I always give you my full support. I've hidden your marriage from others like you asked. I've even blatantly gone against my boss for your sake. You have to save me, Emmett exclaimed. Casey shook her head when she realized Emmett was also in trouble. Didn't he say he'd help me out? 
Looks like he stepped on Mr. Hu's toes, too. Debbie caught a glimpse of the man approaching her. Aha, uh -huh, she said to Emmett while staring at Carlos curiously. She was trying to hide the fact that it was Emmett on the other end. Carlos was confused by her curious gaze. He shifted his gaze to her phone screen and saw the caller ID. It was Emmett. In an instant, he understood what was going on. Emmett, you idiot. He leaned toward Debbie, trying to grab her phone away, but she dodged him, rolling her eyes at him. Surprised and amused, Carlos couldn't help but burst into laughter. And then maybe you can make Mr. Hua happy in the bedroom and put in a good word for me. Before Emmett could finish his sentence, Casey suddenly kicked him in his shins, reminding him of what he had promised to do. Oh, wait, wait. And Casey, I think you need to help her out of hot water too. A torrent of doubts flooded Debbie's mind. What's going on with Casey? She could hardly process his words. It seemed that a lot of things had happened while she was asleep. Long story. I'll explain it to you when you get back. Anyway, Mrs. Hua, do you think you can do us this favor? Debbie stole a glance at the man who was lying next to her and running his fingers over her body. She was pretty sure she could convince Carlos to let them off, but she didn't want to do it by having sex with him. This man had tortured her for a few nights, and she could hardly keep pace with him. Hearing no response from the other end, Emmett became more anxious. Regardless of Casey's presence, he suddenly cried out, Mrs. Hua, please, you have to help me this time. You know I always stand by your side like family. Again, Casey was stunned, her mouth agape, and her eyes popped out. This Emmett was completely different from the usual stern assistant when he was with Carlos. She didn't expect to see his childish side. He looked even funnier than Jared now. Ah, uh, is there a reason you're calling my wife on her cell? Huh? A cold voice chipped in all of a sudden. Oh crap, I'm dead meat. Emmett panicked. Debbie pushed Carlos aside and asked, Emmett, is Carlos really sending you to D-Country over nothing? Yes. Emmett nodded. Wow, what a shit boss. Debbie commented. That's right. Exactly. Emmett wanted to speak out loud, but knowing that his boss was listening in next to Debbie, he had to keep these words to himself. He nodded his head vigorously to echo her words. Okay, I see. I'll give it a try. But if I fail, maybe you can go find Miss Me or Miss Me, Debbie said, laughing. She knew this would work and she was right. Next second, Carlos' cold voice came into Emmett's ear again. You're such a pest. I trust my orders are being carried out. And you need to be in the office after the spring festival. Carlos gave an unhappy glance at Debbie as he said it. Nothing had ever happened between him and Olga, but every time Debbie deliberately mentioned her, it sounded like he was in the wrong and he had to surrender to her no matter what. Realizing that Carlos meant to let him off, Emmett gave Casey the thumbs up. He cleared his throat, pretending to be serious, and answered formally, Yes, Mr. Hua, I'll be sure to clock in on time after the holiday. A relieved sigh escaped Emmett's chest after he hung up. He turned to Casey and said excitedly, Tomboy has helped us out. We're saved. Casey rolled her eyes at him. It didn't surprise her at all. She had seen it many times before. Carlos was head over heels in love with Debbie. Of course he would do everything she asked. Emmett admired Debbie even more. You know, Debbie is even better than I thought. She has turned a cold and scheming CEO to a docile husband. Can you believe that? Casey nodded in agreement. Then she thought of how Debbie behaved in front of Carlos last time and said, But I think Mr. Hua is really great too. Debbie used to be a strong tomboy with no filter. But he has turned her into a sweet girl now. After a moment of silence, Emmett looked up at the sky, sighing with sentiment. As long as Mrs. Hua is willing to undress herself in front of Mr. Hua, I bet he wouldn't mind giving her his life. He had witnessed their love story from the start to this moment. He had seen clearly how Carlos had changed from a cruel and imperious CEO to a loving husband who spoiled his wife to the hilt. Casey wasn't convinced, though. Aren't you exaggerating? Emmett squinted at her. No, I'm not. I'm telling the truth. You're too young to understand these kinds of things. 
He still remembered how passionately Carlos stared at Debbie on their way back from Southern Village. Mr. Huo was like a beast stalking its prey the whole way. If I hadn't been there driving the car and Debbie hadn't been too shy, he probably would have had sex with her straight away in the car. I think he must have had a hard time controlling himself back then, Emmett thought. Casey let out a cold hum. What did you say? I'm too young? Huh. I'll be an undergraduate very soon. Don't take me for a kid, okay? Yes, yes. You're not a kid, but I'm a few years older than you. In my eyes, you're just a kid. By the way, could you please dye your hair black again? You don't look good with the yellow hair. Yellow hair? But this is brown. Casey sulked. I think we have nothing in common. Goodbye, she said and turned around to leave. In fact, she had intended to dye her hair black before the new semester, because students were not allowed to dye their hair. Right then, a middle-aged woman in pajamas came downstairs. Seeing Casey, she asked curiously, Casey, who's this guy? Emmett assumed that this woman might be one of Casey's neighbors. In a good mood, he decided to make fun of Casey. E. Nice to meet you, he said playfully. I'm Casey's boyfriend. Casey was taken aback by Emmett's mischievous joke. She hastily explained to the middle-aged woman, He's just kidding. He's only a friend. Emmett smiled and waved at her. I should get going. Bye, Casey. Hey, wait. Young man, don't leave. The woman suddenly called out to stop Emmett. Confused, Emmett turned around. The woman stepped forward, observing him from head to toe, and asked, So how long have you two been dating? How old are you? Come inside, please. Have a drink. You can meet her father, too. What? Meet her father? So this woman is Casey's mother? Oh, Jesus. Regret filled Emmett's heart. He shouldn't have made a joke like that. He had told this woman he was Casey's boyfriend. Well, that's another fine mess you've gotten yourself into, Emmett. He straightened up, returning to his usual calm and serious self, just like at work. He said to the woman politely, Oh, so you're Casey's mother. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry for my joke. I'm actually one of her friends but not a boyfriend. Sorry for the misunderstanding. Despite his denial, Casey's mother didn't mind it at all. Instead, a happy smile crept across her face as she studied his own. She was satisfied with the way he behaved and talked. He seemed quite respectful, and maybe her daughter might take up with him. He seemed to be a working man as well and she could do much, much worse. Never mind. Even if you're just her friend, you're welcome to come to our house and have a cup of tea too. As she finished her words, she grabbed hold of his arm and led him into the elevator of the building. She didn't give him any chance to refuse. Shocked, Casey raised her hand but put it down immediately when she realized it was too late to stop them. Watching the elevator door close, Emmett began to wonder how big a fool he really was. Now I'm really in it. All because I can't keep my big mouth shut. How could a fool like me become Carlo's personal assistant? I may have to thank Mr. Hua for not firing me all these years. But in fact, Emmett was pretty straightforward and effective in the office. He never made these sorts of stupid mistakes at work. He would only play the bad boy in private, but unfortunately for him, each time he made fun of someone else, it backfired on him. On the other hand, in New York, Debbie was leaning back, held in Carlos' arms. What on earth happened? And how was Casey involved? She asked. Carlos gently kissed her cheeks and said in a muffled voice, Nothing happened. Nothing? Don't bet on it, she thought. Fine. Anyway, I should get up now. I may sleep until dark if I don't get up now. She had already missed out on breakfast. If she skipped lunch again, the elders of the Hua family would hate her more. Not like they hated her for any rational reason anyway, but there was no need to add fuel to the fires of their rage. She was already on thin ice as it was. Thinking of it, she threw an angry glance at the man. Huh. It's all your fault, you bad boy. You tortured me until the wee hours and even turned off the alarm clock, she thought, pursing her lips. Unaware of the complaining look on her face, Carlos whispered, It's fine if you want to sleep till tomorrow. He didn't mind it at all. Till tomorrow. 
Are you kidding? I'd be thrown out of the house along with my luggage, and your father and grandmother would be waiting there to slam the door. Debbie pushed him away and got out of the bed to dress herself. Leaning against the headboard, Carlos watched her put on her clothes and said, They wouldn't. Unconvinced, Debbie answered perfunctorily, Yes, dear. Carlos smiled. Freshen up and get something to eat. I'll take you out after that. Great. On hearing that she could hang out with Carlos, Debbie got excited. Moments later, at the dinner table downstairs, Carlos sat next to Debbie and they had lunch together. All the other family members ate their food silently. No one dared to speak a word against Debbie at Carlos' presence. It has been said that if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. They chose the latter option. When the couple left the house, Valerie finally broke the silence and told James, Just live with it. Don't start a fight with Carlos. He's going back to work tomorrow. We can deal with her then. James let out a cold hum. But that means I go back to work, too. I'm not that free. Holding a string of Buddhist prayer beads in her hand, Valerie murmured an umipa. The living room was quiet with only the sound coming from the TV. Valerie cursed Carlos' grandfather in her mind. Douglas, why do you make me hate you so much even when you're ill and in the hospital? You've kept Debbie's grandmother in your heart for your whole life. You've missed out on her but you still tried to make her granddaughter marry into the Hua family. When you wake up, you'll realize what a big mistake you've made. It wasn't too long before Debbie began to feel exhausted and sleepy. She hadn't fully gotten over the jet lag yet. It was about two o'clock in the morning in Y City. Her body wanted sleep according to her biological clock. On returning to her bedroom, Debbie dove onto the bed and hit the hay immediately. Shaking his head helplessly, Carlos had no choice but to head to the study and catch up on his work. The next day, Carlos went to work in his branch company. Since he wasn't at home, Debbie thought she'd better stay in the bedroom and avoid the other family members. So she lay in the bed and played on her phone inside the bedroom. After looking through the news on Weibo, she finally figured out what happened. In no time, she dialed Casey's number and so she could talk to her by phone. I haven't gotten over the jet lag yet. Is it bedtime there yet? Debbie asked. No, it's still early. I'm having fun outside, Casey said. Hearing the loud music and cheering on the other end, Debbie guessed that Casey might be having fun in a bar. But soon enough, the noise subsided, probably because Casey had walked to a quieter corner to talk on the phone. I saw your comment. I'm touched, really. Thanks, Casey. You always got my back. Debbie expressed her gratitude sincerely. Of course. We're best friends. Though Emmett deleted my comment and handled everything, watch out for Megan. That girl is bad news. Debbie had been aware of it. But to reassure her friend, she said, Oh, I know. Carlos is always busy, too busy to take care of stuff like this. He doesn't care that much as long as I'm not hurt. To stop Megan's flood of tears, Carlos had asked Emmett to do damage control and delete all those comments against her. But that was all he did. He even told her that Casey was Debbie's good friend, and that Debbie would handle it herself. Casey's my best friend. She pissed off Megan because of me. Of course I'll defend my friend. Yeah, I'll deal with her all right, I'll buy her a drink, Debbie thought happily. Casey entered a quiet and empty room, turned on the lights and closed the door while protesting. So. Are you calling me from thousands of miles away just to brag about how well your husband treats you? We've suffered enough, tomboy. Cut it out. Have mercy on a single woman. Debbie chuckled. Just deal with it. When you score a sweet boyfriend one day, I won't mind listening to all your stories. Sounds good. I should go out and find a boyfriend then. I'm looking forward to hearing the good news. Casey paused and then begged. Okay, okay. You win. Don't make fun of me anymore. How are you doing in New York? Everything okay? Not too bad. I'm not welcome here. Most of the Hua family members don't like me, especially Carlos' grandmother and father. I don't get why. This is my first visit and I'm not sure how I offended them, Debbie said gloomily as she rolled to and fro in the bed. Eh? Really? Doesn't Carlos' mother like you? Casey asked, confusion in her voice. 
Yeah, but it doesn't help. She just keeps quiet. And she seems to be scared of her husband. It's too complicated for me to understand. Is it? I'm sorry, dear. Oh, let me tell you one thing. Emmett bought me a handbag yesterday. Debbie wasn't sure she heard her right. Confused, she asked. Emmett bought you a handbag? Why? She couldn't understand how all these things came together. Geez, I go nap for a bit, and the world turns upside down. Then Casey told her everything that happened yesterday. She summed it all up by saying, You weren't there to see this. My parents treated Emmett like their son-in-law. They're really happy with him. I was close to fainting from embarrassment. Emmett and Casey? Is there anything romantic going between them? Excited, Debbie sat up and suggested, I think Emmett is way better than Louis Hua. Carlos said that he had an annual income of at least a million dollars, and he just can't seem to find a girlfriend. How about you give it a try and date him? No way. We're not a good match. Emmett is a weird guy when he's not working. What's more, I enjoy being single. I don't need a man. It's my parents. They want me to find a nice guy, Casey said on the other end. Debbie pursed her lips and defended Emmett. So why did you accept the expensive handbag he bought? For the selfies. Those are worth more than the price of a handbag. We took some cute pics to convince his parents we're dating. Debbie sighed helplessly. Fine, as long as you guys are okay with it. Yeah. Oh. Can you guess who we bumped into at Shining International Plaza? Who? Hayden. By the way, why haven't you told him who your real husband is? He thought you were married to Emmett. Debbie knew Hayden had mistaken Emmett for her husband, yet she wasn't interested in explaining anything to him, and he likely wouldn't even believe it. I don't need to explain anything to him. Anyway, it's not like we're an item, Debbie replied firmly. Sounds about right. I'm looking forward to the day Portia finds out you're Mrs. Hua. I can see the look on her face. Uh huh. Ta. Huh. Casey leaned against the sofa, bursting into wild laughter. Right then, the door of the empty VIP room was pushed open. A group of businessmen walked in as a man said politely, Emmett, this is the room we reserved. The group of neatly dressed businessmen were shocked to see a woman lying casually on the sofa. When she spotted them, Casey hastily stood up from the sofa and tidied her clothes. Emmett asked curiously, Casey, why are you here? Casey swung her phone in front of him. Too noisy out there, so I wanted a quiet spot to talk on the phone. I'm leaving now, she explained briefly. Emmett nodded and moved aside to let her out. But the next second, he remembered something and stopped in her tracks. After pulling her out of the room, he said, Hey, my dad invited you to have a meal at my house. Casey widened her eyes in shock. What did you say? A meal with your parents? He nodded casually, confirming her words. Yeah, I have no choice. Relax, this is a paid gig. When you have some free time, I can buy you a handbag, cosmetics, whatever you want. What? Casey felt weird. All sorts of thoughts were going through her head right now, none of them good. He was paying her to go out with him? Wouldn't that be like a prostitute? If the comparison was valid, then did that make her a whore? And what did that do to her image? What if someone found out? And was that all she was to him? A paid escort? He seemed friendly enough, but his offer of a paid gig just set her on edge. As Debbie was still on the phone, she could hear Emmett's voice coming from the other end, so she spoke loudly to get Casey's attention. Hello, Casey. Casey, put Emmett on the phone. I need to talk to him. When Emmett took the phone from Casey's hand, he noticed that the caller ID was Tomboy and that they had already been on the phone for 18 minutes. Realizing this, he grinned broadly and said playfully, Hi, Mrs. Hua. Emmett here. Miss me yet? Casey rolled her eyes at him. Oh, please. What would Mr. Hua think if he heard you? Debbie had wanted to get on his case too. Now, hearing Casey's remark, she couldn't help but burst into laughter. She fought the urge and stopped laughing. She needed to know. So, what do you think of her? He thought carefully. This was her best friend Casey after all. My parents are happy with her after seeing the photo. He answered in an official tone. 
Debbie chuckled. Very polite. But what about turning this lie into reality? Emmett paused, shifting his gaze to the girl casually leaning against the wall. I'd like to give it a shot. But she loves Mr. Louis Hua. His sentence was interrupted abruptly by Casey's angry shout. Hey, who loves Louis Hua? You mean me? Bullshit. I was done with him a long time ago. Cut it out. Emmett thrust his arms forward, palms out. Okay, okay. Me culpa. Getting back on the phone, he said. Mrs. Hua, I have a meeting. I'll call Casey later to talk about her visit to my house, okay? Wow. So soon. Debbie exclaimed. She was taken aback. Seeing parents? Are they talking marriage? After returning the phone to Casey, Emmett drew close to her and whispered in a mysterious voice. The contract tonight is important to the company. If I can't seal the deal, half of my bonus goes bye-bye. I'll call you when I'm done. His closeness made Casey nervous. With a stiff smile on her face, she stuttered. It's none of my business. He tried to get her on board by saying, There will be a lot of new and fashionable products at the plaza after the spring festival. I'll buy you two things and you come to my house to have a meal, okay? Just one meal. That's it. I get two things and I get fed. Casey hesitated. This was tempting because her mother had tightened her purse strings recently. Find just one meal. I'm not marrying him. There's nothing to worry about. With that thought in mind, she nodded. Deal. Emmett smiled happily, showing his white teeth. Before entering the room, he patted her on her shoulder and promised, If I get this contract, I'll buy you dinner. Casey wondered, Buy me dinner? Since when did we get so close? Why would he buy me things, invite me to his home and treat me to a meal? Lost in deep thought for a moment, she finally came back to her senses, realizing that the call was still connected. Tomboy, hear me? Yeah, I heard everything. Look, Emmett's a nice guy. Think about it, okay? Debbie persuaded. Casey paused. After a while, she said, I, let me think about it. As Debbie was chatting fervently with Casey over the phone, a knock at the door interrupted her. It was a housemaid, informing her that Carlos' grandmother wanted to see her. The old lady was waiting for her downstairs. It seemed that Debbie had been too naive. She thought that as long as she stayed in her room, nobody would mess with her. What does she want? She thought. Ending the call quickly, she asked the housemaid curiously. Did she say why she wanted to see me? Sorry, Mrs. Hua. But Mrs. Valerie Hua didn't tell me, the housemaid replied. Despite her reluctance, she had no choice but to follow the housemaid downstairs. It would be impolite for her to keep an elder waiting. In the living room, Valerie and Megan sat on the sofa while a few housemaids were busy with housework. Valerie was sulking silently. Seeing Debbie come downstairs, Megan asked, Aunt Debbie, have you seen a string of Buddhist prayer beads made of lobular red sandalwood? The main feature of lobular red sandalwood was the wood grain which looked like stars on each bead. A string of Buddhist prayer beads? Debbie frowned. No, I haven't seen it. I've been in my room the whole time. Why do you ask? Megan gave Debbie a meaningful glance before answering in a regretful voice. Grandma's string of Buddhist prayer beads is gone. It was here yesterday, but we can't find it now. We've been looking for it for a while. Debbie nodded and comforted Valerie. Grandma, please take it easy. In my experience, the more you try to look for something, the less likely it is you'll find it. But if you stop worrying about it, it will show up one day out of the blue. Valerie sneered and gave her a cold glance. Did you mean to say I shouldn't look for it? Under Valerie's cold glare, Debbie felt utterly speechless. Fine. Everything I say is wrong. Better zip my mouth. A loud yawn broke the awkward silence in the living room. Debbie turned around and saw Louis coming downstairs. Louis' eyes lit up with excitement at the sight of Debbie. He picked up his pace and ran up to her. Debbie, you're home today? Yeah. The contempt was obvious in her voice. But Louis didn't care a bit, even if he had sensed it. Instead, he tried to butter her up. I can show you the hottest spots in town. How about I take you out for a drive? Or do you want to go shopping? I can buy you anything you want. 
Doesn't he know I'm his cousin's wife? How can he be so blatantly obvious? No way. Debbie refused bluntly. Now wait. Don't be so quick to turn me down. You know I'm a hottie, right? Lewis said as he ran his fingers through his hair. A confident smile appeared on his bratty face. Debbie shifted her gaze toward Valerie and Megan, who were both pretending to ignore Lewis. Frowning, she wondered why they paid no attention to his lewd behavior. Lewis put a hand in front of her eyes, blocking her view and asked, Debbie, why are you looking at them? Eyes on me, okay? I'm hot, right? Debbie rolled her eyes and turned around to go upstairs. Want me to lie or tell the truth? She asked, walking past him. Catching up with her, Lewis said, Lie to me then. You're not hot, she replied purposefully. Lewis tittered. That's a lie, so she means I'm a good-looking guy. But he didn't want her to beat around the bush to praise him. He wanted to hear it from her lips directly. And the truth? He asked expectantly. Debbie turned around and looked into his eyes. The truth is, you're so ugly that when you walk into a bank, they turn off the cameras. Lewis was stumped by her words. Seeing the frustrated look on Lewis' face, a few housemaids in the living room giggled under their breaths. Even Megan couldn't help but cover her mouth to stifle her laughter. As Debbie continued to walk toward the staircase, she was shocked to spot a woman standing on the landing of the staircase. It was Miranda, who was dressed neatly. It seemed like she was going out. Embarrassed, Debbie forced a smile and greeted. Hello, Aunt Miranda. Oblivious to Debbie's greeting, Miranda fixed her eyes on her son, who was ready to run away, and reproached in a cold voice. Louis, you idiot. Scolded by his mother in front of others, Louis lowered his head in shame. He walked to the sofa, sat down next to Valerie and asked, Grandma, what did you need? Valerie kept silent while Megan answered instead. Grandma lost her string of Buddhist prayer beads. No one can find it. Have you seen it? Nope. I couldn't care less about things like that. Why would I take it? Lewis replied nonchalantly as he stroked his messy hair. Seeing Miranda finally leave the living room, he quickly stood up and rushed upstairs. Debbie had just closed her bedroom door when she heard a knock. She opened it but in a split second flung the door to close it. However, Lewis reacted so fast that he had already squeezed part of his body in before she could close the door. Wearing a lewd smile on his face, he said, Hey, wait. Debbie, don't close the door. Let me in. No one knew how much Debbie wanted to kick this guy out of her room. Gritting her teeth, she swallowed her anger and flung the door open straight away. What do you want now? She yelled. My cousin left you here alone. You must be lonely, so I just want to keep you company. I'm so considerate, aren't I? Don't bother to thank me, he said, winking at her. Debbie had never known anyone more shameless than him. He actually thought he was a great guy, when really he was a creep. Thanks. Please go. I need to be alone. With an even more obscene smile, he teased. Please don't kick me out. I heard you're a very naughty girl. Come on, sis-in-law, let's have some fun. Anger was written all over her face. She wanted to say, tell that to your brother's wife. But on second thought, she remembered that his brother's wife was actually a nice person, so she swallowed those words. Instead, she threatened, get out, go downstairs, or I'll send you there the hard way. His parents seemed to be well-educated, but how did they raise such an asshole? She thought to herself. Knowing that Debbie was skilled in martial arts, Lewis finally restrained himself and retreated from the room. Standing at the doorway, he still tried to get in her pants. Come on, you have to admit my cousin is a cold guy. What's so good about being his wife? Cut him loose and marry me. I promise I'll stay with you every minute. Never leave you alone. To avoid misunderstanding, Debbie had no choice but to walk out to the corridor since Lewis hadn't stopped his pestering. In a cold voice, she ridiculed, You want to marry me? Look at your thin, weak body. And that fat chin. Find a gym. Why? Lewis asked. Why? Because you need exercise. If you're gonna be like that, at least be manly enough to take the punches you're asking for. As she spoke, she dropped into a fighting stance and cracked her neck, 
getting ready to teach this bastard a lesson. Sensing danger emanating from Debbie, Lewis stepped backwards and leaned against the wall. Debbie, this is the Hua family's house. I wouldn't try anything if I were you. Remember, you're not exactly popular here, he said in a trembling voice. Debbie snorted. Even if I stayed quiet, they still wouldn't change their minds. This is going to be fun. Then, without saying anything more, she darted toward him. In a panic, Lewis quickly ran toward his own bedroom, following a wave of screams. Eventually, he managed to shut the door behind him, putting his back into it. He quickly locked it before she could get at him. Leaning against the door, he gasped for air. His heart was racing fast as if it could stop beating any time. She's such a hard woman. I can't understand how Carlos can keep her under control. But a woman like that has to be great in bed. Damn, I really want some of that action. He couldn't help but swallow a little saliva as he fantasized about having sex with Debbie. After frightening Lewis away, Debbie returned to her bedroom. These people were all so different from each other. It had to make life difficult. For instance, Valerie was strict. James was ill-tempered. Tabitha was docile. Carlos was cold. Louis was frivolous and Miranda was arrogant. At dinner time, the ambience of the dining room was as odd as usual. Everyone sitting at the dinner table was immersed in his or her own thoughts. But for Debbie, it was lucky that James wasn't having dinner at home thanks to work. As usual, Megan took any chances to stir up trouble during meal time. Uncle Carlos, I want to eat that dumpling but I can't reach it, she said with a pitiful look on her face. Debbie discreetly rolled her eyes. Megan always wanted to eat the food in front of Carlos. Obviously, the food wasn't the point. If Carlos gave in to her and helped her dish up food, then she could pretend she was his girlfriend. Debbie wasn't the only one who got it, but everyone else could see through her too. However, no one dared to make a comment because each time, Valerie would look at Megan affectionately and nod approvingly. Carlos was eating soup when Megan spoke to him. On hearing her, he put down his spoon, took up his chopsticks and reached for a dumpling. As he was about to pick up the dumpling, Debbie suddenly stretched out her chopsticks, picked it up and put it in her mouth. Carlos didn't think anything of this and moved his chopsticks toward another dumpling. However this time, Debbie thrust her chopsticks forward and snatched the dumpling from his own. Then the couple began the pick and snatch game. Debbie had stuffed nearly an entire plate of dumplings into her mouth. Fortunately for her, the chef had made each of the dumplings fairly small, so it wasn't a problem for her to fill her mouth with one after another. On the other hand, Valerie and Megan had been watching the couple the whole time, their faces deadpan. Lewis tried so hard to stifle his laughter that his face went red. Tabitha remained silent, but just asked a housemate to fetch Debbie a bowl of soup. In the end, Carlos stopped trying to pick up any dumplings. He was afraid Debbie would choke to death. He placed the whole dish of dumplings in front of Debbie and looked at Megan. Megan, your Aunt Debbie likes eating dumplings. Maybe try another dish, he requested. Debbie stared lovingly at Carlos, her eyes glittering. She felt her heart melt. Her husband looked extremely handsome in her eyes whenever he tried to protect her. Megan inhaled deeply, trying to keep the smile on her face. Never mind. Since Aunt Debbie likes dumplings, just let her enjoy them. Uncle Carlos, please have a bite of this meat, Megan said as she picked up a slice of roasted meat and put it on a clean plate. Then she asked the housemaid to carry it to Carlos. Debbie felt gloomy. Can't you just eat quietly? Why all the drama? Maybe Carlos should enroll you in a drama academy since you're so talented at acting. You'll surely be an A-list actress, Megan, she thought angrily. As soon as the housemaid put the plate in front of Carlos, Debbie thrust her chopsticks in to pick up the slice of roasted meat. Shaking the meat in front of the angry Megan, she said in a naughty tone, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, your uncle Carlos is a germaphobe. You touched the meat with your chopsticks so he won't eat it. I'd better eat it instead. Before stuffing the meat into her mouth, she looked at the meat while adding, But, do you have, are you healthy? She managed to swallow the words infectious disease before she said them out loud. 
That would have been blatant and Debbie was too clever for that. She wanted her attack to be well-planned, well-timed and well-executed, and being too brazen would have knocked all that off kilter. She tried not to smile while chewing her food. That would have given her away. Exasperated, Megan. Exasperated, Megan began to breathe faster. Short of breath, she stuttered. Aunt Debbie, what are you talking about? I, I. It seemed to Debbie that Megan's asthma attack always came at the best times. Debbie's plan had hit a snag. Instead of staking her claim to what was rightfully hers, Carlos himself. But yet again, it looked as though Debbie was bullying a patient. Enough. Why are you being so noisy at the dinner table? Seeing Megan struggling for breath, Valerie immediately gestured to a housemate, instructing her to take care of Megan. In the meantime, she cast a stern glance at Debbie. Of course, Debbie wasn't about to take that lying down. I'm being noisy? But who started it? Unconvinced, Debbie pursed her lips and focused on eating her food. Carlos put down his chopsticks and called in the steward. When the steward came into the dining room, he ordered, Tomorrow, swap this table out for a rotating table. Yes, Mr. Hua, the steward answered and left. Carlos put a piece of cabbage in Debbie's bowl and looked at Valerie. Grandma, Debbie's part of this family too. If you play favorites, you'll hurt Debbie's heart. As time goes by, she may develop psychological problems. If that happens, you might find it harder to be a great-grandmother. A great-grandmother? Valerie looked toward Debbie with hatred, while the latter blinked her innocent eyes at her. Debbie didn't expect Carlos to mention having a child all of a sudden. Just eat your food, Carlos ordered her in a hushed voice. He moved more food to her plate before eating his own. On the other side of the table, Valerie heaved a sigh of relief when Megan's breathing had improved. It seemed like her asthma attack was going away. Debbie saw it too and glared at her briefly. She believed that Megan used it to get attention and might even be faking to the whole ordeal. Quite the accusation. After dinner, Valerie excused herself and asked both Carlos and Megan to come into her room. She wanted to talk with them privately. Obviously knowing that Debbie was watching, Megan cheerfully closed the door. Left outside, Debbie made a face at the closed door. Huh, I don't give a damn what you will talk about, she thought, gritting her teeth. When she turned around, she saw an emotionless Miranda standing right behind her. In an instant, the grimace on her face was replaced by a polite smile. Aunt Miranda, she greeted, sounding courteous. The reason why Debbie showed so much respect to the arrogant Miranda was not because Debbie was scared of her. It was just that Miranda was an elder. And besides, she hadn't done anything overt to Debbie, nor did she seem to side with the other family members whenever they got mad at her. Miranda gave her a cold glance and said slowly, I'd like you to come with me to visit Carlos' grandpa in the hospital. Today or tomorrow? What? Shocked, Debbie raised her head and looked at Miranda with disbelief in her eyes. Her reaction made Miranda unhappy. She queried in a cold voice, Is that a no? Shaking her head vigorously, Debbie promised, No, I didn't expect to be asked. It would be an honor to go with you. It was just that she hadn't ever imagined that Miranda would invite her to tag along when she visited Carlos' grandfather. Without responding to Debbie, Miranda turned around and returned to her own bedroom, leaving Debbie alone with her thoughts. Why did she do that? Was this a way to reach out, maybe an olive branch? She didn't have long to think about it, though. A bit later, Carlos went back to their bedroom too after listening to Valerie's lecture. Debbie had given up thinking about the invitation and had been chatting happily on WeChat with her friends. Jared suddenly complained, Damon's getting married. His wife-to-be is pregnant. My dad is busy preparing the betrothal gifts. Maybe I should get hitched. Otherwise, my dad might break the bank buying gifts for Damon and his wife. If he did that, I would have to start eating air for breakfast. Debbie wrote, Ha! Huh, think your brother cares about your dad's money. Jared replied with a zipper mouth face emoji. But she was right, Damon was rich enough himself so he wouldn't care about his dad's fortune a bit. Then he asked Debbie, Do you remember Oscar? The man you had a fight with at the Orchid Private Club. 
Debbie sent a nodding head emoji. I've told you something about him last time, but you were too drunk to listen. I'm not sure you heard anything I said. So, I heard Damon say he sent Oscar to the police station at your husband's request. And in the end, the court gave Oscar a life sentence. Debbie was taken aback. Seriously? Life imprisonment? But it wasn't that serious. Jared wrote, Yeah, no shit. But he deserved it. The guy was a punk. He committed crimes like kids eat candy. Any one of these would have dumped him in jail for the rest of his life. He's lucky he didn't get the death penalty. Debbie didn't text back. She lay prone on the bed, deep in thought. When Carlos walked into the room, this was what he saw. A meditating Debbie. He climbed onto the bed, pressed on her back and asked, What are you doing? He kissed her long hair. Putting her phone aside, she struggled to roll over and looked into his eyes. They were in a rather sexy position now. But she was so deep in thought and had so many doubts that she didn't even have time to care about it. Is it true? Did Oscar get life in prison? She asked outright. Oscar. Carlos slightly frowned, racking his brain to recall who this guy was. But he failed. Who's Oscar? He asked in confusion. Last time at the Orchid Private Club, I got in a fight with a guy and a woman. The guy was Oscar. After her reminder, two blurry faces popped into his brain. Yet, he didn't give it much thought and shook it off quickly. He wouldn't bother dealing with a guy like that personally. I told Damon about it. I don't know the rest. If you want, I can ask Damon now. Debbie shook her head. After a moment of meditation, she pinched the handsy man's ear and asked, He got the sentence because of his past, not because of me, right? It seemed like this woman wouldn't let it go. After giving her a quick kiss, Carlos pulled out his phone and called Damon. The call went through in no time. Damon's voice was clearly heard in the quiet bedroom. Carlos, you finally remember that I exist. You've been a hermit since you fell for Debbie. Oblivious to his complaint, Carlos got straight to the point. How did you deal with the guy I handed to you last time? Which one? The man who offended my wife at the Orchid Private Club. Well, that guy. Oh, Oscar, right? He's just a scumbag. I just called a friend of mine a cop and got him arrested. They found outstanding warrants and the rest was history. Carlos hung up the phone as soon as he made sure that Debbie had an answer. Putting his phone aside, he asked, Happy now? Hmm, Debbie nodded. So Jared was right. It was reasonable to lock Oscar in jail for his entire life, regarding the tons of crimes he had committed. Carlos pulled her into his arms and whispered, If they mess with you, I won't let them off the hook. Debbie planted a kiss on his forehead. Hmm, honey, thank you. She beamed at him. Thank you? Why so formal? Me. Yes. He raised his eyebrows. Debbie smiled and wrapped her arms around his neck, asking, By the way, what did Grandma talk to you about? Did she try to talk you into divorcing me again? Hmm. He didn't hide it. I'm not giving you up no matter what. Wearing a sweet smile on her face, Debbie pretended to be angry and grabbed him by his collar. She rested one leg on top of him and threatened in a condescending manner. Promise me or else. Carlos put his hands under his head on the pillow and looked at her, a tender smile adorning his handsome face. Finally, a single word left his lips. Promise. For the first time in his life, he had willingly allowed himself to be weak. Most willingly. I'm happy. Debbie blew him a kiss and then tried to push him into the study. But he shook his head. I'm not working tonight. Let's go out for fun instead. When she heard that Carlos was going to take her out, Debbie was thrilled. Awesome. Let's go. Just as they stepped out of their bedroom, they came across Valerie and Megan who had just come upstairs. Seeing Debbie and Carlos both fully dressed, Megan asked, Uncle Carlos, Aunt Debbie, are you going somewhere? Debbie ignored her. Carlos nodded. Grandma, we're going out for a bit. What for? Valerie asked. A movie, Carlos replied. It was Debbie's suggestion. Her idol's new movie was just released. She had been talking about seeing it for a couple of days now. It was about time that he took her out on a date, and the theater seemed like the perfect excuse. 
Megan's eyes lit up. A movie? Uncle Carlos, I want to go. Can I go with you? Bitch, we're on a date. Can't you see that? Debbie thought. Next time. I don't think you'll like this one, Carlos said, flatly refusing. Debbie was relieved. She had been worried that Carlos would have agreed to everything Megan asked. Megan trotted to Carlos and held his sleeve. Uncle Carlos, I'm bored here. I want to go to the movies with you. Grandma Valerie will go to sleep later. And then I'll have nobody to talk to and nothing to do. Please let me go with you. Please. Valerie knew Megan's intent. She decided to help her. Yes. To keep me company, Megan's been cooped up here for days. As her uncle and aunt, you should take her out for some fun. Several minutes later, Debbie, Carlos and Megan left the house together. In the cinema, Debbie took Carlos to the self-service machine to get the tickets through her phone, while Megan went to buy some snacks and drinks. According to the tickets, Debbie's seat was right between Megan and Carlos, yet in the theater, Megan took somebody else's seat and sat beside Carlos. So now, Carlos sat between the two women. That's somebody else's seat, Debbie reminded Megan. Megan responded casually, Nobody else is coming. Uncle Carlos' assistant rented the entire theater. Debbie was surprised. How come I didn't know that? My assistant arranged that when you were in the bathroom, Carlos explained. Fine. I knew I shouldn't have gone to the bathroom. I needed to keep my eyes on Megan. Debbie thought regretfully. The movie started. It starred Ramona Liu, a fantastic singer who became an actress. Her success as an actress proved that she could not only sing but also act. It was a period piece and Megan had to stifle a groan. Megan hated those kinds of movies where everyone wore robes and even funny headgear, and they had so many rules about the roles of women in society, even more than today. She much preferred the more fantastic ones, with mighty magics and eye-popping special effects, but she was left with this. It was called The Heart Abides about two star-crossed lovers, one a prince in exile, the other a palace servant. Of course, it was scandalous in the days of the Song dynasty. At least she was with Carlos. Debbie, of course, was delighted. She had been waiting for this since it went into production, and she heard that her favorite actress was starring in it. Looking at the middle-aged woman on the screen, Carlos told Debbie, Your idol is Curtis's sister. Huh? Mr. Lou's sister? but they don't look anything alike. Is it because she is wearing makeup? Nope. She's his half-sister, so odds are they wouldn't share any family features. Debbie remembered that Jared and Damon were half-brothers. It seems that there are a lot of half-siblings in rich families, she mused. She popped a chip into her mouth and asked, So Damon's dad married Jared's mom, but only after Damon's mom had passed away. What about Mr. Lou's dad? Last time when she and Jared were at the Lou family's cruiser party, they had seen very few Lou family members. The Lou family is complicated. Outsiders know little about it. Maybe next time you can ask Curtis to tell you about his family himself. Carlos assumed that Curtis actually was concerned about Debbie. He'd made some reference that made it sound like Debbie was related to him in some way. Thinking about that, Carlos glanced at Debbie, who was focused on the movie. He decided to do some investigation about the connection between Debbie and the Lou family. Having no chance to cut in, Megan took out a bottle of lemon-flavored C-100 and handed it to Carlos. Uncle Carlos, I can't open it. Please help me unscrew the lid. Carlos looked at the beverage and handed it to Debbie, who seemed to be on the verge of going ballistic. Honey, you open it. Debbie tore her eyes away from the film and had put her full attention on Megan and Carlos as soon as Megan opened her mouth. She wasn't going to let anything Megan did get between them. Debbie was surprised by Carlos' reaction, but she reflexively took the bottle. Why did he do that? Does he think I'm his servant or something? With the bottle in her hand, for a long moment, Debbie was too stunned to react. Here, let me help you, Carlos said. He quickly opened the bottle and gave it back to Megan. Both Megan and Debbie were surprised. Hence, Carlos was actually helping Debbie instead of Megan. Megan was embarrassed. And not only that, she had created an opportunity for Carlos to express his affection for Debbie. 
He threw it right in her face. She had no one else to blame but herself. When the movie was over and the end credits were rolling, they walked out of the cinema. They were caught by a gust of cold wind that blew on them right when they hit the streets. Megan crossed her arms over her chest and trembled. It's so cold, she said. Are you cold? Carlos asked Debbie. She shook her head. She was wearing a down jacket while Megan was sporting a reversible cashmere overcoat with few buttons. Carlos walked to the car and opened the door. Get in the car first if you're cold, he told Megan. After giving Debbie a look of triumphant satisfaction, Megan got in the car. Just then Carlos closed the door and said to the driver, Megan is cold. Turn the heat up and drive her home. The driver was hesitant. What about you and Mrs. Hua? I'll ask my assistant to come and pick us up. Megan was deeply disappointed. Through the lowered passenger seat window, Debbie snickered at Megan. After the car had driven away, Debbie wrapped her arms around Carlos' waist and sang and screamed, I pray to be with you through rain and shiny days. I'll love you till I die. Deep as sea, wide as sky. The beauty of our love paints rainbows everywhere we go. Carlos smiled and kissed her on the lips. Love me that much, huh? Of course, Debbie answered firmly. With a wider smile, Carlos bent over and patted his back. We might not have a car right now, but you have me. You gotta be tired. Come on. I'll give you a piggyback ride. Debbie stared at Carlos' broad back. Warmth spread through her body. She raised her head to look at the sky as she tried to hold back her tears. Carlos carried her easily. Riding on his back, she called out, Carlos. Yes. Why are you so good to me? Because you're my wife, silly. Although Carlos' gentleness was nothing new to her at this moment, Debbie was still intoxicated by his tenderness. The man was nothing short of amazing sometimes. She pressed her cheek against his back to feel his warmth. Would you have done this for me if I weren't your wife? Carlos smiled. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're my wife, my one and only. I'll treasure you forever. Remember that. Okay, if you go back on your word, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the sea with you. Debbie laughed. No problem. If I ever break my promise, you can punish me however you want. Remember, a promise is a promise. Yeah. It started raining as they approached the Hua's residence. Worried that Carlos was tired, Debbie got off from his back. You've worked all day. I don't want to wear you out in the evening, too. Carlos pulled her into his arms and whispered, Don't worry about me. I can carry you home and still show you a good time. I can prove it to you. Stop it. Debbie covered his mouth with her hand. Carlos pulled her hand away and kissed her on the lips. What? Can't I say this stuff to my wife? Maybe. And maybe you should be locked up for saying things like that. Just think about how lonely you'd get if I were put in prison. Not a good idea. You'd miss me way too much. You're so modest, she giggled. He was right. She was getting a bit tired. The rain was starting to come down in earnest. It was drizzling and their hair was starting to get wet. They ducked under an overhanging roof trying to stay dry. Carlos took off his overcoat and spread it over her head. Debbie pulled it off again. No. This is your favorite overcoat. And very expensive. I can't let you do this. It'll get ruined. She knew how much Carlos liked that particular article of clothing. Carlos put it back over her head. I can always buy a new coat. I don't want you to get sick. He was so considerate. Debbie was enormously moved. What was happening reminded her of a song which goes, For the rest of my life, I want only you for better or worse. If Emmett knew Carlos had protected Debbie from the rain with his favorite overcoat, he would have marveled at how important Debbie was to Carlos. He already thought of Carlos as Debbie's slave, and that would have proven it even more. That was something new to Emmett, and he figured that bending over backwards for someone wasn't healthy. But then again, he had never been in love, at least not that kind of deep, enduring love, so he wouldn't know until he fell that deeply. The rain was getting heavier. Worried that Debbie might be cold, Carlos called his assistant to ask him to pick them up. The next day, Debbie didn't show up downstairs until 11, still yawning. 
The first thing she saw was Valerie's grim face. Standing next to Valerie was Megan, who waited on her like a maid. Grandma, Debbie said. So you still know to get up? Do you know what time it is? Valerie berated her, pounding her cane on the floor. Debbie poured a glass of water for herself and took out her phone to check the time. It was 11 o'clock. I'm sorry. I still haven't gotten over the jet lag. The old lady snorted loudly, refusing her explanation. You can't sleep in anymore. I won't allow it. Debbie fluttered her eyelashes in disbelief. You should discuss this with your grandson. Carlos went to work early this morning. How am I supposed to discuss this with him? Valerie asked angrily. Debbie yawned and explained helplessly. Your grandson comes home late from work every day. And he usually brings some work home and doesn't go to bed until the small hours. I try to get some sleep, but every night, he kisses me until I wake up, and then has sex with me. Not giving the other two any chance to interrupt her, she continued. Normally, he falls asleep in the middle of the night, but sometimes, he won't leave me alone until the birds start chirping. So you see, Grandma, you have to talk to him about this. I used to practice martial arts, but even so, I can barely walk. Enough. Valerie's face turned red with embarrassment as she was listening to Debbie. So rude. Megan blushed and kept her head bowed the whole time. Aunt Debbie, maybe you should keep this kind of stuff to yourself in the future. Megan supported Valerie with her hands as the old lady walked towards the door. Debbie watched them confused. That's my husband I was talking about. Isn't it normal for couples to have sex? Don't be shy, Grandma. We're all family here. Valerie hadn't even made it to the living room yet when she turned back and reprimanded. Shut up. Debbie picked up the glass of water and put it to her mouth. Valerie's red face made her want to laugh so much. She stifled her laughter and somehow thought the old lady was adorable at that moment. Spending days in the Hoa's house was quite boring for Debbie. She was despised every day. The family always directed mean comments at her and it didn't seem to matter if she clapped back or not. She wanted to have some fun outside, but it was very cold. It was snowing outside, and the flakes rested on the ground and blanketed the countryside in bright white. Probably wasn't the best idea to go out when you could see your breath in the air. Maybe she should have asked Carlos to assign her as his bodyguard. After lunch, Debbie bundled up warmly and decided to go outside and have some fun. But Valerie stopped her by saying, the help has the day off. The first floor is dirty. Go clean it up. Debbie was shocked to hear her say that. The first floor was at least 200 square meters, which usually took a few servants to clean it. Now Valerie wanted her to do all the work by herself? This wasn't a reasonable expectation of work. This was a punishment. Valerie cast her a disdainful look. What? You have a problem with it? Or is it too hard for you? As the daughter-in-law of the Hua family, you can't even handle something simple like this. Huh. So you finally acknowledge that I'm the daughter-in-law. Debbie sneered in her heart. I can clean it. But I need her help. Debbie pointed at Megan who wore a smug smirk on her face. It was obvious she was enjoying this. Megan didn't care, because she knew the old lady would help her out. Sure enough, Valerie said. Megan has better things to do. What you need to do is clean. For Carlos' sake, Debbie decided to put up with it, pretending that she was killing time. She fetched the tools from the shed and started doing the work. It had been a long time since the last time she did housework. She had been treated like a queen ever since she married Carlos. Soon after she had started, she began panting. Her shirt clung to her uncomfortably, and she started to perspire. It didn't take long before she got really tired. She wanted to take a break, but she wasn't sure that Valerie would allow even that. Megan and Valerie, on the other hand, were chatting and laughing in the living room. So, Megan's job is to keep Valerie company while eating fruit and talking with her. Debbie couldn't help but wonder inwardly. Later, Connie saw Debbie doing the cleaning and tried to help her, but Valerie sent her away. When Louis saw her mopping the floor, he held her hand and tried to take her away from the family but he was scared away as his grandma hit the floor with her cane. It took her three hours to finish all the work. 
When she put the tools back in the shed and walked out, Valerie said, You forgot the bathroom. Go clean it. Debbie felt anger rise inside her, but once again, she chose to push it down deep inside her. Cleaning. No big deal. However, the size of the bathroom frustrated her as soon as she saw it. It was huge, with multiple sinks and a huge mirror running the length of the wall. It not only had many sinks, but also several stalls. There were store bathrooms that were smaller than this one. Why do they need such a big bathroom? Do they have to waste money like this just because they have it? Call me and ask me out now. Debbie texted Carlos secretly. She started waiting hopefully, but after a long while, Carlos still didn't reply to her message. Then the old lady came to check on her. It's taking you forever. Give me your phone. Am I really the daughter-in-law of the family, not a servant? She thought. She tried to talk the old lady out of it. Grandma, I'll be more efficient if I watch a video while cleaning. You should be more focused. Hand it to me. Debbie wanted to toss the rag onto her old wrinkled face. Calm down. This is Carlos' grandma. My dearest husband's grandma. She tried to compose herself. It was very late when Carlos came back. Exhausted, Debbie had gone to bed early after grabbing a bath. When he came in, she looked at him and closed her eyes once more. She had been worked to the bone, and she definitely needed to rest. Carlos loosened his tie and sat on the edge of the bed. Why did you call? Something happened. I was in a meeting. I called back later, but why did Megan answer your phone? He asked as he touched her chubby cheek. Debbie held his hand and asked casually, What did she say to you? Carlos let her know what Megan had said. She said you left your phone in the living room and you were upstairs sleeping. She told me nothing happened. Debbie adopted a conciliatory attitude. To avoid further trouble, she lied. I missed you. It's New Year and you're still busy. I've always said you work too hard. I'm worried about you. Carlos smiled and kissed her forehead. Don't worry. I'm used to it. I'll ask someone to take you outside when you want, in case you get lost if you go on your own. Debbie agreed to his suggestion readily. The next day, when Debbie was about to leave the house with Carlos, Valerie suddenly piped up. Debbie, you're young and have good eyesight. Come help me. Carlos was still changing his shoes. Debbie looked at him, and his reply made her happy. Ask Megan, Grandma. Debbie and I are taking off. Debbie nodded to Valerie and felt her handsome husband was awesome. Valerie sighed. She's not feeling well. Besides, she's taking care of me every day. It's someone else's turn. After casting Debbie a disgusted glance, she asked Carlos, stone-faced, Can't I ask your wife to do anything? To prevent the matter from escalating, Debbie waved at Carlos and said, Just go to work. Come home early. I'll go out after I help Grandma. Carlos smiled and pressed a kiss on her forehead. Okay. The driver's waiting for you outside. Call me if you need me. Okay, bye. Carlos left, and the old lady guided Debbie to the storage room. Standing at the entrance to the storage room, one hand holding her cane and the other twirling the beads, Valerie began. Go find the string of Buddhist prayer beads of mine and clean this room. I knew it wouldn't be that simple with her. She really wanted me to clean this room. Debbie thought to herself. Cleaning again. Cleaning had become her nightmare. Grandma, didn't you say that you lost that string of beads? Yes, I lost it. That's why I asked you to find it. One of my ancestors came to me in a dream and told me it's in here. Go look for it. Her ancestor told her that in her dream? What a load of bullshit. But what could she say? For Carlos' sake, she decided to be stoic and do as she was told. The storage room was dusty and crammed with all kinds of things. When she was finished, Debbie was on the brink of tears. But she didn't find the string of beads. When she emerged from the room, she was covered in dust from head to toe. She walked into the living room to tell Valerie that she couldn't find the beads. Only to see Megan and Valerie sitting on the sofa enjoying fruit, as well as each other's company. As soon as she showed her face in the living room, Megan ordered, Hey you, pour me some water. I need to take my medicine. Containing her anger, 
Debbie shot her a cold glance and snapped, Do it yourself. Megan wondered in fake shock, Aunt Debbie, why do you look like that? Your hair's must and your face is dirty. I didn't even recognize you. Didn't recognize me? Lying bitch. Debbie cursed. Why do I look like this? Try cleaning the storage room for two hours. Even if your dead parents came out of the grave, they wouldn't recognize you. Oh, Aunt Debbie, I didn't know you were cleaning. You must be tired. Come sit down. You work so hard. Megan looked at her in a fawning manner. Then she turned to Valerie. Grandma Valerie, my Aunt Debbie is so hardworking. She cleaned the living room and bathroom yesterday, and today she cleaned the storage room. But I... I can't do anything. I'm useless. Valerie patted her hand and said lovingly, What are you talking about? How is that possible? You're like a granddaughter to me. My precious granddaughter will never have to do this kind of work. Valerie's words were like a needle piercing Debbie's heart. She threw the rag into the bin in frustration. Grandma, from now on, if there's work to be done, just tell me. My husband will hire a dozen servants for you. Money is no object for him. As long as the pay is good, someone will clean, even at midnight on New Year's. The smile on Valerie's face faded. With a stern stare, she asked Debbie, What? Can't do a little cleaning? Telling your husband? That's my grandson. Who do you think he'll side with? Where are your manners? Didn't your parents teach you not to talk back to your elders? Megan shook Valerie's arm and reminded her, Grandma Valerie, Aunt Debbie's dad died a few years ago and her mom ran away from home a long time ago. Debbie's face darkened as soon as she heard her parents mentioned. Valerie sneered. No wonder she's so rude. It turns out that both of her parents were irresponsible and taught her nothing. Debbie's eyes burned with rage. She stalked towards the two on the sofa. Megan and Valerie were scared when they saw her angry face. Yet the old lady managed to remain calm despite her fright. What do you want? She demanded. What do I want? Old lady, you're lucky that you're Carlos' grandma, so I won't do anything to you. However, Megan is not my elder. Debbie grabbed Megan's collar abruptly and pulled her up. As her aunt, I'll teach her a lesson. Since Debbie had just done the cleaning, her dirty fingers left black streaks on Megan's white collar. Megan screamed, Yikes! Gross! Let go of me! Gross! Debbie sneered, You think that's gross? You should be used to it. Why are you so condescending? My husband treats you well, so you think you're a princess? Listen up, you're trash. From now on, show some respect. I have a temper. With that, she pushed Megan so forcefully the girl staggered and fell onto the sofa. Furious, Valerie started panting for breath. Seeing Megan was thrown to the sofa, she trotted over to pull the girl up. Dear, are you okay? She asked in worry. Megan trembled in the old lady's arms. Watching the two, Debbie remarked indifferently, I don't owe this family anything. Even though you treat me like shit, I'll still call you grandma because you're Carlos' grandma and I love him. I don't want any problems between us because he'll have to take sides. After a short pause, not long enough for the old lady and the girl to respond, she continued talking. But there's a line. I hope for your sake you don't cross that line again. As an elder, you should know better. I'll let Megan off the hook this time, but if she talks about my parents again, things won't be so easy for her, I swear. After that, Debbie turned and went upstairs. Valerie was too furious to say anything. If it were possible, steam would have poured from her ears. Back in her room, Debbie decided to get comfortable. She drew a nice warm bath and washed the grime away. She had hardly put clean clothing on before her phone rang. She knew the number by heart, even though she didn't have him in her contact list. It was Hayden. Why's he calling? She wondered. In a bad mood, Debbie decided not to answer it, just let it go to voicemail. She wasn't very good company right now. Then she got a text message from him. I'm in New York. I need to see you. It's important. Hayden is in New York? Debbie was a little worried. Why are you here? What's so important? She asked in a text. I'll give you the details when we meet up. If you don't come and meet me, 
I'll go to the Hua's residence to find you. He threatened. What the heck? Debbie cursed inwardly. She figured she'd better do as he said. After all, it might cause a scandal inadvertently. She called Carlos to let him know. I want to go out for a while, she told him. Okay. I'll ask the driver to take you wherever you want to go. Okay. Carlos. Debbie intended to tell him that she was going to meet Hayden, but remembering how jealous he could be, she decided not to. Yeah. Oh, nothing. What time are you coming home tonight? Carlos smiled. Since you miss me so much, I'll come home early. To his surprise, Debbie didn't scold him this time for hitting on her. Okay, she replied sweetly. On Broadway Avenue, Debbie got out of the car at an intersection, sent the driver away, and walked to the coffee shop where she was supposed to meet up with Hayden. When she got there, Hayden was already waiting for her. Seeing her walk in, he waved at her. It was a very cold day. She could see her breath in the air. Debbie felt she could hardly stand the cold after stepping out of the Hua's house. They kept that place hot like summer with the heat on all the time. She took off her hat and scarf, unzipped her down jacket, and sat opposite Hayden before ordering a latte for herself. For a moment, neither of them spoke. Debbie's coffee came. Thank you, she said to the barista who had just brought her the coffee. Hayden just leaned against the sofa and watched her. It made Debbie feel uncomfortable. Mr. Gu, I'm here, so just say what you have to say. You married Carlos Hua. It was not a question but a statement. Debbie nodded. Yeah. Though he knew the truth earlier, Hayden felt a pang in his heart when he heard her admit it in person. He composed himself and stated, I've heard that there's an arranged marriage in the works. The Hua family and Lee family. Carlos and the daughter of the Lee family grew up together and make a perfect couple. Everyone thinks that they'll get married sooner or later. James told the press a few days ago that the daughter of the Lee family would be his daughter-in-law. Just now, Debbie finally understood why James didn't like her. She represented a threat to their business interests. It turned out that he had chosen a daughter-in-law a long time ago. Debbie was an unpleasant surprise to him and his decision was based purely on the business advantages it would bring. I know. Not a problem. Carlos and I love each other. We'll convince his father to accept me. Carlos' family might have some problems with her right now, but that was no reason for her to give up. And Carlos' grandma likes his niece, though she's not a blood relative. Hayden had done some research on Carlos. Although there wasn't much, he found out something about his family. Debbie was not blind. She could see that Valerie liked Megan a lot. It doesn't matter. She believed that the love between her and Carlos was strong enough to overcome any obstacle between them. They would pass this trial. Hayden sighed, resigned to his fate. He still couldn't win her back. He said in a defeated tone, Fine. Tell me why you lied to me. Debbie held the coffee mug to warm her hands. When did I lie to you? She wondered. Hayden smiled wryly. I thought you were married to Emmett, and you didn't deny it. He felt played, felt that he made a fool of himself in front of Emmett and her. He didn't like that feeling, not one bit. You and I broke up, remember? So I have to tell you who I married? None of your business, Debbie retorted with a sneer. Her brutal tone stung. Hayden felt his heart was bleeding. He leaned forward and grabbed her hand resting on the table. Deb, get your hands off me, Debbie said angrily, trying to pull her hand out. Hayden didn't move his hands away. He held her hand tighter and pulled it close to his face to smell her scent. Deb, don't cancel me, please. Debbie looked around the coffee shop and found that Hayden and she were all the customers the shop had. She raised her voice and demanded, Let go of my hand. Don't push me. I'm getting pissed. Hayden looked up at her. What's the worst that can happen? You already left me a long time ago anyway. Sensing her anger, Hayden conceded. Fine. I'll let you go, but don't walk away, okay? Debbie gritted her teeth and nodded. As soon as he let go of her, she asked a barista to bring her a wet towel to wipe her hand. Embarrassed, Hayden gave a bitter smile. Debbie wiped her hand again and again before asking. 
What's so important that you have to tell me in person? What are you up to? Does Carlos who treat you right? Why did you marry him? Did you two make a secret deal or something? How much is he paying you? Tell me, Deb. I've been worried about you ever since I found out you married him. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but he really treasures me. And there's no deal between us. We're in love. Got it? Oh, my mistake. I forgot you never loved anyone, so you might not know what it is. When they were dating, Hayden always thought he was better than Debbie and despised her on every level. Soon after, he hooked up with some rich girl and often showed up as a happy couple in front of Debbie. That was when Debbie realized he had never loved her. Come on, Deb, our breakup was mutual. Don't act all innocent. Hayden sighed, trying to defend himself. What do you mean? I poured my heart into our relationship. Wasn't that enough? Hayden shook his head. I didn't say you weren't good to me. You were great to me. But in that time, we only held hands. We were a couple, but we didn't even kiss. Not fair. That was something Hayden hated to mention. He had only kissed Debbie on the cheek. That was all. Debbie replied, I was too young. She hadn't even come of age yet when they started dating. She thought she was progressive and free-spirited enough to do that. But she had standards and she wasn't going to violate those. Debbie thought that kissing was only appropriate for adults, so she had rebuffed Hayden's requests all the time when they were dating. Once, he attempted to forcibly kiss her on the lips and promptly found himself on his back with the wind knocked out of him. She had thrown him over her shoulder. Afterwards, they gave each other the silent treatment for months. It was Debbie who caved. She started to make up for what she did, but their relationship was a shadow of what it was previously. Deb, we live in the 21st century for crying out loud. Hayden was at a loss for words. Debbie felt she was maybe in the wrong about that, so she changed the subject. That's in the past. We've been apart for a long time. And I've found my true love, so let's move on. Hayden's heart ached when she said she had found the one. If he really loved you, he would have announced your marriage and told everyone that you are his wife. But he didn't. He doesn't love you, Deb. Open your eyes. Wrong. I'm the one who wants it kept under wraps, she told him. Her face betrayed no emotion. Hayden was so shocked he couldn't even speak. Deb, you know I love you. But Carlos Hua? In the circles I run in, he's known to be cold, distant, and calculating. Don't get taken in by him. There is no such thing as the modern Cinderella. So be realistic, okay? Debbie withdrew her gaze from outside the window to look at him. You don't know me. You don't know us. How can you be so judgmental? Hayden was reduced to silence again. After a while, he stood up, came to her, pulled her to her feet, and embraced her tightly. Did you know I was so worried about you when I learned you married Carlos, who I immediately booked a ticket to New York? Do you really think he can manage a big company like ZL Group without being underhanded and scheming? Impossible. He's known as a ruthless businessman. Even if you don't love me, let me in. Don't push me away. I'll wait for you until the day you finally figure out who he really is. You'll come back to me. Debbie was only human. When someone she had once loved whispered to her how much he cared about her, she froze and didn't know how to turn him down. Hayden went on. I won't get married to anyone else. I'll wait for you. When Carlos who hurts you, I'll be waiting. My arms are your harbor. You loved me once, but I never stopped loving you. Babe, I know it's too late, but I won't give up. My life is a dark place without you. I'm a walking zombie. I work my ass off at Goo Group. I do it for you. I used to be a jerk, I know. That's why I want to make money, a lot of money. I want to give you everything. Words like no. Never. Can't were on the tip of Debbie's tongue, but she didn't have a chance to cut in. She was waiting for him to calm down and then to turn him down. However, Mr. Gu, I see you came to New York to declare your love for my wife. How touching, a familiar and cold voice said. His voice was like a thunderbolt over Debbie's head. She pushed Hayden away in a fluster. Nonetheless, when she turned around, she saw Carlos sitting comfortably in an armchair. He seemed to have been there for a while. Her face went pale. She trotted over to Carlos and said, Carlos, 
Before she could continue, Carlos took her hand, stood up, and strode towards Hayden with her. Hayden, however, wasn't nervous at all at Carlos' sudden appearance. He held out his right hand confidently to shake hands with him. Mr. Hua, what a coincidence. Yeah, it is. They shook hands just as they had the other day in the restaurant. Debbie watched them, her mouth agape. As if nothing had happened, Hayden invited them to sit with him. Care for a cup of coffee? Carlos shook his head and wrapped his arm around Debbie's waist. After giving her an affectionate look, he replied, No thanks. My wife is kinda snacky and I have another cafe in mind. If you'll excuse me. Bye, Mr. Gu. When did I say I was hungry? Debbie wondered. But she was more confused by the weird interaction between the two men. She watched them, holding her breath, and didn't dare to say anything. She knew how this looked and she knew Carlos' temper. Debbie was extremely surprised that her husband had found her here, much less was behaving quite cordially to Hayden. This man had practically proposed to her, bared his soul, and begged Debbie to ditch Carlos and come with him. As possessive as Carlos was, he didn't have any further reaction. That shocked her. I see. Then I'll leave you to it. Hayden looked at Debbie and continued. Deb says that you two love each other very much. I can tell. You should spend more time with her. Did you know she loves to travel? Doesn't look like she gets out much, though. Carlos tightened his hand around Debbie's waist. Of course. We're planning to go to the Maldives in February, heading to H country in March, and a country in April. I'll go wherever she wants. Debbie pulled Carlos' arm and whispered in his ear on tiptoe. I knew about the Maldives, but H and A? When did you decide on those? He turned towards her just a bit. Just now, he answered. Debbie was dumbstruck. Seeing them together, Hayden smiled resignedly. Awesome. Take care. When Carlos passed by the cashier's desk, he released Debbie's hand and took care of the bill. Before they walked out of the coffee house, he wrapped Debbie's scarf around her neck and zipped up her down jacket. Everything he did seemed so natural and gentle it worried Debbie even more. What was going on in his head? She followed Carlos to a spacious, bright, and well-equipped minivan. He sat on the couch, and then forcefully pulled Debbie into the seat next to him. Drive, he told the driver. Debbie sensed the coldness around him. She wrapped her arms around his neck and explained, I, I we were just catching up. Catching up. She felt he was about to explode with rage. When he spoke, it felt as if the carriage were a missile silo. Since Carlos had seen Hayden holding her in his arms, Debbie understood why he was mad. I don't love him anymore. So tell me, Mr. Handsome, why were you there? Carlos rolled down the car window and cast a sideways glance at a building across the road. Check that out, he said. Confused, Debbie tried to look where he was looking only to see the building towering into the clouds with the giant letters, ZL Group. So you can see the cafe from your office? She asked. He gave her a cold look and said, The Hua family has eyes everywhere in this city. Debbie figured out how he knew. It wasn't hard to figure this out. One of James' men had seen Debbie being with another man and told his boss. As a result, James had barged into Carlos' office and demanded his son divorce her so it was only natural Carlos would be furious. Conversations with his father never went well under the best of circumstances, so with his dad in a confrontational mood only made matters worse. He had enough time to stew walking out of his office, waiting for the elevator, getting into the car, and getting to the cafe across the road. Steam was practically pouring out his ears by the time he got there. On the way home, Carlos said nothing, his face sullen. Knowing that he was in a bad mood, Debbie didn't dare to say a single word either. As the car drove into the Hua family's manor, she couldn't bear it anymore. Don't you need to work? She asked. Work? What for? My wife was about to fuck another man. His voice was as cold as ice. Sighing with profound resignation, Debbie explained. Come on, Carlos, listen to me. I know I shouldn't have gone to see Hayden, but I wasn't going to sleep with him. Damn, you're paranoid. Carlos said nothing, his face still livid. The car came to a halt at the gates to the villa. 
Carlos got out and walked to the villa without even looking back. Without a word, he just left her there. He wanted her to do the walk of shame. Seeing Carlos' figure receding, Debbie felt her heart break. If they weren't fighting, he would have scooped her up in his arms and carried her into the villa. Carlos Hua, she called out. Carlos stopped, turned around and looked at her, still silent. Debbie bit her lower lip and demanded, Carry me into the house. Carlos couldn't believe his ears. He was the one that was mad at her, yet she still acted like a little brat instead of apologizing. His reply was simple and sharp. No. After saying that, he turned around and entered the villa. How Debbie wished she could stop him and beat him up. Fine. You want me to make the first move? No way. She picked up her phone and texted Carlos saying, If you don't carry me into the villa, I won't get out of the car. She had made up her mind that she wouldn't move from this spot unless Carlos came back for her. His whole family loves Megan more than me. I guess they'll be happy if I freeze out here. The very thought made Debbie's heart ache. She knew why Carlos was so angry. After all, she was caught with Hayden at a cafe. But she didn't think she was wrong. They were just friends. It was all Hayden's fault. He acted so messed up that I couldn't help but go soft on him. Thinking of it, she decided to send Hayden a text message. Get a clue, Hayden. You and I are not a thing. Even if I divorce Carlos, I still wouldn't go back to you. Hayden, on the other hand, was still at the cafe. Debbie's message made him laugh. He could tell how angry she was now. What happened? Did he get pissed at you for meeting me? He replied. Debbie's reply came soon. None of your business. Just leave me alone. I don't want to see you again. Got it. Hayden giggled and thought. Deb is getting more and more adorable. Now that Debbie refused to get out of the car, the driver could only wait quietly. More than ten minutes had passed, but Carlo still didn't come back for her. Debbie was sad and dejected. What should I do? She mused. I guess I'd better get out of the car and get inside. Carlos has always been nice to me. I get why he's mad. If I were him and saw my wife with her ex, I would get mad too. She took a deep breath and got out of the car. She pushed the gate to the villa open and changed into her slippers. Just past the entryway, she saw something she couldn't accept. Carlos was having a talk with Valerie. Megan went down the stairs and ran towards him. She had already changed into clean clothes. Carlos caught and steadied Megan, and the latter held his waist tight. Uncle Carlos, you're back. I was so bored here. Damn it. You call him Uncle Carlos and act like his wife. Show some restraint. Debbie thought angrily. Instead of pushing Megan away, Carlos stroked her hair and offered, There's a party this evening. If you're bored, you can go. Megan raised her head and looked at Carlos asking, are you going to? Sensing Megan had no intention of letting go of him, Carlos pulled her away from him and answered, I need to work. You can ask Connie to go with you. Megan stole a defiant glance at Debbie, but Carlos didn't notice. Then she held his arm intimately and said, Uncle Carlos, I want you to come with me. But if you are busy, then I will stay home as well. Hayden told Debbie that Valerie wanted Megan to be Carlos' wife and it looked like he wasn't wrong. Valerie acted like Megan and Carlos were the most natural thing. Worse, she tried to create more opportunities for the two. Carlos, don't work yourself to death. You should spend more time with Megan. Just play hooky and go to the party with her. I thought Valerie and Megan would tell Carlos about my rude behavior, but they act as if nothing happened. That's really weird. Debbie thought to herself. I have a dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Smith this evening, said Carlos. He pulled his arm away from Megan and was about to walk back out to the car when he saw his wife standing at the entryway. Come here, he said coldly. Obediently, Debbie came over to Carlos and stood before Megan. Megan, do you remember what I said before? She asked. Since Valerie and Megan didn't mention what she had done earlier, Debbie wouldn't bring it up either. Megan was confused and had no idea what Debbie was talking about. With a tiny smile, Debbie began, Since you are Carlos' niece, you should keep him at arm's length. You shouldn't hug my husband tight like that. I might get angry. 
You get it. Debbie had made up her mind. Since they didn't care about her feelings at all, why should she care about theirs? Megan's face paled at Debbie's words. With red eyes, she lowered her head and apologized in a sad voice. Aunt Debbie, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I'll keep that in mind and stay away from Uncle Carlos. Please don't be mad at me. She put herself in such a low position anyone would think she was intimidated by Debbie. Valerie banged the table and shouted, Debbie Nien, this is how you treated Megan in Y City? Bullying her. Bullying her? Debbie couldn't believe her ears. She thought she needed to explain it. She took a deep breath and said calmly, Don't get me wrong. I know Megan's parents saved my husband's life. I take care of her like Carlos does. But Carlos is a married man. Don't you think she's being too flirty? Megan is family. Why should she not be so close to Carlos? Valerie snapped. Before Debbie could respond, Carlos held her hands and told her in a calm voice, Deb, Megan is just a kid with a lot of enthusiasm. You're overreacting. Let's go upstairs. An 18-year-old kid? With a lot of enthusiasm? She has a thing for you. Why can't you see it? Debbie retorted in her mind. With red eyes, Megan apologized again. Aunt Debbie, please don't be mad at me. If you're not happy, I will keep that in mind and stay away from Uncle Carlos. Debbie was fuming with rage. So you all think I'm the bad guy here? Fine. I'll be the black sheep. Debbie shook Carlos' hands off and walked up the stairs. He started after her. She suddenly turned around and shouted at him. Don't follow me. Leave me alone. Before Carlos could say anything, Megan stepped backwards as if she were intimidated by Debbie, and Valerie stood up from the couch. Debbie Nien, she shouted imperiously. Don't talk to my grandson that way. He's your husband. The husband is always right. The husband is always right? Debbie rolled her eyes secretly. This woman is positively medieval. She wanted to say something back. But on second thought, Valerie was Carlos' grandma, so she bit back the words she would like to have said. Putting his hands in his pockets, Carlos chimed in. Grandma, you're wrong. It's the 21st century, and a wife has as much power as her husband when it comes to family. Please stay out of it, Grandma. Megan, keep Grandma company. After saying that, he grabbed Debbie's hand and walked up the stairs. Although Debbie had lost her temper at him in front of his family, Carlos made his stand clear and defended her. Valerie couldn't believe her ears. Carlos used to be a proud man. I didn't expect him to defend such a rude woman. She grabbed her walking stick tighter. Women have as much power, she retorted. Only when she's from a family of equal social rank. What kind of family does she come from? A rich and powerful one. Ah, that's why no one in his family likes me, Debbie mused. Bitterness flooded her as she lowered her head to hold back her tears. Carlos was angered by Valerie's words. Despite the fact that he was still mad at his wife, he felt he should defend her against his own grandma, and he also felt he shouldn't have to. Debbie was his wife. He chose to love her, marry her, and spend his life with her. This was his choice, not his family's. And it was ridiculous to think that he didn't have a say in this. Why did they think they had a say, anyway? Carlos looked Valerie in the eye and said in a serious tone, You know what? I don't care if she has money or power. I love her. We had dated for a long time before she finally agreed to be with me. My wife is hot and doesn't love me for my money. If it weren't for the marriage certificate, she might have been another man's wife. Grandma, will you please stop poking your nose in my business? If Deb leaves me because of you, it will cost me a lot of time and energy to get her back. She's my one and only. Carlos just wanted his grandma to stay away from Debbie. He wanted to remind Valerie that even if she succeeded in driving Debbie away, he would by no means accept another woman as she wished. Valerie was exasperated. Pointing at Debbie with a shaking hand, she yelled, What's so good about her that you had to date her for a long time? Do you know what she did to me and Megan? She bullied us, and then went out on a date with another man. She's nothing but a hoe. She even has a lover in New York. How could you be so blind? She banged her stick on the floor. The sound reverberated in the living room. 
bullied Grandma and Megan? Impossible, thought Carlos. His eyes darkened as he said, Grandma, Debbie has always respected you. Bully you? Ah, and Megan, you just held my waist, right? Your Aunt Debbie just overreacted. She doesn't hate you. Grandma, please don't mess with my family. Debbie's anger vanished when she saw Carlos defend her like this. His words touched her heart deeply. Carlos felt Debbie brush his hand away and got confused. Before he could respond, Debbie walked towards Valerie, took a deep breath and said in a soft voice, I'm sorry, Grandma. Maybe I'm not the granddaughter-in-law you want, but I can assure you I love Carlos. A lot. I would never cheat on him. What's more, we've been married for more than three years. If you really hate to see us together, I'll try to not show any public displays of affection. Okay. Debbie decided to make peace with Valerie for Carlos' sake. He had done a lot for her, and she should do something in return. Maybe we got off on the wrong foot. When I first knew the Hua family didn't like me, I should have tried to make them like me instead of standing up to them, Debbie mused. Now that Debbie had already made a concession, Valerie didn't think she should press her luck. Otherwise, Carlos would think she was crazy. She decided to let Debbie go for now, and she would find a new way to deal with her. Sitting back on the couch, she snorted, saying nothing more. Debbie gave Valerie a smile and went back to Carlos. They went up the stairs, hand in hand. After they entered the bedroom, Carlos shut the door behind them and then walked to the study adjoining the bedroom. He opened his laptop and began to work, without saying a word to Debbie. What? I thought he wasn't mad anymore. Turns out I was wrong and he's still angry, Debbie thought. She sat on the bedside, wondering what she should do to cool him down. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in her mind. She entered the study quietly and sat on the couch. All of a sudden, she held her back with her right hand and cried, Arg, it hurts. My back. Carlos stopped typing and stood up. He strode towards her and asked anxiously, What's wrong? Your back hurts? Let me take you to the hospital. No. No. No need for that. I can handle it. No. I must take you to the hospital. He scooped her up in his arms and was about to leave. Debbie cuddled his neck and said quickly, Don't take me to the hospital. I just feel like I'm sprouting wings. Carlos stopped and looked at her in disbelief. His reaction amused Debbie, and she wanted to laugh out loud. But she knew he would get angry again if she did. So she said playfully, Honey, I've developing wings. Instead of putting her down, Carlos took her to the bed and threw her onto it. He began to strip off her clothes while saying, Well, I'd like to check how your wings are coming along. What kind of bird are you, anyway? Never mind, let's have fun finding it out. Carlos' words amused Debbie. She rolled on the bed and said, No need to check what kind of bird I am. I was a humble sparrow in the past. But after I got married to you, I became a shining phoenix. Carlos was in no mood to banter with her any longer. He needed to teach her a lesson in his own way. He pulled her into his arms and began to take off her clothes. Don't, Carlos. You are hurting me. Er, stop taking off my clothes. I was kidding. I don't have wings. Debbie's cries were so loud they traveled outside the bedroom. Why are you kissing my back? I said I didn't have wings. Shut up, Carlos demanded coldly. No, I know what you're trying to do. This is daytime and I'm not in the mood. Debbie knew more about Carlos after she had spent months with him. When he was mad at her, it would be torture to have sex with him. He would bang her like a stallion on steroids. Without stopping, Carlos said through gritted teeth, How could you meet your ex behind my back? And you were in his arms. Were you going to cheat on me? The more he thought about it, the angrier he became. Debbie shook her head immediately and tried to mollify him. I'm sorry. I was really, really wrong. I won't see him again. Please forgive me, old man. Old man? Who's old? When he held you in his arms, what did you call him? Mr. Goo? Hayden Goo? Hayden? Or honey? Debbie kept her mouth shut. Otherwise, she would be unable to hold back the impulse to yell back at him. What's wrong? Cat got your tongue? 
Did he do this? He asked, caressing her breasts. Carlos Hua, you're an ass. Aark, he didn't. He didn't do anything to me. Debbie struggled hard but to no avail. She was no match for Carlos' strength. Why was he still angry with her? Nothing happened and it was all Hayden's fault. Well, maybe not entirely true. She did agree to meet him, knowing that he still carried a torch for her. If she hadn't gone to meet with Hayden, Carlos wouldn't have been alerted, and he wouldn't have witnessed anything. She felt wronged. I gave my first kiss to Carlos. Why doesn't he believe me? After what felt like an eternity, Debbie lay in bed motionless. Her body was killing her. Carlos, however, was donning his clothes again. She couldn't understand why Carlos, an aloof CEO before the outsiders, would turn into a sex maniac when he was alone with her. Wah! Debbie burst into tears as she pointed at Carlos, who was now in a suit. We need separate bedrooms now. I can't stand it anymore. Carlos cast a cold glance at her and asked casually, Still want to argue? I guess I need to bang you more so that you won't have the energy. Debbie shook her head immediately and covered her face with the quilt. No, no, no. I'm not going to argue with you. Just go to work. When Carlos descended the stairs and entered the living room, Valerie was sitting on the couch, watching TV. When she saw Carlos, she snorted and snapped. It's the middle of the day. What were you thinking? Even the servants heard her cry. What are you, a sex fiend? Without slowing his pace, Carlos said, Grandma, I know you already have a great grandson, and you may not want another, but I'm dying to be a father. Great grandson? Of course I want another great grandson, Valerie retorted inwardly. She had a great grandson, her eldest son Wade's grandson, who was a junior middle school student. The boy had a fight with his father, Fraser and went to his maternal grandpa's home to celebrate the new year. Brooks, Wade's second son, had some health problems and had no sons or daughters. Louis, Wade's third son, was a playboy and hadn't gotten married yet. She really wished that Carlos, son of her youngest son James, could have a baby. But she didn't want the baby's mother to be Debbie. After Carlos left, Valerie turned off the TV and began to ponder on how she could drive Debbie out of the Hua family. When Debbie woke up again, it was already dark outside. She struggled out of bed and went to the bathroom to take a bath. Her jaw dropped when she saw herself in the mirror. She was black and blue all over. That asshole. He was worse than a dog in heat. She cursed inwardly. Despite the anger, she didn't dare curse him to his face. The next morning, she didn't wake up until noon. She readied herself and took a deep breath. Once more unto the breach she thought, echoing the speech in the classic play. She had to steal herself every time she was together with that family. She went down the stairs to have lunch. Much to her surprise, no one in the Hua family was hostile to her. After lunch, she went back to her room. Did Valerie decide to make peace with me after I stood up to her? Thank God. Finally, she thought. In the afternoon, Miranda invited her to come along and visit Carlos' grandpa in the hospital. Miranda and Debbie had no common interests, so they didn't chat on the way. The old man was still in a coma. After that, Miranda asked the driver to send Debbie back to the Hua family's manor, and she herself hailed a taxi and went off to work. Debbie was really confused. Why did she invite me to visit grandpa? I mean, it's normal to visit him, but it's not normal for us to visit him together. We barely know each other. Despite the confusion, Debbie didn't ask Miranda for an answer. She went back home obediently. When she arrived at the manor, Valerie was taking a stroll with Megan. They saw Debbie and looked away as if she were invisible. Debbie greeted Valerie out of politeness, but she didn't respond. Debbie went back to the bedroom and felt something was not right. This is weird. It's like the calm before the storm. Is Valerie planning something behind my back? Debbie mused, and she was right. After supper, Valerie asked everyone to sit down in the living room. She even called Carlos back from work. He wasn't finished, but he did as she asked anyway. Since Debbie had been caught seeing Hayden, Carlos had been terribly cool towards her. When he entered the living room and saw the family waiting for him, 
He came up to Debbie and sat next to her naturally. Since Carlos was now here, Valerie cleared her throat and began, Debbie, I heard your academic performance was not good. Debbie was confused. What? Is she going to yell at me in front of everyone or something? She thought to herself. With a mocking smile, Valerie continued, I don't care whether you're a bad student or not, but I won't have a thief as a granddaughter-in-law. Your behavior has brought shame on the Hua family. A thief? What do you mean? Debbie couldn't believe her ears. Valerie said with a cold smile, Ever since you set foot in this house, things have gone missing. I lost a string of Buddhist prayer beads. Megan lost a limited edition lipstick. And Miranda lost a limited edition handbag. Debbie finally got it. So you think I stole them? I don't think. I know, said Valerie firmly. Debbie was at a loss whether to laugh or to cry. Taking a deep breath, she defended herself by saying, Grandma, you may not know it, but your grandson treats me very well. He's given me a ton of precious gifts. Each of them is much more expensive than your string of beads. As for Megan's lipstick, your grandson built a lipstick laboratory for me. Well, Aunt Miranda's limited edition handbag might be valuable, but use your head. Your grandson provides for me quite nicely. Why would I need to steal anything? Pride was written all over Debbie's face. Not until now did she realize that Carlos had given a lot to her, and she felt so grateful. With knitted eyebrows, Carlos stared at his grandmother and said angrily, Debbie may be a bad student, Grandma, but she's better than that. Quit trying to frame her. Valerie scowled at him and snapped back. I'm not lying. Before she came here, we never lost anything. She must be the thief. Besides, she always tries to bully Megan. If I hadn't been with Megan, this woman would have probably beaten her. She eats too much. She's lazy and doesn't respect her elders. She doesn't wake up until noon. What's worse, she even cheated on you. Carlos, I won't accept this woman as my granddaughter-in-law. Debbie was shocked at Valerie's words. She never imagined she thought so low of her. Bitterness flooded her at this moment. She had done so much housework to please Valerie, but she thanked her by calling her a thief. I don't give a rat's ass what they think of me, but I do care about. Carlos' opinion. Does he think of me like that too? She thought to herself. She didn't dare to look Carlos in the eye, as she was afraid that she would see disappointment glinting there. Carlos leaned against the couch, his face deadpan. When he heard Valerie's accusations against his wife, he held Debbie's hand and began to play with it. Debbie was left speechless. What's he doing? I thought we weren't on speaking terms. Is he trying to defend me? Or is he only doing this to save face? Just when Debbie was lost in her own thoughts, Carlos spoke in a cold voice. I don't know why you think of her that way, Grandma, but she's a good girl. You just won't give her a chance. You said she had bullied Megan. If she really wanted to do that, she would have beaten her up whether you were there or not. See any bruises? No. So you just overreacted. Valerie's face turned livid. Ignoring her, Carlos continued after a short pause. You said she didn't respect her elders. In my eyes, she always treats our family members with the utmost respect. You guys, on the other hand, are shitty to her. She doesn't wake up until noon? Well, she suffers from jet lag. And it's my fault. She's up until the small hours because of me. If you do mind that, I'll try to let her get to sleep earlier. She cheated on me? I already explained it and I don't want to talk about it anymore. You said she stole things? Haha. <laughs> you must be kidding. My wife would never want your cheap things. Disdain could be seen in Carlos' eyes. A myriad of emotions flooded Debbie at this moment. She was so moved by Carlos she wanted to cry. She didn't think she was good enough to catch his eye, but he treated her like the most precious thing in his life. Valerie was too angry to utter a single word. After a long time, she finally cooled down a little and asked in a sad voice, Carlos, how did she bewitch you? Why are you going on like this? Because she's my wife, Carlos replied. Don't you think you're focused on the wrong person? How about Megan or Stephanie? But why Debbie? She's a thief and a cheater. James thundered, as he couldn't bear Carlos' attitude any longer. Stephanie? Who's that? 
Debbie thought to herself. Carlos stood up from the couch and dragged Debbie along with him. Don't call me out of work again and then run this, this circus. I'm super busy and I don't have the time to deal with stupid shit. As for your lost things, I'll have my people look into it. And you, Grandma, you need to apologize to her once the air is clear. Then he and Debbie went up the stairs hand in hand. No one dared to stop them. Valerie hadn't expected things to go down like this. She thought once she said Debbie was a thief, Carlos would get angry and hate Debbie. But it turned out she was wrong. The moment they entered the bedroom, Carlos told Debbie, I still have work in New York and we can't go back to Y City now. If you don't feel happy here, how about we move out? After she thought about it a bit, Debbie shook her head. We're going back to Y City in a few days. Why go to the trouble? I'll go out for the day while you're at work. She decided to keep herself away from Valerie as much as possible. Then she fell into his strong arms, and she could smell his cologne. With dark eyes, Carlos asked, Go out? Is Hayden Goose still around? Debbie got a headache thanks to Carlos' words. I thought he forgot about Hayden. Turns out I was wrong. I don't know whether he's still here or not. It has nothing to do with me. I'm not going out to see him. Let me guess you don't want me to go out, do you? You want to ground me. With a snort, Carlos released her and warned, I don't want to find out that you pulled something like you did with Hayden again. Sticking out her tongue, Debbie teased. Fine. I won't tell you. The next moment, she was scooped up and thrown onto the bed. Trying to piss me off? He asked in a hoarse voice as his hand began to stroke her waist. Debbie went rigid. It was just a joke. I'm sorry, honey. She apologized immediately. Carlos stood up, adjusted his clothes, took out his phone and dialed a number. It's me, Carlos. A number of things have gone missing in the Hua family's manner. I trust you can look into this. Debbie turned over on her stomach on the bed, looking at Carlos with pitiful eyes. After he hung up the phone, she asked in a low voice, Carlos, do you really believe I didn't do it? Carlos undid his tie and cast a sidelong glance at her. I know my woman well, he said shortly. Debbie was so touched that she stood up and jumped at Carlos. He caught her and held her tight. She kissed him repeatedly on both his cheeks. I love you so much, honey. His heart softened, but he managed to maintain a poker face. Don't try to fool me. I will always remember what you did behind my back. Why does he sound like I cheated on him? Debbie cursed in her mind. What a petty man, she grumbled, pouting her lips. Petty, he repeated. No, no, no. You misheard me. You're so handsome that I arg. Don't bite me. I was wrong. My husband is the most wonderful man in the world. Deep inside, she began to curse. Carlos Hua, I swear I'll make you stand barefoot on a porcupine. In the Gu family's house of Y City, Portia was on a phone call on the balcony of the living room, taking in the snow-covered landscape. Tell me why all my activities have been canceled. It took me a long time to set them up. And now you're telling me that all of them have been canceled. What on earth is going on? She shouted angrily into the phone. What? I thought Lightshade Entertainment was going to sign me after the new year. Why did they decide against it all of a sudden? Who replaced me? Portia yelled into her phone. What? Don't tell me you don't know. Mr. Zhang? Emmett Zhang. Could he be behind this? Portia suddenly stopped shouting when the person on the other end of the line said something. I didn't expect a little assistant to be so resourceful. She murmured in disbelief. All her commercials and modeling contracts had been canceled. What was more, Lightshade Entertainment also decided not to sign her. After hanging up, Portia went back into the living room and threw her phone onto the couch. It bounced obligingly among the cushions before landing again, finally still. Hayden had just come back from New York and entered the house, overcoat in hand. Portia trotted up to him and asked anxiously, Hayden, you're friends with the CEO of Lightshade Entertainment, right? Hayden was about to take a warm bath after a long journey. He didn't miss a beat and asked in reply, Yeah, I am. What's up? Then call your friend and ask him why he didn't sign me. 
Lightshade Entertainment was the leading international company in the entertainment industry in Y City. It was Porsche's dream to be an entertainer of that company. With Hayden's help, the CEO of Lightshade Entertainment had agreed to sign Porsche after the New Year celebrations were done. But Porsche's assistant had just called and told her that all her commercials and modeling contracts had been canceled and Lightshade Entertainment had decided not to sign her. Really? Hayden asked as he stopped and turned to look at Portia. But why? Portia's eyes reddened. She took a deep breath and said in a choked voice, I don't know either. Don't worry. I'm calling my friend now. Hayden took out his phone and dialed a number. He hung up inside two minutes. He stared at his sister and was lost in his own thoughts, saying nothing. Portia was impatient. Hayden, what did he say? Have you seen Debbie recently? He asked. Before Portia could respond, a sharp voice chipped in. Hayden, why talk about that bitch? Are you really that hung up on her? You want to piss me off, don't you? Why did you suddenly go to New York? You should have stayed and celebrated the new year with us. Hayden turned around to see Blanche walking down the stairs, clad in a nightgown. Fury was written all over her face. Ignoring her questions, Hayden repeated his question. Have you seen her? Yes, Portia nodded, and wondered whether it had something to do with Emmett. Hayden had long known that Portia couldn't stand Debbie, but he hadn't taken it seriously before. He didn't want to be caught between his sister and his beloved woman but maybe he should have. A niggling doubt tickled the back of his brain. He wondered if it wasn't so much about Portia, but instead his last liaison with Debbie. Carlos seemed like he was okay with it, but what if he wasn't? Now that Hayden knew that Debbie was Carlos' wife, he thought he'd better remind his sister. Portia, Debbie isn't a doormat now. Don't mess with her. Just be nice to her for my sake, okay? Of course Portia would not listen. There was no way she'd buy this. Why should I be nice to her? Hayden, I don't care if you still like her or not. You've gone too far, she said in a cold voice. Yes, her husband is Carlos' assistant. So what? I don't give a damn about that, she thought. Blanche pointed at Hayden and yelled at the top of her lungs, Debbie Nien, Debbie Nien, what's so good about her that you've carried a torch for her for so many years? Hayden, you are now the CEO of the Goo Group. You need to marry a woman from a family of equal status. That bitch doesn't deserve you. Mom is right, Hayden. Just forget that woman, Portia echoed. She never liked Debbie, and she would do everything to make Hayden hate her. Her efforts came to naught, of course. While Debbie was a perfect vision, the woman of his dreams, these women just came off as hateful and wrong. They just didn't know Debbie like he did. She was a delicate flower, a gleaming jewel to be plucked, and the best thing that ever happened to him. They just couldn't accept that. Unable to stand it anymore, Hayden said to Portia, You pissed Debbie off the last time you saw her, and now her husband is avenging her. After saying that, he turned around and walked up the stairs. Although Portia had thought of this possibility before, she still couldn't believe her ears. Emmett is just an assistant. How was he able to do that to me? I see. Maybe he mentioned this to Mr. Hua, and Mr. Hua did all of this. Blanche then noticed something was not right with her daughter. She held Portia's hands and asked anxiously, What happened? Your face is so pale. After a long time, Portia finally came back to her senses. She looked at Blanche in the eye and murmured, Mom, all my commercials and modeling contracts have been canceled and Lightshade Entertainment decided not to sign me. Why? Blanche raised her voice and her face changed dramatically. The commercials and modeling contracts were very important to Portia and determined her future in the entertainment circle. Blanche had even flaunted her daughter's achievements before other rich ladies at a tea party the other day. If Portia was unable to sign with Lightshade Entertainment, Blanche would have made a fool of herself. Emmett Zhong is avenging Debbie Nian, Portia said through gritted teeth. Debbie Nian, you thought you were something after marrying Emmett Zhong, huh? How could you do this to me? Portia cursed inwardly. Blanche's face twitched with anger. What? That bitch again? How dare she? She thinks she can do anything she wants just because of Emmett Zhong. 
He's only an assistant. Bah. I swear I will beat her to a pulp. A light bulb went off in Portia's head. Mom, please get me in touch with Carlos Hua, she said. What for? Blanche asked in confusion. Looking Blanche in the eye, Portia said with determination, I'm going to be his woman. That was the only way she could step on Debbie and teach her a hard lesson that she would never forget. No. Don't you know Mr. Hua is married? You're not going to be anyone's mistress, Blanche snapped. There was no way that would end well. Men made endless promises to their mistresses about how they'd divorce their wives and marry them. They rarely did, and if the mistresses got pregnant, well, that was all over. Portia was not willing to be an ordinary man's mistress. However, Carlos Hua was not an ordinary man. Being his mistress was much better than being an ordinary man's wife. Portia said in a calm voice, Mom, I don't think Carlos Hua loves his wife. Otherwise, he wouldn't have kept her a secret from the public. He has gone to parties with Olga a couple times. Besides, he walked out of the hotel with a college girl last time, and I'm sure that wasn't Olga. See, he has so many women. Men are all unfaithful. And Carlos is no exception. Have you ever heard of the daughters of the prominent families in Y City getting married? No. Of course, Carlos' wife is not from a powerful family. Do you think I can't drive Mrs. Hua out of the Hua family and replace her? Um. Blanche hesitated. She had to admit that Portia had a point, but she was afraid that people might gossip behind her back. After all, it would be disgraceful if Portia was a mistress. Portia knew what was on her mother's mind. Mom, don't worry. I don't think people would gossip about me. Carlos is so rich and powerful, nobody will trash talk him or his woman. After I become his woman, our family will be more respected. After I become Mrs. Hua, I'll ask him to fire Emmett Zhong. She swore to herself. Blanche had been thinking of marrying her daughter to Carlos instead of Louis. Despite being the general manager of ZL Group's New York branch, Louis wielded little power in the company. But the truth was, Carlos had turned this offer down without hesitation. Left with no other option, she then decided to marry Portia to Louis. After all, Louis was Carlos' cousin. The Gu family could still benefit from an association with Carlos. Portia's explanations made Blanche feel better about her plan. She was still wary, but Portia seemed logical about this. But it's not easy to get close to Mr. Hua, she said to her daughter. I know. From now on I'll work harder to stand out. You and Dad can try your best to get me the invitations of the parties, dinners, and commercial activities Carlos will attend, said Portia. She had been trying to be a better woman all the time. It used to be just for show, but now it was for Carlos. She understood that only an exceptional woman deserved to stand by him. In New York, the next morning, some professionals came to the Hua's house to investigate the case involving the missing items. Debbie just wanted to get out of there, so she left the house with Carlos without asking the men anything. She felt much better after wandering around and having some fun. When the sun started to set, it was time to go back. She wanted to find Carlos to go home together with him, but then she learned that he wasn't in the office, so she had to head home alone. Since it was late, she ate dinner outside. When she went back inside, not a single soul was around. The chandelier in the living room had been switched off. Only some dim wall fittings in the hallway were on. The place was almost eerie now. Debbie paused. She could almost hear ghosts, but she wasn't sure what it was. The shadows on the walls did little to dispel the unsettling feeling. She peered into the gloom, trying to see into adjoining areas, but had little luck. She changed into slippers at the vestibule. Just as she walked into the living room, some noises startled her. This wasn't her imagination this time. Debbie looked towards the sound. A shadow was descending the staircase, trying to be stealthy. Debbie swiftly hid herself behind the shoe cabinet and watched. It was a man she was sure of it. And the man seemed to be. At the corner of the stairs, he knocked over a potted plant but was quick enough to catch it. He looked around carefully. Seeing that no one was around, he moved on. Debbie followed him cautiously. To her surprise, the man walked towards the storage room she had cleaned. 
He walked into the room and locked it from inside after looking left and right shiftily. Pressed against the wall, Debbie walked quietly to the door of the storage room and listened carefully as she held her breath. Someone was talking. Too bad she couldn't hear clearly. But one thing was clear. There was a woman inside. Debbie had a nasty feeling something bad was going to happen. Sure enough, obscene moans hit her ears shortly afterwards. Crap. Why do I have to be the one to find out about this? Debbie thought in frustration. The two inside were getting noisier. Debbie covered her ears and started to walk back to the living room. She felt bad about the storage room. It had taken her a couple of hours to clean it, and now it was used to sneak some nuki. As soon as she reached the living room, Louis spotted her. His sudden appearance scared the life out of her. He trotted over to Debbie excitedly and said loudly, Deb, Deb, you're home. I came downstairs to grab a can of pop. He was so loud. Debbie had to cover his mouth with her hand and drag him aside. Shoo, keep your voice down. The others are sleeping. Do you want to wake everybody up? Louis' eyes narrowed into thin lines as he stroked Debbie's hand with a grin. Debbie let him go immediately and smacked his head. Touch me again and I'll gut you like a fish, she warned. Louis asked with a goofy smile. Deb, did you come home alone? Where's Carlos? He isn't home yet. Reluctant to talk to him, Debbie wiped her hand on his clothes and went upstairs. Louis watched her and swallowed hard. Louis, why are you even here? A man's voice asked casually. It seemed he was coming from where the storage room was. Louis turned to him and looked behind him. I came down to get a pop. But Uncle James, why did you come that way? James smiled. Oh, I came down to get a glass of water, but then I had to answer the call of nature, so I went to the bathroom first. The bathroom and the storage room on the first floor were the same way. So Louis didn't think anything of it and went to the kitchen. James looked upstairs while pouring himself some water. He asked, Who were you talking to? Oh, it was... It was Debbie. Louis intended to say Deb but changed it, considering it sounded a little too intimate. James' face fell when he heard that. Oh, what did she come down for? He asked, pretending to look at Louis casually. Louis wasn't buying it. The old man couldn't conceal his contempt for his daughter-in-law. He was tense too. I don't know. When I saw her, she was coming that way. Louis pointed to the bathroom after he closed the refrigerator door. Thinking that James had just come from the bathroom, he added, Since you were in the bathroom, maybe she had been to the storage room. Except for the bathroom and storage room, all the rooms on the first floor were guest rooms. James lost his cool when the storage room was mentioned. Did she say why she went there? Louis was confused. He shook his head and wondered. No, she didn't. Uncle James, what's wrong? You look nervous. Realizing he was overreacting, James forced a smile. Nothing. Just curious. You know some things have gone missing in this house recently. We all should be more careful. James thought about it for a while and an idea popped in his head. Carlos won't be back for a while. Why don't you go to her ask her why she went there? And tell her not to wander around. It looks suspicious as all hell. All Louis heard were Carlos won't be back for a while and go to Debbie's room. He swallowed and nodded immediately. Sure, Uncle James. I'll tell her. A trace of contempt appeared in James's eyes as he found out how horny Lewis looked when it came to Debbie. He concealed his emotions and suggested, Let's go upstairs. Yes, Uncle James. Lewis took a huge gulp of soda and followed him. As soon as they left the living room, a figure snuck out of the storage room, left by the back door, and walked towards the servants' quarters. Once she was back in her bedroom, Debbie wondered if she should tell Carlos about the disgraceful affair she had discovered. Should she pretend nothing happened or tell Carlos the truth? If she kept her mouth shut, she would feel bad about keeping something this big from him. But if she said anything, surely the matter would turn the house upside down like a torpedo. She had started thinking about the question the minute she walked in. She thought about it during shower. She thought about it when she was brushing her teeth. After being mentally tortured by the question for more than half an hour, she felt like she was having a meltdown. Oh, whatever. She finally gave up and pushed the thought aside. 
Lying in bed, she started reading updates on Weibo. That was much more fun. She typed the name Carlos Hua in the search bar and saw all the news about him. Most posts were focused on his marriage. The night deed penned. It was 11 p.m., and yet Carlos was still now back. Mr. Hora, honey, when are you coming home? She couldn't help asking him in a text. But there was no reply. She waited for about five minutes. Then she texted him again. Don't work too late. I'm waiting for you to tuck in, honey. It was midnight, but Debbie still hadn't heard from Carlos. Before long, she drifted off. In the dead of the night, someone opened the door to her bedroom silently. That someone walked in stealthily and glanced around the room. The fragrance in the air filled his nose. He sniffed greedily. In her sleep, Debbie felt that mysterious figure slip into her bed. Assuming that it was her husband, she didn't open her eyes and held him tightly. Honey, finally you're back, she muttered. Without a word, the man tried to kiss her lips, but Debbie happened to slide down a little, so he kissed her hair instead. She opened her eyes a little and found the room was completely dark. Unable to see anything, she closed her eyes again and snuggled into the man's arms. Mr. Handsome, did you just take a shower? You smell good. Is that new cologne? The scent was a bit strong. The man didn't answer. He turned over and threw himself on top of her. Sensing what he was about to do, Debbie woke up. No, Mr. Handsome, I'm good. I'm still sore from last time. Wait, something's wrong, Debbie realized. This doesn't feel right. The weight and scent are both wrong. Debbie's eyes snapped open. She reached for the lamp on the nightstand, fumbling with the switch. Her eyes widened in shock when she saw the man's face. Angry, she pushed him off of her forcefully, and the man was dumped unceremoniously onto the lushly carpeted floor. Ow! Damn it! What's wrong? He howled. Debbie straightened her pajamas quickly. Usually she slept naked, but tonight she had been so sleepy that she had dozed off in pajamas. Lucky for her, otherwise he would have felt something he had no right to. This man was no Carlos. Indeed, he could never match up to that powerful, handsome presence. Instead, this guy would forever be in Carlos' shadow, no matter where Carlos was at the time. She jumped off the bed and grabbed Louis ear furiously. How dare you sneak into my room? Ouch! Easy, easy. Carlos is always busy. I was worried about you. I thought you might be lonely, so I came in to give you some love. Ah. Before Louis could finish his words, Debbie released his ear and gave him a hard scissor kick in the chest. This guy just walked into my room, devil may care, even though most of the others are here. They all think I'm a pushover, don't they? Debbie thought to herself. Little did she know that someone had snapped a picture of her and Louis earlier and sent it to Carlos. When Carlos got the picture, he was on his way home. His face darkened instantly. Drive as fast as you can. He ordered the driver sternly. Yes, Mr. Hua. At that moment, they were already near the manor. A couple of minutes later, they arrived at the house. Before the driver could reach the door and open it for him, Carlos already got out of the car and strode into the house quickly and purposefully. He was fully enraged. The second floor was supposed to be quiet with everyone deep in sleep. However, right now, each room was bright with the lights on. His family were crowded in the hallway at the door of a room, everyone in nightwear. Everyone heard the commotion. What's going on? Carlos demanded. Spotting him, they all made way for him. With everyone out of his way, now Carlos could see clearly. Louis was lying on the floor, cupping his face. Beside him was Debbie with a coat draped around her shoulders. Her eyes reddened as soon as she saw Carlos. The elders of the Hua family had scolded her harshly without listening to her explanation. Carlos was the only one that could provide her with comfort right now. But she didn't move. She was waiting for him to go near her. Carlos was stone-faced. Louis was too afraid to lift his head. James, on the other hand, thundered. What shameful behavior! She's a disgrace to this family. Carlos, look what your wife did. Trying to bed your cousin while you weren't home. We wouldn't have known, but they were too loud. This is the woman you've been protecting. How can we ever show our faces anywhere if word gets out? 
Louis got to his feet and looked fearfully at Carlos. See Carlos, Debbie. She told me that. You weren't home tonight and asked me to. To see come to her room. And so I did. With a hideous face, Valerie berated. You married well this time. God, what a whore. Even though your father and I don't approve of your marriage, you still take her side. No one else said anything. Some were too scared to speak, others were too angry like Miranda. She looked at Louis with a livid expression on her face, as if she wanted to beat him to death right now. If looks could kill, Louis would have been a smoldering corpse. Carlos walked towards Louis, stood in front of him, and then without a word, sent him flying to the wall with a heavy kick. The beaten man screamed painfully. The others gaped at the sight. Worried about Louis, Valerie panicked. What are you doing? Why hit Louis? It's your wife who did this. Not responding, Carlos grabbed Louis by the collar and gave him two heavy blows to the face. The disgusting man's squeals pierced the air, and blood covered his whole front side, red, wet, sticky, all gushing from his broken nose and ruined lips. Both Fraser and James walked over to Carlos to calm him down. Carlos, chill. Carlos brushed them aside, took off his coat, and threw it to Debbie, who had been stunned into a trance by his sudden outburst. She caught his coat reflexively. Louis fell onto the floor, but Carlos lifted him up and punched him again. Now Carlos' fists were covered with the pathetic loser's blood. Some of it flecked onto Carlos' clothing as well. He appeared to pay no mind to that fact. Everyone panicked. Since he couldn't stop Carlos, James suddenly stalked towards Debbie and slapped her hard across the face. Focused on Carlos, Debbie didn't see the slap coming. Her cheek was burning. Her ear rang. Everyone froze at the sound of the heavy smack. Even Valerie hadn't expected James to hit a woman. Realizing that it was Debbie who had been hit, Carlos balled his hands into fists. The red slap mark he saw felt like it was on his own face. His eyes flamed as if they would catch on fire any minute. James had never seen his son this angry. He was afraid and regretted slapping Debbie immediately, but he summoned up his courage and managed to argue. Your slutty wife cheated on you with your cousin. She's no daughter-in-law of mine. She's a femme fatale and should be kicked out of this house. As soon as the middle-aged man finished his sentence, Carlos dashed towards him raised his fist and smashed it against his face while the others screamed in shock. Carlos! He's your father! In tears, Tabitha blocked the second blow by standing in front of James. Carlos looked at James as if there were decades of hatred between them. He pulled Tabitha away and swung his fist again. Dizzy, James slumped onto the floor and had difficulty getting up. Wade and his other two sons tried to stop Carlos but failed because Carlos was far different than the man he had been seconds earlier. How do you stop a force of nature? Seeing so many people had failed to stop Carlos, Megan thought she'd give it a shot. She approached him and tried to talk him out of it, but she only got one single tug at his sleeve before she herself was pushed away. The push was so fierce she stumbled backwards to the wall. Holding her injured arm, she stood there and didn't dare to take another step towards the enraged man. By now the house was a total mess. Everything was in disarray. The potted plant was tipped over, and dirt spilled onto the carpet. The little decorative table was knocked over, and the knickknacks it once held were all over the floor. Pools of blood stained the carpet darkly in places where Carlos' victims had bled. Even the wall hangings were knocked crooked. This was the worst anyone had ever seen the place but anyone who might want to try and clean up the place was held in check by Carlos' white-hot rage. Tabitha walked to Debbie and pulled her arm. The young woman was still at a loss. Caught off guard, she staggered and managed to steady herself by pressing her hand against the wall. This is all your fault. Everything was okay before you married him. But look what's happening now. Because of you, Carlos is beating his own father. What kind of monster have you turned him into? That brought Debbie to her senses. She handed Carlos' coat to Connie, trotted over to him, and grabbed his raised hand, now balled into a fist, covered with blood both fresh and congealing. Carlos, Carlos, please stop. He's your father. She sobbed. The madman regained his sanity when he heard her cries. 
Carlos, listen to me. There's nothing wrong with elders scolding their kids. Please don't hit him again, okay? Valerie was so angry she could barely stand. Even though Fraser and Gloria were supporting her on either side, she pounded on the floor with her cane and shouted, Sinful! This is utterly sinful! Carlos, he's your father! How could you do this? Carlos glanced at the others nonchalantly and ignored all of them. He pulled Debbie closer to him and asked, Does it still hurt? That was the second sentence he had said the whole evening. Shaking her head, Debbie answered, No. Let's go to our room. Your room. Valerie walked over and glared at Debbie. Debbie Nian, you saw it yourself. Not that we don't welcome you, but you ruined the peace in this family. It seemed true. Debbie forced her tears back and apologized. I'm sorry. As soon as the words came out, Carlos squeezed her hand. Valerie gazed at her grimly. I don't need your apology. I'm sure you've shaved years off my life. Divorce Carlos if you're not trying to make me die soon. Divorce. Debbie's heart twisted into a knot. Here's what you do. Call the lawyer. Now, ask him to write up the divorce papers. As long as you sign the papers without making a fuss, we may consider paying you alimony. Debbie was lost for words. Carlos pulled her behind him protectively and confronted the old lady. Since when does any of you get to make decisions about my marriage, Grandma? Valerie met his eyes. Carlos, you used to be loyal to the family, but now you disrespect me again and again all because of this woman. You hit Louis. You hit your father. I won't allow this woman to confuse you anymore. Carlos sneered. You're the confused one. Who has been stirring shit up ever since Debbie got here? You know Louis as well I do. Do you really think this is Debbie's fault? Dad shouldn't have hit Debbie. He should be thankful he is my dad. Otherwise, I would have cut his arm off. You protect your son and I'm just trying to protect my wife. What's wrong with that? Carlos, you. Valerie was too furious to go on. Carlos glanced at the others and declared, Debbie and I will never get divorced, never. All of you just forget about it because you'll only be disappointed. We're only living here because we want to keep my mom company. But now it seems it's not necessary. My mom's willing to take insults lying down. But there is no way that I'll let my wife become somebody's doormat. Debbie and I are moving out. With that, he took Debbie's hand and started walking towards the stairs. Carlos. Carlos Hua. Watching her grandson's cold figure, Valerie wanted to ask him to stay. However, Carlos only quickened his pace. He didn't want to be there a minute longer than he had to be. If this was the way they were going to treat his wife, he didn't want any part of it. When they came to the landing, he suddenly stopped and said to the others, And my wife isn't a thief either. My men figured out it wasn't her. Grandma, keep an eye on your dog. Valerie kept a medium-sized dog. She would let him play and run around in the manor at regular times. Is the dog responsible? They all wondered. A car was parked at the entrance to the house. Before getting in, Debbie suddenly stopped. Carlos looked back at her. Maybe I should move out. You can stay here. Carlos affectionately pulled the coat draped on her shoulders closer to her. You think I'll agree to that? I, Uncle Carlos. A ringing voice interrupted Debbie. They both turned their head. In the dim light, they could see Megan running towards them like a butterfly. She threw herself into Carlos' arms and started crying. Uncle Carlos, please don't go. I don't want you to go. Boo hoo. Carlos disentangled himself and comforted her. We're leaving for Y City in three days. Take care of my grandma for me. Uncle Carlos, I want to stay with you. Don't leave me alone. Can I go with you? Uncle Carlos, Aunt Debbie, please. Megan's crying was too real. Tears streamed down her face. Her voice was hoarse from grief. For a moment, even Debbie almost believed her. She was worried that Carlos would go soft and agree to take the vicious girl with them. Then she would have to not only cry but also bleed inside. Carlos took Debbie to the car and said, Wait for me inside. It's cold out here. It was indeed cold outside. Debbie got in the car and sat by the window. Nonetheless, as soon as Carlos closed the door, 
Megan embraced him again and sobbed. Uncle Carlos, I know you think I'll get in the way if I stay with you and Aunt Debbie. Besides, Aunt Debbie doesn't like me. But you know what? I don't like her either because she stole you. Uncle Carlos, I've liked you since the day you took me in. Her declaration of love caught Carlos off guard. His brows knitted. I was going to tell you on my 18th birthday, but that day you told me you were married. Uncle Carlos, can you imagine how heartbroken I was? I like you so much, but you married someone else. Words failed Carlos. He was always resolute and cold when he handled things with the women that were obsessed with him. Debbie used to be the only exception. But now there was Megan. Megan, listen up, he said seriously. Yes, Megan nodded, her eyes and nose red. I love your Aunt Debbie, and she is my one and only. I only love her. Do you understand? Carlos' ruthless refusal was a shock to Megan. She felt as if she'd been struck by a thunderbolt. Her face turned pale. Uncle Carlos, don't you like me at all? Her lips trembled. I like you, but that's not love. I see you as family. Megan couldn't take it. This was not what she had expected. She took a few steps back while shaking her head in disbelief. No, no. Uncle Carlos, you are always so good to me. You love me. I know you do. Carlos sighed deeply. Megan, listen to me. He tried to calm her down, but in the end, Megan's illness reared its head again. She slumped onto the ground, gasping for air. Carlos closed his eyes tightly in resignation, scooped her up, and started walking towards the house. Sitting in the car, Debbie watched her husband carry another woman in his arms all the way to the manor. That wasn't what she wanted, not even what she needed. She was hoping to get away from all this, away from Carlos' family, away from creepy Louis, who had plucked the straw that broke the camel's back. From judgmental Valerie and James, two oldsters who didn't like her because her family wasn't rich, because there was no advantage for them if Carlos stayed married to her. They even suggested she divorce Carlos. A couple of minutes later, Mr. Handsome himself called her. She slid her finger along the screen of the phone to take the call but didn't speak. Honey, I'll get my assistant to drive you to the villa first. Megan is sick. I can't leave right now. I'll be there as soon as possible. Debbie smiled bitterly. There was little she could say. After a while, she replied gently, Okay, but you have worked all day. Take care of yourself. Carlos was exhausted. Debbie's tender words were the cure for everything. He smiled. Okay, just rest when you get there. Don't stay up late. Got it. Bye, honey. Bye. The car stopped in front of a white villa. Debbie had expected to see an empty house. But when she got out of the car, she could see lights were on inside the house through the windows. She assumed Carlos must have told someone to turn the lights on for her. Carlos' assistant led her inside. Two maids were waiting for her. Good evening, Mrs. Hua. They greeted her with a bow at the main entrance. Debbie nodded with a smile and asked, Is the room ready? Yes, Mrs. Hua. The room is upstairs. Please follow me. Thank you. It was already past midnight. Debbie was tired and was in no mood to tour the villa. She plopped onto the bed as soon as she walked into the bedroom. She just wanted to become one with the night, close her eyes, and forget the events of the past few days. She could swear that the Hua family members were trying to drive her mad. Fortunately, she was made of sterner stuff than that. But now she was just exhausted. Her eyes had already started to close when the maid drew close and started to speak. Mrs. Hua, Mr. Hua asked us to prepare this for you. Please move closer so that I can apply the ice, she said quietly. Apparently the maid followed her inside the room holding a tray in her hands. She was too tired to notice. Okay, thank you, Debbie agreed. Actually, her face didn't hurt much right now, but she was too weary to speak much or do anything. Her head was full of thoughts. She just lay there and let the maid do her job. The things that had happened tonight hit her like a ton of bricks. Only the dull pain in her face reminded her it was all too real. Was the Hua family too mean or was I a lousy daughter-in-law? Maybe both. Carlos hit Louis and James because of me. I was so moved by that. But then I saw Megan in his arms. 
and he isn't home yet. Oh God, this is so frustrating and stressful, she thought. She took the towel and ice from the maid's hands. Go to sleep. I can do it myself, she told the maid. After the maid left the room, Debbie placed the ice onto the tray and called Casey. She would know what to do, or could at least give her moral support. Hey, tomboy, why are you calling so late? It's midnight in New York. Shouldn't you and your husband be doing the dirty dirty in bed? Debbie felt sadder when Casey mentioned Carlos. I had a bad day today. Casey, I want to go home. Casey captured her sad tone. What happened? Too much. That's what happened. I don't even know where to start. Casey, they don't like me. What should I do? Casey was relieved. I thought it was something serious. Why do you even care? As long as your husband likes you, nothing else matters. I know. And it should be like that. But when Carlos got in a fight with his family because of me, I felt so awful. And Megan, his not by blood niece, loves him in a romantic way. It bugs the hell out of me. But I can't get mad at Carlos because of it. Debbie started to channel her depression and told Casey what had happened over the past two days. Casey listened to her quietly and then asked, So, Mr. Hua hit Lewis and James to defend your honor, and then Megan's asthma acted up, and Mr. Hua carried her back to the manor and hasn't come back yet now. Am I right? Yeah. How can you be so stupid to leave your husband alone with another woman? And in the middle of the night? What if something happens between them? I don't think Mr. Hua is a scumbag, but some women are. Your husband is an extraordinary man. A manipulative bitch like Megan will try everything to make him hers. Hang up with me. And call your husband and ask him to come back, you silly girl. Casey was really worried about Debbie. Debbie didn't know how to handle relationships yet. She was too new at this. Maybe she married Carlos too soon? But I don't want to call him. He must be busy banging things out with his family right now. What if he gets upset? He cares for you too much to do that. You call him to show your concern to tell him how much you care about him, not to grill him for the details. Got it? Debbie nodded her head, even though Casey couldn't see her. But she only caught part of Casey's meaning. So I try calling him. What if something is happening between them? My phone call will. No, that's impossible. Casey, what were you thinking? You put this crazy thought in my head. Carlos isn't that kind of guy. He won't cheat on me. Whatever Megan tries, it won't work. A proud man like Carlos won't fall for her. You're right. Your husband won't cheat on you intentionally. But I'm not sure about Megan. What if she kisses him? Kiss him. Megan had kissed Carlos more than once before. The scenes played out in Debbie's head. The longer she visualized it, the more anxious she became. What if Megan got Carlos in bed? What if he liked her better than Debbie? Call you later. Bye. She hung up the phone immediately and called Carlos. The phone was connected soon, but Megan answered it. Aunt Debbie, it's so late. What's up? Debbie sneered, finding her question ridiculous. Do I need a reason to call my own husband? Where is your Uncle Carlos? Uncle Carlos was worried that I might be hungry, so he went to the kitchen to cook something for me. She's gloating, Debbie realized. She thinks she's won. What makes you think he wants you to answer his phone? And why are you keeping him up so late? You know he has to work, right? She asked, trying to keep composed. What's wrong with it? Uncle Carlos and I are in love. You're the other woman trying to come between us. Now you are telling me what's okay. Megan provoked. Debbie was going mad. She sneered. You two are in love? Then why didn't he marry you? Why did he marry me instead? Don't you know? Uncle Carlos married you because of his grandpa. He is nice to you just because his grandpa asked him to. He has to. You think he loves you? Ha ha. That's hilarious. Uncle Carlos loves his grandpa very much. Everything he did for you is just to make his grandpa feel better so that he could wake up earlier. She even used Carlos' unconscious grandpa as a pawn in her game. She would really use everything she could, Debbie thought. She took a deep breath and snorted. You've finally shown your true colors. You declaring war on me? 
Va? Don't be stupid. You're not even a worthy opponent. I can make Uncle Carlos spend the night here if I want. Want proof? Megan asked in a weird, creepy voice. Huh. Who on earth do you really like? Carlos? Wesley? Curtis? Or Damon? Debbie asked. I like them all, Megan answered simply. You're absolutely the biggest hoe I've ever known. Too bad for you Carlos is married. I'm his wife, and you're just one of many women who want him. I warned you, but since you're so stupid, don't cry when things get tough. Megan laughed like a happy witch over the phone. Debbie had never feared anyone before except Carlos. An 18-year-old was definitely no threat to her. What was she thinking? Besides, Carlos wouldn't cheat on her. He had many opportunities to and hadn't done so yet. So was Megan just a madwoman chasing a dream she could never have? Or was there something to what she was saying? After all, Carlos' family seemed to like Megan a lot more than they liked Debbie. On the other hand, Carlos had beaten his own family members in defense of Debbie, so maybe this was really woman to woman. Bring it, Miss Lon. Good. Can you hand the phone to my husband now? Of course, Aunt Debbie. Magically, Megan's voice was back to the usual sweet one. She was good at sounding bubbly and innocent. Probably the weapon she used well against Carlos, and on the family if anyone called her out on her actions. She walked downstairs and came to the kitchen, where Carlos was cooking for her. Why did you come downstairs? He asked when she showed up at the door. With a sad face, Megan raised the phone so that he could see the screen. Aunt Debbie wants to talk to you. I didn't want to come down, but she said it's urgent. I told her you were cooking, and then she started yelling at me. Uncle Carlos, you should try and calm her down. Debbie heard everything. She's pretending to be soft and innocent again. That evil manipulative bitch, she cursed. Seeing that Megan had answered his private call, Carlos was a bit annoyed. Go wait outside, he said to her. Megan read the annoyance on Carlos' face. She left the kitchen obediently. Left alone, Carlos asked tenderly on the phone. Why aren't you asleep yet? It's late. Little did he know how hard Debbie was trying to suppress her anger. Remembering Casey's advice, she answered gently. I couldn't sleep. I was worried about you. Did your dad and grandma get mad at you again? No. Megan got sick, and they were all worried about her so they dropped it for now. He replied while adeptly cracking an egg into a bowl with one hand. Listening to the sound of whisking eggs, Debbie felt her heart was soaked in bitterness, but she pretended not to mind. I didn't know you could cook. When did you learn that? Carlos paused shortly. I'll cook for you someday soon, okay? No need for that. The servants can cook. By the way, you worked all day. Where are the servants? Aren't they supposed to do that? Debbie's eyes started tearing up. Carlos was busy every day. She didn't have the heart to ask him to do anything for her after work. But right now, another woman was having him work in the middle of the night. Megan didn't feel well. She wanted to eat the noodles I cooked for her before, he explained briefly. Huh. Debbie held back her tears without one more word. She didn't know since when she'd always been trying to rein in her temper. But it was only around Carlos that she would suppress her anger time and again. Megan said it was urgent. What is it? I want to go back to Y City alone tomorrow, she blurted out. Carlos put down the bowl and chopsticks. We'll only be here for three days. I'll be finished with work by then. What's the matter? I gave you a private villa all to yourself. I promise no one will disturb you there. Debbie was conflicted. She appreciated what Carlos had done for her, from the bottom of her heart, but meanwhile, she couldn't stand him being nice to other women, even if the woman was his supposed niece, especially a niece who wanted him for herself. She wanted to be mad, but she also thought she shouldn't be. It might make her seem petty. She wanted to cry, but she didn't know exactly why she was hurt. Okay, can you come back now? I miss you, honey. I can't sleep without you by my side. Carlos missed her too, but the meal wasn't finished yet. He didn't like leaving things half done. I'll be back in half an hour. The manor was very close to the villa. He could get there in very few minutes. He always finished what he had started. 
The noodles would be ready in a dozen minutes. Okay, I'll wait for you. All right, bye. After hanging up the phone, Debbie got a message from Casey. How's it going, tomboy? The bitch showed her true colors and made it clear she'd steal my husband from me. Carlos is cooking for her. Holy crap. Mr. Hua is cooking for her. Yes, she's so weak right now she needs special care, so my husband has to take good care of her. Debbie responded, sounding a little jealous. The key is to stay calm. The bitch is trying to trap you so she can say you were mean to her. Don't fall for it, okay? Casey reminded her. Got it. Carlos said he'd be home soon, Debbie replied. Casey thought for a while and continued. When your husband comes back, don't fight with him. The bitch has been around him for five years. She won't just go away all of a sudden. Besides, she's his niece and pretends to be sweet, lovely, and understanding. Maybe Mr. Hua will be taken in by it and even blame you. So be patient. We need a plan to take the bitch down. We'll see. I don't want to start a fight because my husband has been so good to me. He works all day and is tired by now. It's just that I never ask anything of my husband, and what right does that bitch have to tell him to do this or that? I'm so irritated. If Megan weren't Carlos' niece, Debbie would have knocked her head off. She didn't really want noodles. Who would want to eat noodles in the middle of the night? She just wanted to piss you off. Okay. Casey explained to Debbie and sent her a face with rolling eyes emoji. Debbie was struck speechless. She thought about it and found it seemed Megan was just trying to stir things up between her and Carlos. Debbie decided not to let her get her wish. I'll just pretend to know nothing. When Carlos comes back, I'll give him a big hug and sleep with him. Um, whatever you want, Mrs. Hua, Casey replied playfully. Carlos was usually on time and now was no exception. Twenty-eight minutes after their phone call, the door to the bedroom opened. He put his suitcase down and came over to the bed. Debbie threw her phone aside and embraced him excitedly. Mr. Handsome, I'm so happy you're back. Seeing her smile, Carlos felt much happier. He looked at the slap mark on her face and asked, Does it still hurt? No. Sorry, honey. I wasn't a good daughter-in-law. I put you in a difficult position. Carlos shook his head and pecked her lips. I should be the one to apologize. Sorry for making you suffer like this. Did Louis do anything bad to you? No, but he climbed onto my bed and I discovered it wasn't you. Debbie hadn't expected Louis to be so bold even in the Hua family's house. At first, she had thought that the guy who climbed on top of her was Carlos. But then the difference in weight and the scent of Louis Cologne made her realize that it definitely wasn't Carlos. She got really crept out and even now when talking of it she still felt her heart race. Flames of rage flashed through Carlos' eyes. He asked between gritted teeth. And then? What did he do? Though embarrassed, Debbie mustered the courage to tell him in a hushed voice. He climbed on top of me and wanted to touch me, but I figured it out and stopped him at once. At this point, Carlos' face had completely darkened. He suddenly broke his embrace, removed Debbie from his arms, and strode toward the doorway. Hey, where are you going? Debbie shouted anxiously. Without time to put on her slippers, she ran after him in bare feet. Thankfully, he hadn't gone outside, and the carpet was warm and soft. Carlos turned his head around and spat. To deal with him. Seeing the fuming rage in his eyes, Debbie got flustered. It looked as if he was going to eat someone. To stop him, she grabbed hold of his arm, shook her head and persuaded. No, no. See, I'm safe and sound now, right? He didn't do anything. And you've already taught him a lesson. Come on, calm down, okay? I promise I'll be more careful next time. It took him a moment to compose himself. Letting out a deep sigh, he noticed her bare feet and immediately carried her in his arms. Where are your slippers? He rebuked. He didn't like it when she went barefoot. Not only was it unseemly, but it could be unsafe. Debbie threw her arms around his neck, staring into his eyes. You just got here. I have you all to myself finally. Don't go anywhere now, okay? I'm tired. Come to bed, she said, using her cute tone in her favor. She knew Carlos was a man of his word. 
Once he made a decision, it would be hard to change his mind. Even though Louis was his cousin, he would still find him and jump him. Most of the Hua family members already disliked her. And earlier tonight, Carlos had punched Louis and James in front of the other family members. After tonight, they hated her even more. Now, if Carlos did anything terrible to Louis, the Hua family would never forgive her. Okay, I hear you, Carlos promised, regaining his composure. He tucked her into bed and covered her with the quilt. Then, he shed his clothes before entering the bathroom. Lying prone in the bed, Debbie whined. Mr. Handsome, it's less than ten below zero outside. You didn't sweat today and you change your clothes every day. Why shower now? The water will go to waste. Carlos stopped his steps and looked toward the complaining woman, feeling baffled. Hesitantly, he replied, I need to wash my feet. Okay, be quick. Debbie nodded happily. However, much to Debbie's frustration, that germaphobe still chose to take a long shower in the end. When he finally climbed onto the bed, Debbie clung to him and joked, Next time, I'm going to quit showering for a whole week and hug you like this. So have I turned you off, seeing that I'm unwashed? Breathing in the fragrance of her hair, he said casually, So what? Even if you don't bathe for a whole week, I still can kiss you all over. Debbie couldn't believe her ears. Mr. Hua, aren't you a germaphobe? She wondered. Stroking his short hair, she recalled what happened earlier. In a jealous voice, she asked, You've been busy all day long. You must be absolutely bushed. Why did you cook for Megan? Carlos tightened his arms on her and explained slowly. For the past five years, I've been looking after her like this. I didn't think much of it tonight. But if you don't like it, I guess I can stop. He had never turned down Megan for anything she wanted in the past five years. Cooking a bowl of noodles wasn't a big deal, so of course he didn't refuse to do it either. Don't like it? Of course I don't like it. Debbie sulked. Yes, I hate that you put yourself out for her. You work hard all day, and then you take care of another woman after work. She protested with concern in her voice. Smiling, he kissed her on her forehead. It's sweet that you worry about me. Of course. You aren't her husband, so she doesn't worry about your health. But I feel my heart ache. Yes, her heart ached when she knew Carlos personally cooked for Megan. But it wasn't just about his health, but also for the jealousy. The jealousy was really killing her. Clever as Carlos was, of course he could comprehend the subtext of her words. Sorry, sweetheart. I didn't know it bugged you so much. I'll take note of it and never let it happen again, okay? Debbie couldn't help but sigh inwardly. She leaned over his chest, hearing his heartbeat. There were times that she felt this man was actually a fool who tried his best to make her happy. Yet, maybe he was not stupid at all because his strategy always worked. Even though she had almost drowned in jealousy, how could she be angry with him any more after hearing his sincere apology? On the third day, an unexpected guest came to visit Debbie in Carlos' private villa. It was Miranda. Hi, Aunt Miranda. Debbie greeted her with courtesy. Hmm, Miranda responded nonchalantly and went straight into the living room. Watching the woman walking in, Debbie wondered, why did Miranda show up all of a sudden? Did Carlos know anything about her visit? Or did she come here to seek justice for her son? Miranda turned around when she reached a sofa. Staring at the confused girl, she sat down and said, Carlos has deprived Louis of his position in the company. What? Debbie asked, trying to understand what was going on. A housemaid came and served a cup of tea to the guest. After smelling the strong tea aroma, Miranda took a sip, relished the lingering flavor in her mouth and then put down the cup. Elegantly, she crossed her legs and continued, It wasn't easy for Louis' father to make him a general manager. But yesterday, Carlos fired him from that job and set him up in the secretarial department. Louis has to start at the bottom and work his way up by himself. So, her purpose is to seek justice for her son? Debbie asked in her mind. She suddenly felt the air pressing in around her as she could sense the coldness and arrogance radiating from Miranda. Even though she spoke in an elegant way, there was a hint of power in her voice, just like Carlos. Awkward, Debbie cautiously sat opposite her, 
cleared her throat and replied, Aunt Miranda, I never meddle in company affairs nor do I understand. Since it's Carlos' decision, I can't interfere. Miranda stared at her. I'm not asking you to interfere. I just came to inform you of it. This left a question hanging in the air. What did she mean? Isn't she telling me this on purpose? Isn't she asking me to put in a good word for Louis so that Carlos would give him his old job back? A lot of questions went through Debbie's mind. Awkward silence filled the living room. Debbie wasn't a talkative girl in front of unfamiliar people, and Miranda too was aloof with few words, which made the atmosphere even weirder to Debbie. However, it didn't seem to affect Miranda at all, as if she were used to silence. She went on to enjoy the cup of tea in a relaxing mood. In order to stifle the silence, Debbie had to start a conversation herself. Um, so. Are Louis and Dad doing well now? She stammered. Miranda nodded her head without saying a word. Debbie cried in her mind. Honey, come back now. Save me. Is your flight tomorrow? Miranda finally opened her mouth to ask. As if she were being saved from this awkward situation, Debbie nodded her head vigorously and replied enthusiastically. Oh yeah, we'll take a flight tomorrow afternoon and arrive in Y City the day after tomorrow. Miranda took out her phone from her handbag. Add me on Facebook. Contact me in private if you need my help. Okay. Debbie hastily pulled out her phone, opened the app and shot Miranda a friend request. Her account name was exactly her own name, Miranda. After that, Miranda suddenly looked into Debbie's eyes and requested, Don't tell Carlos anything about James. Just pretend you know nothing. Her words dumbfounded Debbie. She wondered if Miranda also knew something about James' secret. Before she could formulate a response, Miranda stood up from the sofa. You can probably guess what's going on. Whatever you think, you're right. And that's why Tabitha has depression, she said, sounding sarcastic. With her eyes becoming sharp, she cautioned. And be careful of Megan. She's a great actress. Don't be kind to the family. Don't cut them any slack, or you'll have dug your own grave. After tidying her clothes, she walked toward the door in an arrogant and graceful demeanor. Before she left, she turned around and left her last words. Don't feel bad. That night, Carlos did a good job. Louis and James deserved it. I'm going back to work. Goodbye. Honey, Carlos called out in a helpless voice, trying to stop the angry woman. Debbie glared at him with widening eyes. What? Don't tell me you don't care about $80,000. But I care. Give me your wallet now. You need my approval before spending a penny. Debbie said as she stretched out her hand in front of him. Sighing, he obediently took out his wallet from his pocket and handed it to her. Megan, you'll get the same allowance for your living expenses every month, as you used to get from my husband. Not one penny less. But if you squander the money again, half of your allowance goes bye-bye. Megan was frightened by Debbie's threat and quickly hid herself behind Carlos. Nodding her head, she tried to soothe her aunt's temper. Yes, yes, Aunt Debbie. Please don't get mad. Don't get mad? How can I not be pissed off by these two? She thought angrily. Then, Debbie put the three lipsticks back into the box and lifted it, asking, Now who's going to return this? Carlos frowned in embarrassment. He had never done a thing like that. It would be ridiculous for a CEO of an international company to return a box of lipsticks and take back $80,000. After a pause, he begged, Honey, please let it go this time. Debbie's words were believable. He finally realized that it wasn't common for women to put on pink or blue lipstick in daily life. With that epiphany, he was determined to fire the sales manager who had recommended these colors to them. Fine, I'll let it go if Megan promises to wear this pink lipstick tomorrow, all the way back to Y City. After all, Megan is such a young and beautiful girl. She'll look gorgeous in this color. Honey, what do you think? Am I right? Debbie asked in a threatening voice as she put a hand on his arm, getting ready to pinch him heavily if he said a no. Getting the hint, Carlos had no choice but to nod and tell the girl behind him, Megan, your Aunt Debbie doesn't like them so you can keep them. And she's right. Don't waste money anymore. 
I'll arrange a stylist to come and bring you a dress that matches the lipstick. You'll look stunning in both. Uncle Carlos, Megan called out feeling wronged. Seeing the grief on Megan's face, Debbie finally felt happier. She held his arm and said blissfully, Honey, let's go to sleep now. Carlos nodded and followed her upstairs. Megan seethed with anger as she watched them going away. Undeterred by the defeat, she yelled, Uncle Carlos, seems like Aunt Debbie doesn't want me here. I'd better leave now and come back tomorrow. Debbie's head was pounding. Why is Megan so annoying? Why all the drama? Carlos turned around and looked at Megan's red and tearful eyes. His eyebrows furrowed deeply. You're already here. No need to go anywhere, he said. Megan deliberately caught a glimpse of Debbie and asked in a shaking voice, So is Aunt Debbie still angry with me? Debbie clenched her fists. Jesus, I can't tolerate this hypocritical bitch one more second. In an instant, she loosened her grip on Carlos' arm and jumped downstairs, rushing toward Megan. Carlos was taken aback. Oh my! He hastily followed her. Megan screamed seeing Debbie dashing toward her. The latter grabbed her by her collar and threatened furiously. Dare you pretend to be weak in front of my husband again? Try again. I'll tear you apart. Uncle Carlos, help. Uncle Carlos. Stop it. Carlos won't save you. Debbie turned to stare at the man who had caught up with her. Both of us can't stay here. It's either her or me. Choose. Carlos tried talking her down in a calm voice. Let go of her first. But Debbie didn't loosen her grip. Instead, she shoved her against the wall. You love my husband, right? I hear you. Goodbye, Aunt Miranda. After bidding farewell to Miranda, Debbie began to think about her parting words. Carlos did a good job? They deserved it? Did she mean what she said? Is Miranda really Louis' mother? Watching Miranda's receding figure, Debbie couldn't fend off the barrage of doubts from intruding on her thoughts. That night, Carlos picked up Megan from the Hua family's house and drove her to the villa. Megan was going to spend the night with them. Since they were all flying back to Y City tomorrow, it would be more convenient to have her there. When Megan stepped into the villa and spotted Debbie, she ran briskly and gleefully toward her. With an innocent look on her face, she said, Aunt Debbie, guess what I bought you? Debbie smiled sarcastically as she stared at her innocent look. It was exactly the same look as when she met Megan for the first time. Miranda's words came unbidden to her mind. And be careful of Megan. She's a great actress. And wasn't that the truth? Megan had managed to hoodwink both Carlos and her, intending to steal Carlos away from her. Back then, her fake innocent expression blinded Debbie's eyes, making her believe that Megan was a pure, sweet girl. It turned out that she was just a hypocritical and cunning woman. Oblivious to Debbie's indifferent attitude, Megan lifted the shopping bag with an international brand logo printed on it. In a more excited voice, she revealed the answer. Lipsticks. The latest ones. Uncle Carlos and I picked out the colors for you. Come on. Open it and take a look. Uncle Carlos and I. Debbie repeated this sentence in her mind. Interesting that you bring Carlos into it. You always follow him around like a lost puppy dog, she thought angrily. She shifted her gaze past Megan to the man walking towards them. Wasn't Carlos busy wrapping up his work here before leaving New York? How could he spare any time to go shopping with Megan? She wondered. Devoid of emotion, Debbie took the shopping bag from Megan and said flatly, Thanks. Then while Carlos and Megan watched, she opened the exquisite high-class packing box. There were three shades of lipstick inside the box. When she unscrewed the lid of the first one and saw the color, she was overwhelmed by an urge to punch the pair. She couldn't believe her eyes. The first one was Death Barbie Pink. Her lips twitched totally at a loss for words. Every netizen knew about that shade, and many jokes were told about it. It was supposed to be a hue similar to a Barbie doll's lips. But this shade was completely unsuitable for most Chinese women. All it did was make their faces seem darker and dirtier. Some actresses tried it, but they also failed to pull it off and were roundly mocked. Thus, it came to be known as Death Barbie Pink. 
and the second tube of lipstick was blue. This was getting bad. She had lost all her strength to lay a finger on the third lipstick. Instead, she glared at Carlos. The man was obviously confused by her expression. Finally, she mustered the courage to unscrew the lid of the third lipstick. Thank God. This one was at least normal. It was orange. She asked Carlos, How much did this set you back? Her question embarrassed Megan and she apologized. I'm sorry, Aunt Debbie. You know I can't get a job yet. Debbie paid no attention to her, but kept her eyes on Carlos. Confused, he asked, What's wrong? How much did they cost? She insisted on an answer. Eighty thousand, give or take, Carlos replied honestly. His reply sent a chill down her spine. Her eyes popped out in shock. Dollar? Eighty thousand dollars for three lipsticks? She confirmed again. Perplexed, Megan replied, Yeah, was that too much? But Aunt Debbie, the manager told us that it was a limited edition. There are only two sets of these in the entire world. Now you have one in your hands. Cool, right? Bang. Debbie slammed the box heavily on the table and glared at the fake innocent girl. Cool? No more like a fool. Of course they had only made two sets of these particular shades. If they made hundreds of thousands of these lipstick colors, the company would have already gone bankrupt. And you think $80,000 is an expensive? It's a sky-high price for lipstick. Much higher than market price. You think money grows on trees or something? How about you go and earn $80,000 for me now? Huh. And you take it for granted to waste my husband's money. Take it back to wherever you got this. She shouted out a barrage of words in one breath. Hearing Debbie's rant, Megan was startled and staggered backward. Tears instantly sprang to her eyes and streamed down her face. Yes, she shed crocodile tears again. On the other hand, Carlo still couldn't make sense of the situation and had no idea why Debbie got pissed. As a straight man and a workaholic, he didn't understand colors of lipstick. Why get mad? You don't like them? I think pink fits you. He remembered she looked quite lovely in a pink dress last time he saw her wear it. As for the blue color, he remembered Debbie had worn a blue down jacket once. She looked good in it too. Then for the orange color, she had two orange pajamas and they both were quite flattering. Debbie tried her hardest to hold back her anger. Yeah, pink is a nice color. But Carlos, not everything in pink is good and not everyone looks good with pink lipstick. And blue, yeah, you may have seen some people put on blue lipstick, right? But they are mostly models who need special makeup for a fashion show. You want me to be a model? Okay, the orange lipstick is a normal shade. But since I don't like the other two, you should go and return the whole box, she said, trying to make her voice sound calm. Yet again, Megan's nonstop crying got on her nerves. She turned to Megan and rebuked. Megan, dear spoiled lady, why are you crying? Are you hurt? I can give you a reason to cry. Don't bother buying me any gifts from now on. And would you please kindly stop wasting my husband's money? I'd really appreciate it. Megan kept shaking her head her face turning pale. Didn't you declare war on me? Why so afraid now? Debbie confronted her. Carlos stepped forward, pulling them away from each other. As soon as they were separated, Megan weakly leaned into Carlos' arms, her body trembling. Debbie sneered. Carlos, what, you feel your heart ache, don't you? Carlos shut his eyes. Don't make a fuss out of nothing. Make a fuss? Me? She's got her hooks in you. Debbie laughed ironically in her mind. She felt like she was suffocated by her anger. Fine, I'm in the wrong. I'm a troublemaker, she yelled, a lump in her throat. Ignoring them, she turned away and ran upstairs. To prevent the two women from fighting again, Carlos had a housemate prepare a guest room for Megan on the ground floor. After confirming that Megan was fine, he turned around to leave. It was better this way. Debbie was stopped from doing much at the Hua family's house. But here, away from all the elders who disliked her, her anger had free reign. Tomboy's rage was a terrible thing to behold. Carlos thought he'd better make them stay away from each other for the moment. Uncle Carlos! Megan called out, her body curling up in the bed. I'm sorry if I make you and Aunt Debbie unhappy. 
Maybe I should fly back to Y City alone tomorrow. Carlos glanced at her, shaking his head. No. Stay here. Sleep tight. Before he left, he turned off the lamp. But all of a sudden, Megan jumped out of the bed and rushed to him. She threw herself into his arms, stopping him from leaving the room. Uncle Carlos, trust me. Aunt Debbie doesn't love you at all. Megan. Carlos cried out sternly. He tried to pull himself away from her. Megan raised her voice. It's true. Think about it. You've been with her a while, but why hasn't she gotten pregnant yet? Don't you think something is wrong? Her words froze Carlos. Megan composed herself and continued. I saw. Saw Aunt Debbie take birth control pills. I didn't want to tell you this, but I don't want you to hate me because of her. I want you to know who she really is. Carlos asked, When did you see that and where? At the Hua family's house. I saw her do it three times there. Seeing Carlos pull away to leave, she hastily added, Don't just ask her outright. She won't admit it. Uncle Carlos, you can take her for a blood test and see if there are any common steroidal compounds in her body like the kinds that are used in birth control pills. Or maybe figure out why she can't get pregnant. Carlos stopped walking now. Megan held her breath and cautiously added fuel to the fire. I'm a woman and I know how women think. If I married a man I truly loved, I'd want to have kids with him. But if I don't want babies, then it means I don't love the guy at all. Her words reminded Carlos of all the times when Debbie told him that she didn't want a baby right now. I told you that I saw Hayden Goo kiss her but you didn't trust me. Truth is they're still in touch. Otherwise, she wouldn't have dated him behind your back. Uncle Carlos, I never tried to drive a wedge between you and Aunt Debbie. I just care about you. I don't want you to be fooled by this woman. I feel bad that you've fallen into her trap. Uncle Carlos. She said with a sob and grabbed him by his sleeve. Without turning his head, Carlos pulled her hand off and strode out of her room. He slammed the door heavily behind him. As soon as the door was closed, Megan turned her tears into a big and cunning smile. When Carlos walked upstairs, he found that their bedroom was double locked. He couldn't get in. He could unlock the doorknob but not the deadbolt on the inside. As he stared at the closed door, Megan's words resounded in his head, making him even more annoyed. A housemaid came behind him and reported in a low voice, Mr. Hua? Mrs. Hua requested. You sleep in the guest room tonight. I have it ready for you. His face darkened. Kicking the door, he roared. Open it. The noise was loud enough to be heard by the woman inside, but she didn't budge even a little. Carlos raised his head to stare at the ceiling, pressing his lips tightly to stifle his anger. Debbie, you did a good job. In the end, the couple slept in separate rooms. Ever since they confirmed their relationship, this was the first time they spent the night in different rooms though still under the same roof. The next morning, as Carlos knew that Debbie liked to sleep in, and since they were flying back to Y City in his private plane, there was no need to hurry. So he called in a housemaid to tell her not to wake up Debbie. However, the housemaid told him Debbie had already left for the airport an hour ago. She'd bought a ticket for herself and asked Carlos not to worry. Carlos' eyes burned with fire as he listened to the housemaid pass on Debbie's words. The housemaid almost fainted when she saw the fire in his gaze. At the airport, wearing a pair of sunglasses and sipping a bottle of milk tea bought at the airport, Debbie sent a message to their friends on WeChat. Hey guys, good news. The return of the queen. See you soon. Jared echoed her joke and wrote, Long live Queen Debbie. Christina wrote, Your Majesty, we, your people, call to you. Casey wrote, Party time. I'll book a room so we can do that tomorrow. Dixon Urot, bon voyage, ton bois. Debbie sent a goodbye and put away her phone reluctantly. She had bought an economy ticket. Though she had control over Carlos' wallet now, she still didn't want to waste money. And she didn't feel guilty taking his wallet away, sparing him not a single cent. She was justified keeping a tight grip on his purse strings, or he would spend all the money on another woman. After boarding the plane, she went into the economy cabin and looked for her seat following the signs. 
However, when she found her seat number, she was surprised that her seat was already occupied. Excuse me, sir. I think this is my seat, she said to the man sitting in her seat. The man looked at her and said apologetically, I'm really sorry. I want to sit next to my girlfriend. Can we change seats? Debbie nodded understandingly. Okay, so where's your seat? The man gestured to a stewardess and showed her his ticket. After exchanging a few words with the stewardess in fluent English, he said to Debbie, Thank you. The stewardess will guide you to my seat. Then, Debbie followed the stewardess to walk along the passage. When she walked through the economy class, she felt something wrong. Wait, is the stewardess taking me to the first class cabin? Her guess was right. The stewardess led her to an empty seat and said with a smile, you can sit here. Stunned, Debbie looked around the sumptuous first-class cabin. My guess was right. What an idiot. Why would he give this up? It wasn't until she was settled down in her new seat that she realized the real idiot was none other than herself. It turned out he had an ulterior motive. For who would be willing to give up a seat in first class and change to a much cheaper seat in economy? Now she finally got it. Instantly, she stood up to leave but the man sitting next to her quickly stopped her. He had wanted to hold her hand, but in the end, he grabbed her by her sleeve. Deb, seems like we're destined to meet here. Debbie shook off his hand and said coldly, Hayden, you stalker. Why do I see you everywhere? I don't know. As I said, it must be fate, Hayden said innocently, throwing his hands in the air and shrugging his shoulders. The truth was, he had spotted Debbie when he was waiting at the VIP lounge earlier. He had someone look into it and found that she had booked an economy ticket herself. Ignoring him, Debbie took her bag and intended to get back her original seat in economy, like her ticket indicated. Hayden stood up and stopped in her tracks. He tried persuading her. The plane is going to take off. It's just a seat. I promise I won't bother you nor will I lay a finger on you. Okay. Debbie rolled her eyes, but seeing two stewardesses look curiously at them, Debbie had no choice but to sit back in the seat. Forget it. It's just a seat. He won't be able to do anything on a plane, she thought, sighing helplessly. After sitting back, she pulled out her phone and said to him formally, It's not in airplane mode yet, so I can transfer the money to you now. I owe you the price difference between economy and first class. Hayden smiled resignedly. Aware of Debbie's stubborn personality, he had to back out gracefully. My assistant booked it for me. I don't know the price of a first-class ticket. How about this? When we return to Y City, you can buy me a meal or something. Then we'll be even Stephen. Debbie hesitated. After a moment, she nodded. Okay. Then she put her phone in airplane mode and put on the headset, ignoring the man next to her. Hayden was true to his word. They'd been on the plane for hours, but he hadn't bugged her once. It had been a sleepless night for Debbie last night thanks to her fight with Carlos. She couldn't fall asleep until the wee hours and then she woke up quite early this morning to catch her flight. She tried watching a movie to pass the time, but she was soon overtaken by drowsiness, her eyelids drooping. She turned off the video and rested her head on the seat back to take a nap. She fell sound asleep at once. Seeing that, Hayden pressed the button to call in a stewardess, asking her to fetch a blanket. He carefully covered Debbie with the blanket and tried not to wake her. For a moment, he kept staring at her sleeping face, eyes glimmering with affection. He wished that time would freeze this moment forever. As the affection in his eyes grew, he couldn't help but plant a kiss on her forehead. The sleeping Debbie was disturbed, her forehead itchy. She frowned, but the itchy feeling was gone soon, and she drifted off to dreamland again. She had been asleep for only a few moments before it was dinner time. As the stewardess began to deliver the food, Hayden woke her up and asked her what she would like for dinner. The stewardess had been waiting at one side. In a haze, Debbie mumbled, What do we have? Her sleepy look and mumbling amused Hayden very much. With no choice, he repeated what he had said. Fruit salad, fish and rice, Australian steak. Which one do you want? Debbie lowered her head to look at the blanket in confusion. 
Absent-minded, she casually answered, fish and rice, baked chicken wings, seafood, spaghetti, and a glass of orange juice and a haagen -Dazs. Thank you. The stewardess was taken aback by the amount of food she had ordered. Yet, with professionalism, she managed not to show the surprise on her face and replied politely, Yes, please wait for a moment. Hayden, of course, was absolutely stunned. He knew she could eat a lot and liked to, and her metabolism somehow managed to let her burn all those calories and there wasn't a trace of fat on her, not even a belly. How she did this was a mystery. Hayden was also secretly delighted, because it was one new thing he didn't know about this goddess before and he loved finding out new things about her. As a man, he had only ordered a garden variety steak. No wonder the stewardess was so shocked to hear Debbie's order. Debbie was well aware of her own large appetite, and she didn't think it was necessary to hide it from Hayden. She didn't care what he thought. After placing the order, she went to the ladies' room. At night, Debbie came to realize that their seats were actually for couples. There was a small curtain around their compartment. If they pulled it closed, it would separate them from the others, giving them privacy and independent space. She could join the Mile High Club if she wanted, but she wasn't that type of girl, even though Hayden found himself wishing that she was. But that wasn't something she really wanted to do with Hayden. So she kept the curtain open, adjusted her seat and closed her eyes again. As she closed her eyes, Carlo's face came to mind. She suddenly felt resentful. That bad man hadn't called her once after knowing she took a flight alone. Was he having a good time with Megan on his private plane? Debbie suddenly felt sorry for her impulsive decision. She shouldn't have given them the chance to stay together. Thinking of it, she patted her own forehead, feeling annoyed. Hayden noticed her gesture and turned to ask with concern. What's up? Are you okay? Debbie hit her emotion and said, I'm okay. Just a little bit dizzy. Maybe I'm too sleepy. Hayden slightly pulled the corner of her blanket as he said, Then get some sleep now. The plane will arrive at Y City early tomorrow morning. Hmm. Thanks. Debbie turned to one side with her back against Hayden and fell silent. Hayden stared blankly at her back for a long while until he could hear her light and steady breathing. Knowing that she'd been sound asleep, he pulled the curtain closed separating them from the outside world. Content, he smiled happily. He really cherished this precious moment when he and Debbie were the only people in this private little space. After the plane landed in the airport of Y City, Hayden and his assistant followed Debbie out of the plane. A few moments later, he pointed in a direction and told her, the luggage claim area is over there. Debbie nodded. Thank you. They proceeded to get their luggage together. After that, Debbie suddenly felt a stomachache. She caught a glimpse of the ladies' room a short distance away. Embarrassed, she called out, Hayden. Hayden turned around and looked at her in confusion. She pointed to the ladies' room and said awkwardly, I need to use the facilities. Could you please watch my luggage for a moment? There was a black handbag on top of her large suitcase. In it were all kinds of snacks bought in New York, which were gifts for Casey and Christina. Debbie didn't think it a good idea to take that handbag with her into the toilet. Some of the snacks were not even packed in sealing bags. It would be unhygienic. Left with no choice, she could only turn to Hayden for help. Hayden understood. He took her luggage and urged, Okay, go now. We'll wait for you here. When Debbie got to the ladies' room, she found that her period had come. She felt confused. She hadn't eaten anything bad or done anything bad to her health recently. When did her menstrual circles become irregular? And the menstrual amount wasn't normal either. She wondered if anything was wrong with her body. If this continued, she thought she'd better go to the hospital to have a checkup. When Debbie emerged from the ladies' room, Hayden was on the phone. Seeing her come out, he didn't return her luggage but instead walked straight out of the lobby, dragging her luggage behind him. Debbie had wanted to take over her luggage, but since she was still wiping her wet hands with a tissue, she gave up the idea. She tagged along with him to the exit of the airport. There, Hayden insisted on driving her back home no matter how she tried to turn him down. She told him she could take a taxi herself, but using the poor public security of Y City as an excuse, 
He insisted on taking her back himself. Small Deb. It's not safe out here. Just get in. In the end, Debbie reluctantly got in his car. As bad timing would have it, Tristan, responding to Carlos' orders to come pick Debbie up from the airport, had just arrived. He was supposed to get there before Debbie's flight landed. However, Due to the heavy snow in Y City and a couple of car accidents on the way, his car had been stuck in the traffic jam for a few hours. He grew more and more annoyed the longer he was delayed. That was why he was late, and the moment he arrived, he saw Debbie getting into another man's car. In an instant he unfastened his seatbelt and got out of his car, intending to call out to Debbie. But it was too late. Their car started and drove away as soon as Debbie and Hayden got in it. Tristan hastily pulled out his phone to call Debbie, but voicemail was all he got for his trouble. Sighing helplessly, he got back in the car. Then he started the engine and followed their car. Meanwhile, he called Carlos. As soon as the phone was connected, Tristan reported to him in a cautious voice, Mr. Hua, Mrs. Hua, has gotten off the plane. Okay. Carlos simply responded. This was as expected. Why do I feel a but coming? He thought. But. Tristan paused. Hearing him stammering, Carlos frowned and asked, But what? It's just that. I got stuck in a traffic jam so I got here late. I saw Mrs. Hua. Get in Mr. Gu's car. As he finished, he thought in his mind, Jesus, no wonder Mr. Hua asked me to grab a contract that the Gu group was bidding on. I thought it had something to do with Mrs. Hua. And I'm right. There was a moment of silence on the phone. Tristan assumed that Carlos must be trying to compose himself. He could well imagine his boss with steam coming out of his ears. Stalk them and report everything to me, Carlos coldly ordered. Yes, Mr. Hua. In the Sapphire Portia, Debbie wasn't able to contact anyone because her phone died. She hadn't had a chance to charge it and twelve hours was a long flight. Yet, she didn't want to talk to Hayden either. The only thing she could do was lean toward the window and look out of it, watching the world go by. Hayden had been talking about work with his assistant the whole way. He hadn't intended to interrupt Debbie either. He respected her space, and sometimes it was just enough for him to catch a glimpse of her. They were downtown before he finally took the initiative to talk to her. But this time he had a pretty important question to ask. Where's your house? Debbie hesitated at the question. Should I go back to the manor? Carlos and Megan are probably there already. Not in the mood to see Megan, she replied. Please drive me to East City Villa. Hayden raised his eyebrows. Oh, what a coincidence. I have a house there too, he said to Debbie. He turned to his assistant. Alfred, I'll stay in East City Villa tonight. Have someone ready the house for me, he instructed. Yes, Mr. Gu. Debbie's breath caught in her throat. If she had known he had a house there too, she wouldn't have rattled off that destination. Even so, they remained silent again all the way to East City Villa. She didn't feel much like talking, and she was hoping Carlos wouldn't figure out where she was right now, or that she'd caught a ride with Hayden. A few moments later, the Porsche pulled up in front of Debbie's previous villa. Hayden personally helped her remove her luggage from the trunk. Debbie reached out her hands for the luggage while saying, Thank you for the ride, Mr. Gu. Goodbye. Instead of handing the luggage to her, Hayden suggested, I figured out what you could do to repay me for the ticket. You used to make the most wonderful egg tarts. I haven't had any in a long time. How about you make some for me now? Then we go our separate ways and you owe me nothing. What do you think? Frankly, this was rather a far-fetched excuse. He knew it and so did Debbie. It was just an excuse to spend more time with her. And she didn't want to do that. She wanted to talk to her friends and be alone with her thoughts. Hayden was a constant and dangerous distraction. Of course Debbie turned him down and refused bluntly. If I recall correctly, you don't like egg tarts, do you? On top of that, I don't know how to make egg tarts. I think I'd better buy you a meal some other time. The truth was, she could make egg tarts if all the ingredients were ready-made. There were pre-made egg custard, pastries and tart tins sold in the supermarket. She just needed to fill the tart tins with the egg custard, 
and put them into an oven to bake for a while. But she didn't feel like doing that now. She didn't have the energy to do much at all. Back when she and Hayden were dating, she had once made egg tarts for him. But he just looked at the egg tarts with contempt in his eyes without taking a bite. Deb, I didn't cherish what we had. I've been regretting ever since. Please, I'm not asking much now. And we're already at the door of your house. Don't refuse me, please. Hayden stared at her expectantly. Debbie pulled a long face, annoyed. I don't have any ingredients at home. He immediately turned to his assistant and instructed, Go to a nearby supermarket and buy a full set of egg tart ingredients and tools. And a new oven, too. Be quick. Yes, Mr. Goo. Debbie was at a loss for words. Hayden was becoming bolder and more annoying now. He had always done something that made her hard to turn him down. Now he was not only buying all the ingredients for egg tarts, but a brand new oven as well. Never let it be said that he wasn't one for grand gestures. Eventually, she opened the gate of the villa and allowed him in. Julie and the other housemates were still on a vacation for the spring festival and hadn't come back yet. Debbie impatiently let Hayden into the living room. In an angry voice, she warned, Just sit there and wait. Don't speak to me. Or else I'll spread your nose across your face. She raised her fist in front of him as she said it. Hayden laughed and nodded. Inside he felt remorseful again. She's so cute when she's like this. What an idiot I was. I've lost her. Leaving Hayden alone in the living room, Debbie lugged the bags upstairs to her bedroom first. He had wanted to help her carry the luggage upstairs, but she rejected his help. She had been kind enough to allow him to enter the villa. That was enough for her. By rights she should have sent him home. But there was always a small part of her that wanted to care for the smallest parts of his soul. He was like a lost child now, and seemed as pitiful as anything else. However, letting him help her with the bags would mean letting him into her bedroom. That would be too ridiculous. Shortly, his assistant had bought all the needed items for making egg tarts. Looking at the clean kitchen, Debbie felt at a loss. What should I do first? It occurred to her that this situation was similar to what her husband had done a few days ago. That night, Carlos cooked noodles for Megan, and now she was going to make desserts for Hayden. She smiled bitterly. It's so ironic. If anyone saw this, they might think I'm deliberately doing this to get revenge on Carlos. Taking a deep breath, she shook off all these thoughts and began to wash the tools. Then, she clumsily placed the crust on the tart tins and filled them with the egg custard. It proved again that Debbie wouldn't be a good housewife. Now she had poured too much egg custard into some of the tart tins and it spilled out. And then again, her elbow accidentally swept some of the tart tins off the table onto the floor. The kitchen was already a mess even before she put the unbaked egg tarts into the oven. Unknowingly, Hayden had already come into the kitchen. He asked with worry, Need my help? In a tearing hurry, Debbie nodded and said, Yeah, help me preheat the oven first. Hayden then opened the box and took out the new oven. Quickly glancing over the instruction book, he switched it on and pressed the preheat button. Finally, Debbie finished the first step and put all the unbaked egg tarts on a tray. Steadying the tray in her hands, she carefully moved it to the oven. When she drew back her hands, her bare left hand accidentally touched the hot oven grilling pan. With no oven mitt, she was definitely asking to be burned. Ouch! She groaned and stepped back. Unexpectedly, Hayden was standing right behind her and she fell into his arms. On the other hand, Carlos had hurried back to his office after getting off his private plane. He had just sat down in his seat when Tristan called him and reported to him that Debbie was in Hayden's car. After hanging up, he immediately called Emmett in, his face darkened. Besides bidding for the contract of the Century Group, what else has the Goo Group been working on recently? Emmett quickly checked the documents in his hands and replied, They held a new product release event. A few international A-list stars attended it and endorsed the products for them. Carlos looked out of the window, overlooking the whole Y city, and instructed calmly, Now go and prepare a spring fashion show from ZL Group. What's more, some time ago, there was a rumor that the Gu family and the Qin family would be allied by marriage, right? 
Do something to push forward the arrangement. Emmett silently swallowed his spit as he took note of his boss's orders. Mr. Hoare is causing a lot of trouble for Hayden. Half an hour later, Carlos got another call from Tristan. This time, the report from the other end of the line made Carlos leap up from his seat. Kicking the seat away in fury, he strode out of his office while holding the phone in his hand. Outside the office, when Emmett noticed Carlos' deadpan face, he knew something terrible had happened. He quickly gave a few instructions to his men and followed Carlos to the elevator at a rapid sprint. At the last second before the elevator door closed, he squeezed inside, breathless and panting. Is Debbie in danger? Emmett wanted to ask but he didn't dare to, because the man standing next to him was on the verge of going ballistic. The atmosphere inside the elevator was heavy and oppressive. In the parking lot, Emmett gestured to Carlos to take a seat in back. But when Emmett had just sat in the driver's seat and fastened the seatbelt, Carlos suddenly got out of the car and opened the door of the driver's seat. He pulled him out while yelling, Move! Emmett obediently moved to the passenger seat. Thanks to Carlos' excellent driving skills, the engine of the pricey and high-end emperor roared to life and handled like a dream. The gleaming high-performance engine could be heard clearly as the car raced through the city streets. As the car zigzagged along the road, Emmett held tightly onto the interior handrail, fighting the urge to vomit. His eyes were fixed on the windshield and his lips were zipped. Undoubtedly, Carlos' mad behavior must have something to do with Debbie. About twenty minutes later, the emperor rolled to a stop at the East City Villa. Seeing the sapphire Porsche and Tristan's car parked in front of Carlos' villa, Emmett was even more certain about his guess. Mr. Hua always loses his composure when it comes to Debbie, he thought smugly. Using the fingerprint lock, Carlos silently pushed open the door and walked toward the living room. He didn't even bother to change his footwear from outside shoes to ones more appropriate for the house. In the kitchen, holding Debbie's hand tightly, Hayden asked anxiously, Deb, does it hurt? I'm taking you to the hospital now. That said, he gathered her into his arms straight away, giving her no chance to refuse. He started to carry her out of the kitchen. Feeling her body leave the ground all of a sudden, Debbie reflexively wrapped her arms around his neck. No, put me down first. It's not that serious, she thought. Hayden ignored her protests and rushed out of the kitchen, carrying her in his arms. Just as he stepped out, he saw a man in the living room and slowed his pace. Carlos' tall figure came into view. Realizing she was in Hayden's arms now, Debbie felt the blood rushing to her head. She knew that she had done wrong, and she was now in a compromising position. Carlos would be angry with her she knew that, and he had no sense when it came to Debbie. It was like she knew exactly which button to push to drive him crazy, but didn't know she was doing it until it was too late. I'm so screwed. She released Hayden's neck and jumped out of his arms. She was so anxious that she staggered when she landed on the floor. Luckily, Hayden steadied her and kept her from a nasty fall. Damn it. I promised Carlos that I wouldn't hang around with Hayden. Carlos stood where he was wordless. His eyes fixed upon her as cold as ice. Debbie opened her mouth to explain, but nothing came out, and she shut it again. After recalling what he had done for Megan, she decided otherwise. She turned and walked into the kitchen without saying a word. Now, Hayden was sure that there must be something wrong between Debbie and Carlos. He gave Carlos a smile and sat on the couch naturally, almost as if he were not a guest. It's not what it looks like, Mr. Hua. I'm here for egg tarts. I helped Deb on the plane earlier, and she wanted to make egg tarts for me in return. Nothing happened. You seem like a reasonable man. Resting his hands in his pockets, Carlos cast a cold glance at Hayden and said indifferently, You seem to have a lot of free time, Mr. Goo. Do you want a lot more? As a clever man, Hayden instantly heard the warning in Carlos' words. Thank you, Mr. Hua, but I'm good. We're really busy these days. After all, we'd been preparing bids on a specific contract for a while, but ZL Group suddenly stepped in and outbid us. We have to stay alert, right? Hayden said. Carlos turned to look at Debbie, who was pretending to be busy in the kitchen. 
You like egg tarts, Mr. Goo? Hayden didn't know why Carlos asked, so he simply answered, Deb's making them. Then just sit here and wait. Remember, don't take off. After saying that, Carlos walked past the couch and into the kitchen. He turned off the tap and pulled Debbie, who was washing a rag, into his arms. His moves were quick and smooth. Debbie was startled. What are you, um? Carlos kissed her rudely on the lips. His kiss was fierce and deliberate, showing disdain for his guest, and showing this rival for his true love's affections exactly who was in charge. By telling him to stay put, he was subjecting him to more torture, as the love of his life was in the arms of another man. The sliding door to the kitchen was wide open. Hayden, who was sitting on the couch in the living room, could clearly see what was going on in the kitchen. The heating system in the villa was working. Debbie had taken off her down jacket when she got home. She was now wearing a knit shirt, under which Carlos' hand was caressing her breasts. It was obvious what he was doing, and Hayden was a captive audience. Realizing what Carlos was about to do, Debbie couldn't believe it, her eyes wide. Carlos must be crazy. He wants to bang me right in front of Hayden. She used all her strength to push him away, but to no avail. His hands were like the arms of an octopus, and every time she broke free she was grabbed again. He was determined to make out with her. Hayden's smile froze when he saw Carlos acting like this. He thought of himself as a well-educated man, with an aristocratic background. Not the kind of creep who would enjoy a live sex show. He stood up and walked out the door, heading for the gates to the villa. After pausing briefly and casting a sad glance back at the villa, he left. Carlos finally let go of Debbie's lips and was about to take off his pants when Debbie blurted out, Cut it out. My Aunt Flo is visiting. You're kidding, right? You think I'm an idiot? Your Aunt Flo has already been here this month, Carlos taunted. Debbie felt quite frustrated, as her Aunt Flo had already visited her twice this month. I'm not lying, she said earnestly, and then Carlos completely lost it. Outside the villa, Emmett looked at Hayden's secretary with a mocking smile and taunted, Hey man, why is your boss always pestering Mrs. Hua? With a fake smile, the man answered in a diplomatic manner, That's Mr. Gu's business. If you really want to know, ask him yourself. Emmett snorted and said, Some advice. Tell your boss not to be the third wheel. It's messed up that a CO can't find his own date and has to go after a married woman. The secretary kept smiling. If Mr. Gu and the girl truly love each other, then your boss is actually the third wheel. What? Emmett was shocked by his words. I always knew Hayden Gu was kind of a crazy guy. I didn't think his assistant would also be that way. His words destroyed the smile on the secretary's face. Mr. Zhong, watch your tongue, he warned. Ha ha. Oh, forgive me for not acting all proper. Should I bow to you now? Emmett taunted. The secretary was fuming with rage at Emmett's attitude, but he didn't dare snap back. After all, Emmett was Carlos' secretary, and he couldn't afford to offend Carlos. Then the gates to the villa were opened, and Hayden walked out a blank expression on his face. Emmett took a closer look and found that Hayden's eyes were bloodshot and he clenched his fists tightly. Ah, you wanted to mess with Mr. Hua, and now you're paying the price. Young man, you've bitten off more than you can chew. You better start groveling, thought Emmett. With a cheerful smile, Emmett greeted him. Hi, Mr. Gu. Hayden, who was always a polite man, cast a sidelong glance at Emmett and got into his car without saying a word. Emmett didn't mind at all. He knew Hayden was in a bad mood and he was happy to see it. After the Porsche left, Tristan approached Emmett who said, That guy's a real tool, hitting on Mrs. Hua. I don't know whether he has balls of steel or if he's just a fool. Tristan patted his shoulder and said, Gotta go. By the way, I've dismissed the... He stopped as he was shocked by the scene unfolding before him. Debbie put on her down jacket, and before she could zip it up, Carlos grabbed her wrist and dragged her out of the villa, causing her to stagger. Let me go, Carlos. Where are you taking me? Debbie yelled. Carlos, however, gripped her wrist tight all the way to the emperor car, and without saying a word,
pushed her roughly into the back seat. Emmett and Tristan were struck speechless. What's going on? Why is he treating her like this? Does he forget how hard he worked to make her happy before? Both the secretaries thought to themselves. Emmett pushed Tristan aside and told him, Bro, we'll talk later. He trotted towards the emperor and started the engine. Carlos sat beside Debbie in the back seat. In a cold voice, he demanded, Drive to the hospital. Emmett pushed Tristan aside and told him, Bro, we'll talk later. He trotted towards the emperor and started the engine. Carlos sat beside Debbie in the back seat. In a cold voice, he demanded, Drive to the hospital. Hospital. Emmett couldn't help but turn his head to check if Debbie was hurt. Go. Carlos' sharply barked command startled both Debbie and Emmett. Emmett turned back his head and drove towards the hospital under ZL group. Debbie rubbed her aching wrist and asked angrily, What are you doing? Why take me to the hospital? Carlos didn't respond. Debbie felt wronged. She held back her tears and snarled, Stop the car. I'm not going anywhere. Carlos cast a burning glance at her and repeated the question he had asked her before. Your Aunt Flo has visited you twice this month. Why? Debbie yelled back. I don't know. What are you implying? Maybe I got sick. Are you taking me to the hospital? Are you deaf? I'm not going there. And this is how you treat a sick woman. She really couldn't understand why Carlos completely lost it when he heard she'd had her period. Carlos took Debbie's chin between his thumb and forefinger, forcing her to look him in the eye. You still have the guts to yell at me after I caught you making out with Hayden. Make egg tarts for him? If I hadn't come back, he would have already fucked you. Huh. Smack. The sound of a slap reverberated in the car. Startled, Emmett almost lost control of the car and crashed into a tree. He didn't think his boss would slap Debbie, so the person who got hit was... Maybe Carlos had really spoiled Debbie. She slapped him, and she was not afraid of what he might do next. Sometimes she really acted like a little brat. Still not willing to make a concession, she went on. You thought I wouldn't hit you, didn't you? Don't you forget what you did the other night? You were at the manor cooking noodles for Megan in the freaking middle of the night. If I hadn't called and asked you to come back, you would have banged her that night. Am I right, Mr. President? She said his title acidly, indicating that she did not approve and was mocking him. Although his face didn't swell, somehow she still felt uncomfortable after she slapped him. She wished she could stroke his face, but she was too proud to do so. Besides, that would be conceding to him, and she wanted him to know how mad she was. Carlos' gaze was so cold, so piercing that Debbie thought she would be dead if eyes could kill. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm telling the truth. Don't say things like that. I won't take it lying down. Her voice trailed off. He pulled her into his arms rudely. Caught off guard, Debbie was shocked and yelled, What are you doing? Let me go. Carlos pressed a button, and the interior screen rose. Then he lowered his head and bit her lip savagely. At this point he was beyond reason. Not a savage, but a thoughtless, brutal animal. She was his woman and needed to be taught a lesson. The car stopped at the entrance of the hospital owned by ZL Group. Two minutes passed and the two people got out of the car. Debbie's lips were red and swollen, while there was a tooth mark on Carlos. Wow, they must have really gone at it, thought Emmett. Carlos took Debbie to the obstetrics and gynecology department. Upon seeing the sign, she thought he took her here because he cared for her, and her heart softened. She regretted slapping him. He does care for me. He just has a short fuse, huh? She thought to herself happily. Two older doctors stood up and came over to greet Carlos. Carlos, however, dragged Debbie to his side and said coldly, There's something wrong with her period. The doctors immediately got his point. Debbie blushed and stammered, It's not a big deal. It's probably because I always stay up late. She decided to make peace with Carlos. That was not how it looked to Carlos, however. He was thinking she said this only to hide something. With a livid face, Carlos left the exam room in silence. Debbie had to go through the checkup alone. Debbie sighed with resignation as she watched his retreating figure.
Maybe I should apologize to him. After all, I shouldn't have slapped him. Since the hospital belonged to Carlos as well, it didn't take a long time to finish the exam. After several minutes, Debbie walked out. She saw Carlos smoking at the end of the corridor. Instead of coming up to him, she found a bench and sat down. She turned things over in her mind. We're both right. Each of us is too possessive, but it's because we love each other so much. He's bossy and I'm no pushover. He had to take me to the hospital by force to have me checked out. Maybe things will be better if I learn to be tenderer. Carlos didn't come back until the results came out. One of the doctors told Carlos, There's no problem with Mrs. Hua or her periods. We tested for the common compounds found in birth control pills, and her results were positive. That's why her periods might be a little off. Mr. Hua, I suggest you use condoms instead. After all, birth control pills. Wait. Debbie interrupted the doctor. What did you just say? Mrs. Hua, birth control pills aren't the right contraceptive option. If you don't want a child for now, you can choose. Again, Debbie interrupted him. That can't be right. I only took it once a long time ago. Would it still be showing up in my system? Meeting Carlos' cold gaze, Debbie felt her heart hit rock bottom. She had only taken the birth control pill once. And after she had promised Carlos that she would give birth to their baby once she got pregnant, she hadn't taken any since. But now, the doctor said that she had been taking the pills. It was all too much. The two doctors looked at one another, and one of them told Carlos apologetically, Mr. Hua, here are the results. You can have a look. And we can run the test again if you think they're in error. No need for that. Let's try this again. Carlos and Debbie spoke at the same time. Despite Carlos' objection, Debbie looked at the doctors and said in a stern voice, Think very carefully about what you're saying. I need another test. If it turns out I haven't been taking the pills, I'll sue you. Carlos cast a glance at her and said, I said there's no need for that. Let's go home. No. I'm not going home. I need another test. They can't just lie about me like that. Debbie had seen disappointment in Carlos' eyes when the doctor said she had been taking birth control pills. She wanted to clear her name. Carlos, however, turned around and left. Debbie overtook him and said anxiously, Carlos, I only took the pill once. Trust me. Trust you. Carlos stopped. I wanted to trust you. But someone saw you taking the pill. Debbie couldn't believe her ears. Really? Who? Where did I take the pill? East City Villa? I just took it once. Carlos reached out his hand and stroked her face while asking. It's been years. But you still can't forget him, right? Her gut feeling told her that he was referring to Hayden. God, you just won't let that go. I broke up with Hayden years ago, and I... Withdrawing his hand, Carlos interrupted her. I didn't even say who I was referring to, but... Disappointment was written all over his face. Debbie was at a loss for words. Carlos left the hospital, but Debbie didn't. She insisted on having another test. They got the results quickly. When Debbie saw the papers, Carlos had just been gone for half an hour. The doctor pointed to a graph and said, Mrs. Hua, this index suggests that you've been taking birth control pills a lot. Not once, not twice. How could you not know about it? Obviously, he didn't believe what Debbie said. A lot. Debbie was dumbstruck. She sat on the bench in the corridor for a long time, papers in her hands. She really couldn't figure it out. Is there a possibility that the food I ate had some of the same ingredients? She thought. She went to the doctor and asked him about that. The doctor said, Even if some shady vendors powered the pills and sprinkled them onto vegetables and fruits to make them grow faster and you happen to have eaten them, the index still wouldn't be that high. We can only conclude you have been taking the pills frequently. When a sad and dejected Debbie walked out of the hospital, Emmett was waiting for her. Upon seeing her, he trotted towards her and asked, Mrs. Hua, are you all right? Instead of answering his question, she asked, Where's Carlos? With an embarrassed smile, Emmett stammered, Mr. Hua had something he had to deal with. He asked me to drive you back home.